Shall we start, ma'am? Yes, yes, Gurmeet, just one minute. Good morning, respected faculty members and the dear delegates. Welcome back to the third day of this online educational extra vaganza. Today, the starting sessions will be cardiac. And we have with us Dr. Amesh Kasha as the chairperson for the first two sessions. Can I have the CV, please? Uh, Dr. Ramesh Kaushav is consultant and professor of cardiac anesthesia at ABVIMS and Dr. RML Hospital. He is a home secretary of Indian Society of Anesthesiology's Delhi branch. He has a WHO fellowship from, from Australia, New South West, North West Sydney. In 2008, he started the department and DM in cardiac anesthesia at ABVIMS and Dr. RML Hospital. His special areas of interest are cardiac anesthesia, CABG and congenital heart disease, echocardiography, and pain management. Welcome to you, sir. Okay, this, you know, um, You know, as an anesthesiologist, we are concerned with uh, cardiovascular monitoring and stabilization, hemodynamic stability, and respiratory management. For that, if we have a cardiac uh, monitoring uh, during our perioperative, preoperative, and postoperative, it will be good. So, one must know about uh, monitoring primarily uh, um, for uh, management of cases. Simply, a non invasive uh, monitoring has come up, but now we have to do in certain difficult cases invasive monitoring, which include arterial venous and, and uh, uh, other uh, which is required. So, uh, uh, Dr. Manpreet will talk about uh, uh, monitoring, invasive monitoring. Go ahead with that. Dr. Manpreet, she's an uh, associate professor at Ames. Uh, she has a visiting faculty in Penn State, Milton, uh, Pennsylvania, USA. She has a special interest in pediatric anesthesia, trauma, and simulation. She has almost 15 years of experience. Now, I request Manpreet Kaur to continue her talk. I'll be talking about invasive monitoring, which includes intra-arterial blood pressure monitoring and CVP monitoring. Coming to A-line, the arterial cannulation with the continuous pressure transduction remains the accepted reference standard for blood pressure monitoring, despite its risks, costs, and need for technical expertise for placement and management. It provides a continuous real-time monitoring especially in major surgeries where you would like to have beat to beat monitoring of the blood pressure. In patients with significant comorbidities, whether cardiovascular or respiratory, in critically ill patients who require the titrated vasoactive medications, and in patients where non-invasive blood pressure measurements are difficult, like in Burns cases. The arterial pressure waveform characteristics are used in the current clinical practice which include the diacrotic notch as a trigger for intraaortic balloon counterpulsation, as well as the respiratory induced variation in the arterial pressure waveform to predict the fluid responsiveness. That is the dynamic assessment of the fluid responsiveness. And despite the list of contraindications, there is less than 1% chance for major complication with arterial cannulation. A risk to benefit analysis should be performed in each patient's prior to proceeding with the arterial cannulation. 
The few contra contraindications include either there is the absence of the pulse at the anatomical location side of the artery or the peripheral vascular disease with Reynolds and Bourgeois and relative being coagulopathy. The radial artery is the most common site for invasive blood pressure monitoring because it's technically easy to cannulate and the complications are rare. The most frequent location for radial artery cannulation is at the proximal flexor crease of the wrist, one centimeter proximal to the styloid process. The ulnar artery has also been used safely even following failed attempts to access the ipsilateral radial artery. The set more central vessels like femoral, brachial, and axillary artery, they are as well used for cannulation. The axillary artery has advantage of patient's comfort and mobility, and complications appear to be similar in incidence to the radial and femoral. For the femoral cannulation, the excess site is around 2.5 centimeter distal to the inguinal ligament. This allows for suitable compression of the vesicle if necessary. Whenever you're planning to put in central catheters, we need a slightly longer catheter due to their relatively deeper and more mobile anatomical locations. Clinicians should also be aware, however, that there is risk of cerebral embolism with these central vessels compared to the peripheral vessels. Coming to the radial artery, for the radial artery cannulation, some clinicians assess collateral blood flow to the hand by performing a modified Allen's test. The radial and the ulnar arteries, they are both compressed while the patient makes a fist to exaggerate the palm and then slowly reopen it. As the occlusion of the ulnar artery is released, the color will return to the palm within five to 10 seconds, whereas in severely reduced collateral flow, that will take more than five to 10 seconds for the blood supply to return. Unfortunately, the predictive value of this test is very poor. The equipment, a 20 gauge catheter is acceptable size for older children and adults, and a 22 gauge is used in pediatrics and infants. When planning for brachial or femoral artery catheter cannulation, appropriate length catheters are necessary to ensure sufficient cannulation. For example, in brachial and femoral, you'll be needing at least 15 centimeter to the minimum. Preformed kits are as well now available, which include the guide wire. The sterile precautions should always be taken. And for central arterial cannulation, full barrier precaution like caps and eye protection should be used. In case we are cannulating a unconscious patients like prior to pheochromocytoma induction, local are used. There are two approaches, direct puncture of the vessel and the use of the guide wire. Guide wire is especially used if the difficulties with direct puncture is there. And ultrasound use is coming up in a large way. For all the approaches to the arterial catheterization, the operator's non-dominant hand gently palpates the artery while the dominant hand manipulates the intravascular catheter. For the direct puncture approach, first starting with the 45 degree, entering into the vessel and then reducing to 30 degree and advancing slowly until the pulsatile blood return is obtained. The needle of the catheter unit is then slowly advanced another millimeter or two, assuring the blood return continues. This is the direct puncture technique. Whereas in guide wire technique, the needle has entered into the blood vessel, then a guide wire is inserted inside it and the outer catheter is railroaded over the guide wire. Integral guide wire approach technique is also coming up. That is the guide wire itself is within the set. That is the specialized device is integrated with the needle and the catheter. Ultrasound technique improves first pass cannulation. As you can see, the transverse view of the ultrasound is taken. The radial artery is um, seen and we locate the artery, the cannula is seen insert, getting into the vessel, the angle is reduced, the catheter is threaded in to the vessel. 
whenever seeing using the ultrasound it is always better to use the b mode and not the m mode to locate and cannulate the vessel using ultrasound decreases the complications like hematoma and embolism and also increases the first attempt success rate the iabp system consists of a transducer connected to through a low compliant selen tube tubing to a 22 gauge cannula or 20 gauge cannula inserted into the artery a bag of heparin nice saline pressurized to 300 millimeter is attached to the other end of the transducer and infuses saline through the system at 2 to 4 ml per hour to maintain the potency of the arterial cannula then the transducer is connected to the processor the arterial that's a pressure wave transmits through the fluid column and vibrates the diaphragm of the trans the fluid column and vibrates the diaphragm of the transducer which converts the electrical signal to be displayed on the monitor it's based upon four principles the sine wave fourier analysis natural frequency and damping coefficient the arterial pressure wave consists of a fundamental wave that's called the pulse rate and a series of harmonic waves these are the smaller waves whose frequencies are multiples of the fundamental waves example if the fundamental frequency is 1 hertz you would see harmonic waves of the frequency 2 hertz 3 hertz 4 hertz and so on so every material that has a frequency at which it oscillates this is called its natural frequency if a force with a similar frequency to the natural frequency is applied to the system it will begin to oscillate at its maximum amplitude and if the natural frequency of the iabp Meyer system lies close to the frequency of any of the wave component of the arterial waveform then the system will resonate causing excessive amplification and distortion of the signal so that's called damping so the natural frequency of the system especially increases when you decrease the length of the cannula or increase the diameter of the cannula in other words short thick cannulas commercially available systems have the natural frequency for around 200 hertz and we can decrease these natural frequency by using in between three wave walls and bubbles clots they can actually decrease the natural frequency so anything that reduces the energy in an oscillating system will reduce the amplitude of the oscillation However, some damping is always required in the system that's called critical damping if it's excessive the system is considered to be over damped or if it's in insufficient it's called under damping in an iabp most damping is due to the friction in the fluid pathway the damping is measured by a fast flush test the dynamic response of the arterial line is testing using this fast flush test where the transducer is briefly exposed to the pressure from the counter pressure bag by pulling the plunger when the fast flush abruptly ends the transducer system oscillates at its natural frequency so this is the natural frequency which you see in here following a system flush the amplitude ratio of the two consecutive resonant waves is obtained by ratio of the larger to the smaller wave in a normal this damping coefficient is around 0.7 in case this damping is more more than one it is called the over damped iabp this system will not oscillate freely and the details such as diacrotic notch will be lost it will not overshoot but will tend to under read the systolic blood pressure and over read the diastolic brush blood pressure this is called the over damped system this trace is from the under damped iabp system typically the damping coefficient is less than 0.7 this system will be quick to respond but will tend to overshoot and oscillate more around the resting point so there will be over reading of the normal blood pressure systolic blood pressure and under reading of the diastolic pressure this is what is called the optimally damped system the damping coefficient is around 0.7 
which provides the best balance between the speed of resonance and the accuracy. Whenever we have a lot of kinks or three ways or bubbles in the system, you will find this over damped system quite common in that we flush the system and then we get a optimally damped system. Whereas under damped system is seen in case we have a long tubing length, our tubing is connected with stopcocks or in patient factors like tachycardia or high cardiac output states. So as you can see in this fast flush test, that for optimal system, we have one to two oscillations. Whereas for over damped system, the oscillations will be lesser because the dampening is more. So there will be no ringing it seen. Whereas for under damped system, there will be excessive ringing that is more than two oscillations. The intravascular pressure tracings obtained during this rapid flush of a monitoring catheter are frequently tested on exam. Then are the factors which affect the IBP measurement. That depends upon the site of catheterization, transducer level, damp damping of the pressure system. The site of the arterial catheterization, as you go away further from the aorta, you will find that the systolic peak becomes more taller, the dichrotic notch that starts shifting further. For example, in dorsalis cardis, the systolic is very high, whereas there is a shifting of the dichrotic notch. Whenever we are dealing with IVP, we should know about the phlebostatic axis, that is where the transducer should be placed. That is in the mid axillary line and the fourth intercostal space junction. In the supine patient, pressure is measured from the right and left side of the arm by either technique will be same, whether you use non-invasive blood pressure or invasive blood pressure. However, in lateral decubitus position, you will find that the, the blood pressures vary by 20 centimeter different height to 15 millimeter mercury pressure difference. That is, NIBP will be higher in the dependent right arm compared to the lower arm, like there are 20 centimeter difference, so you'll find 15 millimeter of mercury difference. In some of the cases, like in uh, sitting position, the anesthesiologist may decide to level the transducer with the external auditory matrix to reflect the pressure at the circle of villus and therefore the brain perfusion, which becomes really important in sitting positions. Coming to the interpretation of the arterial waveform, the arterial waveform results from the ejection of the blood from the left ventricle into the aorta during the systole, followed by a peripheral runoff during the diastole. The mean arterial pressure, this is the systolic peak, this is the diastolic blood pressure, and the mean arterial pressure is estimated by the sum of the diastolic blood pressure plus one third of the pulse pressure. That is the difference between the systolic and the diastolic. Generally, the elevated pulse pressure indicates age-related stiffness, especially in hypertensive patients. Decrease in the pulse pressure relative to the baseline is typically seen in the hypovolemia. So pulse pressure variation can be used to assess intravascular volume status. The slope of the systolic upstroke is generally related to the left ventricular contractibility and the slope of the dichrotic decline in the pressure, that is the dichrotic runoff, this runoff varies with the resistance in the arterial pressure. The stroke volume is constant, then the diastolic runoff decreases sharply. Example in vasodilator therapy. These are the abnormal waveforms. Pulses resonance is the alternating amplitude of the arterial pulse. It's commonly seen in heart failure due to left ventricular systolic dysfunction. This experience is characterized by two systolic peaks of the aortic pulse during left ventricular ejection. And it indicates aortic regurgitation. Less commonly 
seen causes are like Hopkins. A pulses paradoxes is characterized by a greater than 10 mm decrease in the systolic arterial pressure during inspiration. It most commonly indicates conditions like cardiac tamponade, COPD, and constrictive pericarditis. The arterial waveform analysis can also be used for determining the fluid responsiveness. The stroke volume variation as estimated by the flow track or the vigilio uses specialized transducers but uses arterial cannulas, A lines. Example is the EV1000, which is quite frequently used. The stroke volume variation, if it is less than 13, is what has to be targeted for the volume resuscitation because the variation in the pulse is more with the respiration. That means the vessels are empty. Always remove air bubbles before you do arterial cannulation. Pressurize the system to 300 millimeter of mercury and heparinize saline at 2 to 4 ml per hour. Calibrate to zero at phlebostatic axis. If the transducer goes by 10 centimeter lower than the phlebostatic axis, the pressure readings will be higher by 10 centimeter of water or 7.5 millimeter of mercury. And during shoulder surgery or beach chair, we monitor the cerebral circulation and place the transducer at the tragus level. There are complications of arterial cannulation like ischemia, hemorrhage, embolization, compartment syndrome. For the maintenance and removal of the A-line, I-line catheters not to be replaced routinely, femoral catheters not to be kept more than five days, all other A-lines not more than seven days, Replace your transducer at the interval 96 hours and remove aseptically and give optimal pressure once you remove it. Coming to the next portion, that is the CVP monitoring. CVP gives us a representation of right atrial pressure and or the venous return to the heart, essentially the preload. One of the lumens of central line can be used to get CVP and in a normally breathing spontaneous the breathing patient, it's around 5 to 10 centimeters of water and it rises by 3 to 5 centimeters during mechanical ventilation. And whenever you do CVP monitoring, it's done at the end of the expiration. So whenever you're dealing, uh, dealing with the central venous cannulation, it might be as a part of CVP monitoring, a PA catheter insertion or transvenous spacing or for hemodialysis. We use it for drug administration in when we use vasoactive drugs, for TPN, for chemotherapy, for agents which are used for basically irritating irritants to the peripheral lines. In major traumas, major surgeries, when we have risk of air emboli, emboli for the aspiration and when we have inadequate peripheral IV access. A CBP waveform typically has three peaks, A, C and V, and two descents, X and Y, you can remember A by atrial contraction, C by RV contraction or closed tricast valve, V volume against the tricast. X and Y descends. The X descends indicates the atrial relaxation and the Y descends indicates the AV valve opening. If wave does not have atrial contraction, so A wave is absent. Atrial flutter is chaotic atrial contraction, so a multiple A waves are present. In complete AV block, you will find a large A wave. M type pattern is seen as TR and pericardial tamponade. It indicates tall A and V waves. Multiple catheters are available, which are used for CBP monitoring and infusion of the drugs. Introducer sheets with one or two integrated ports for multiple drug infusions are gaining popularity over time. These are the various sites, which includes IGV, subclavian, external jugular, femoral, and the peripheral pick lines like basilic and cephalic. Whenever we have to select the site, Always selecting the best site for safe and effective central venous cannulation should be made. 
it is basically dependent upon whether we are using for pressure monitoring versus drug or fluid administration depending on the patient's medical condition in the clinical setting. For more practical standards, IGV is the most common vein which is preferred in bleeding diathesis, emphysema, transvenous pacing. Whereas subclavian or femoral is a choice in trauma patients with the neck immobilized in a hard cervical collar because you don't want to move the neck. And secondly, because the subclavian does not collapse in bleeding trauma patient because of the sheath around it, whereas the IGV collapses. And in case we are taking a blind access to the IGV, there are more chances of hitting the internal carotid artery. And we always need larger depth when we talk about either EGV or left-sided cannulations. These are the depths which are fairly fine. That is around 13 to 15 centimeter for the insertion. Left-sided would need definitely longer lengths. For dialysis catheter, right IGV is preferred to femoral, is preferred to left IGV, is preferred to subclavian. The catheters in the right IGV have a straighter course into the right brachiocephalic vein and the superior vena cava and therefore are at least contact with the vessel wall. So catheter inserted through the subclavian or left IGV has one or more angulation explaining the high risk of vessel contact and thereby thrombosis. Hence they are not preferred when there is thrombosis risk. So avoid subclavian in RT, RRT. Before, during and after placement of the CVC, multiple practice guidelines have come up, which indicates the checklists. We have two approaches for the ultrasound, short axis and long axis. Short axis provides a better view in relation to the artery, but needle can be only visualized as an echogenic point. Whereas for long axis, the entire needle course can be seen and it prevents the posterior vessel wall. Both have its own advantages and disadvantages. So the oblique view, that is a view which is halfway between the short axis and long axis view with the ultrasound probe placed at 45 degree to the, with respect to the vessel can be used by experienced ultrasound users. The clinical pearls are that always use an ECG monitor, minimize the neck flexion and the head rotation. So consider removing pillows or towels behind the head to minimize the neck flexion and position head approximately 40 de degrees to the left. Extreme rotation of the head and extension of the neck should always be avoided. They tend to collapse the IGV. Avoid carotid artery in line with the advancing needle. So this can be done by using the markers on the screen. And whenever you're passing J wire through the catheter, don't use it more than 25 centimeter at the skin level. The ultrasound pearls are identify the anatomy and locate whether in the short axis as well as in the long axis, then confirm that the vessel is patent. Sometimes you have a thrombus in it. Use the real-time ultrasound guidance for the puncture. Oblique view is a preferred means. Confirm once you place the needle in the vein. Confirm the position of the guide wire once you place it inside. And even confirm the catheter once you place it inside. Always prepare the trays before inserting your CVP. Place the tray on the patient's chest so that you do not have to turn away from the patient to pick it up. Pre-flush your equipment, close all your stopcocks and always get a chest x-ray. Avoid needle placement in the lateral one third of the area between the clavicle and the mandible. Avoid carotid artery palpation because we tend to push it, push the anatomy. Avoid carotid artery in line with the advancing needed in ultrasound. There are a few complications. Pneumothorax is one of the most cited complication of the subclavian venous cannulation. Pneumothorax next. So multi-lumen catheters may carry a higher risk of catheter related bloodstream actions. Heparin bounded central venous catheters have also been shown to reduce the in incidence of catheter related thrombosis and infection in children and adults. Um, the incorporation of antibiotic may be, may be silver or sulfur diazine or minocycline or rifampicine also came up in between but did not gain popularity 
because of the uh, more expensive nature of the catheters. The central line should always be confirmed by the chest x-ray and it should be placed in such a manner the tip of the central cannula within the SVC at or above the level of carina used. So whenever you describe a chest x-ray what's CVC, tell about the insertion side whether it's an IGV or a subclavian, assess the position by tracing it whether it's too high or too low like this one is too inserted or it is going into the other vessel like brachiocephalic and the potential complications while describing the x-rays. CVP is the result of a complex and uh, dispersed interplay among various physiological variables in the OR. So the use of CVP readings to estimate the cardiac function and blood volume rely on the fact that there is no ventricle disease or normal pulmonary vasculature because isolated CVP measurements has little meaning unless information is interpreted in context of the cardiac function. Like if there is increase in cardiac function of venous return, both of cardiac output and CVP will increase. But if there is no increase in the venous return, you will find that the CVP is decreased, but still the cardiac output might be increased. So because of the complex interplay of the various factors, uh, practically CVP using its popularity, Studies have shown that the value of CVP as a predictor of volume status of fluid responsiveness have failed to demonstrate a relationship. Single absolute value of CVP might not be lying in a fluid responsive zone and we would not like to look for a single value. Trend may give you rough idea, but CVP is definitely losing its popularity now. Thank you. I'm open for questions. Uh, do student have any question? Sir, as of now, there are no questions in the chat box. So we will continue with the next session. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. So next uh, is uh, Dr. Indira Malik. She is Assistant Professor Cardiac Anesthesia, PG PGIMS uh, Rotak. Good morning, uh, sir. Uh, good morning. And her interest in cardiac anesthesia. She is uh, talking about cardiac monitoring, especially uh, IABP, cardiac output, and trans esophageal yes. um, So now let's Dr. Indra Malik to continue. Yes. Hello everyone and welcome to APEC 2023. My heartfelt gratitude towards Team APEC 2023, uh, IBVIMS and RML Hospital for giving me this opportunity yet again to participate in this academic extravaganza. So today, as you all know, I'll be talking about some very important hemodynamic tools, namely cardiac output, transesophageal echo, and intraaortic balloon pump. So, Starting with cardiac output, first of all. So what is cardiac output? To define cardiac output, it is the amount of blood delivered to the tissues by the heart per minute. It is a reflection of the status of the entire circulatory system governed by tissue autoregulation. So what are the major determinants of cardiac output actually? Preload, afterload, heart rate and contractility majorly are the factors which determine cardiac output. So it is actually a product of the stroke volume produced by the heart multiplied by the heart rate. And it is estimated by two types of methods, which can be invasive or non-invasive. So now some of the very old or the oldest methods which were used for assessment of cardiac output were invasive methods. And they are not in use anymore because they were either very cumbersome or there was some uh, problem in uh, using these methods. But Nonetheless, you still need to know about these methods, what was the concept on which they were based and how the uh, procedure was done. So uh, first we discussed the PICS method. So the concept here was that the oxygen consumed by the tissues per unit time was equal to the amount of oxygen extracted for, from the circulation. So now VO2 is the oxygen consumption 
and uh, this was equal to the arterial oxygen content minus the venous oxygen content. So that is the amount of oxygen which is extracted multiplied by cardiac output. So rearranging the equation, what do we get? Cardiac output is equal to the uh, oxygen consumption divided by the CaO2 minus CVO2. So now VO2, as I told you, is oxygen consumption. And this was calculated by uh, taking the difference between the inspired and the expired oxygen concentrations and the volume by indirect calorimetry method. CaO2, of course, was the arterial oxygen content, which was obtained from the ABG. And CVO2 was the mixed venous oxygen content, which was obtained from the PA catheter. So you can see that this procedure required the indirect calorimetry equipment to be near the patient's head end. Uh, along with that, the patient also required an arterial uh, catheter to be in place and a PA catheter, which in itself is quite an invasive thing. So this method was definitely uh, uh, having a very high accuracy and reproducibility uh, of the values when measured at steady state. But what were its limitations? So there was a lot of bulky equipment, especially in the head end of the patient. There were sampling errors in the arterial and the, uh, and the mixed venous uh, uh, oxygen content. And uh, there was inability to maintain a steady state in uh, the hemodynamic and respiratory conditions at all times. Then a modification of the fixed method was developed, which was known as the indirect fixed method. So here the oxygen, uh, which was measured earlier, uh, was replaced by expired gases like carbon dioxide or acetylene. So it was easier to measure these, especially carbon dioxide, by the capnographic method. Uh, and uh, this was applicable, however, only in sedated or mechanically ventilated patients in whom uh, capnography was being done. Uh, however, it showed a good correlation with the thermodilution method by the PA catheter. Then we come to the next method, which is the indicator dilution method, which is still in use and uh, it is being used quite widely. So the concept on which this method was based is that the, uh, uh, the observation that for a known amount of indicator introduced at one point in the circulation, the same amount of indicator should be detectable at a downstream point. So what are some of the indicators that could be used here? Cold saline, which is still being used very commonly. Lithium ions, again, this is also still in use. A dye, endocyanin green or radioisotopes. So this formula that you see here, the Stewart hamilton equation, this was the equation which was used to calculate cardiac output by the indicator dilution method. So Q that you see here is the cardiac output. This is equal to I, that is the amount of indicator in moles, divided by the integral of the indicator concentration change over time. So this will be the area under the curve. Now we come to the thermodilution method. So for all practical purposes, this will be the most common method of cardiac output measurement, the invasive cardiac output me measurement that you will see in your day-to-day uh, -day, uh, life. So here again, the thermodilution method can be divided into intermittent or continuous. So in the intermittent method, uh, boluses of cold saline is injected. And in the continuous method, it's a different type of PA catheter. Both the methods are using PA catheter only. But in the continuous method, the PA catheter is different in the sense that it has a heating filament uh, uh, inside it and uh, this uh, filament can be programmed to heat the blood at, uh, at fixed intervals and uh, when this electrical signal is received by the filament, it uh, warms up and therefore the blood around it also warms up and that can be detected as cardiac output. I will be discussing in detail in the subsequent slides. So let's look at the thermodilution method first, the intermittent type. So uh, the accuracy of the thermodilution method, of course, depends on the temperature of the injectate, the speed of injection and the volume of injectate which has been used. The precision may be said that it is good and it can be improved by keeping the speed of injection as constant as possible. So now this is what you get on the monitor. Uh, once you inject the cold saline, a curve like this will be obtained on the monitor and the area under the curve, this is uh, actually the cardiac output, which is measured by the monitor. So this is the PA catheter, the simple PA catheter that we put in the patient and the intermittent thermodilution technique is used. So here you can see that this, uh, it has five ports and the ones which are important for us for the purpose of cardiac output measurement are this port, 
the the light greenish port where we inject the cold saline and at least three boluses of 10 ml each should be injected to obtain a comparative three different comparative curves and then we can choose the two best curves and take an average of the values just calculated by the monitor what we need to feed in is the weight and height of the patient and uh, the, the, uh, that will be used to calculate the uh, bsa and the various indices then this is the tip of the catheter and just behind the tip is the balloon and just behind the balloon is a small thermistor and this is connected to this end and this end goes to the monitor so we connect the monitor to this end and once the monitor is connected and the pa catheter is in place then this thermistor tells us what is the temperature of the blood which you can see on the monitor also so when the cold saline is injected from here it naturally it, uh, it changes the temperature of the blood where this thermistor is lying and this change in temperature is detected as cardiac output and calculated as cardiac output and the various other values which are pa catheter derived by the software in the monitor so now let's see what are some of the common errors which can occur with the thermodilution method in the estimation of cardiac output. So the first and foremost is underestimation of the true cardiac output. When can that happen? That is when the injectate volume is more than the program volume. So normally the program volume is 10 ml in most monitors or a large volume of fluid is being given simultaneously. Another very important factor that when we are measuring cardiac output, there should not be any large amount of fluid going simultaneously or volatile agent should not be uh, ongoing at a high dose or uh, mostly when, uh, because we are using PA catheters in uh, CABG surgeries. So we know that they harvest veins from the lower limbs. So uh, during cleaning and draping, the limbs are raised so that they can be cleaned and draped properly. So please pay attention that you are not doing cardiac output at that point of time when the limbs are raised because that will result in an increased venous return to the heart and a false value of cardiac output will be obtained. So pay attention to that. Then the next thing which can happen is that the injectate is colder than the measured temperature uh, or the injected probe is lying next to any heat emitting device. The next problem which can happen is overestimation of the true cardiac output. Here the injected volume is less than the programmed volume or it, the temperature can be warmer than actual measured inject, uh, injected temperature. Other considerations are like surgical manipulation of the heart, fluid administration through the aortic cannula and presence of arrhythmias. So again, it's best to do the baseline cardiac output and other values before the chest has been opened. And if you want a comparative at the end of the procedure to know what is been the benefit of the procedure done, then uh, we can do it once the chest has been closed. So PA catheters with the ability to measure cardiac output continuously, which I mentioned before, they were introduced in the 90s and correlation with the cardiac out output estimation using the intermittent method was found consistent, especially in patients who are having rapidly changing hemodynamics. And there was excellent correlation between the two methods in physiologically stable periods. So what was the benefit in introducing this catheter? Now, as you have seen that in the uh, intermittent thermodilution method, there has to be one person who uh, will need to inject those three boluses of cold saline every time. So if you need to measure cardiac output intraoperatively several times, then it becomes a very labor intensive thing, especially if you are short on staff. So now this method where the cardiac output is being measured continuously and you just have to feed in a time interval. Suppose you want a cardiac output measurement every hour. So you just have to uh, give the command to the monitor that I need a cardiac output every hour. And if you are using this continuous cardiac output uh, catheter, then every hour the monitor will give an electrical signal to this electrical to this uh, thermal filament which is present in this, which is the speciality of this catheter that it has this 10 to 14 centimeters long filament in addition to the thermistor which is present in the earlier catheter which I showed you. And uh, this is connected over here to the thermal filament connector and this goes to the monitor. So this is the end from where the electrical signal is received and this uh, filament is heated up and it heats up the blood in which it is lying. And this change in temperature is again detected by the uh, monitor as cardiac output in the same way as the intermittent thermodilution method. So every one hour you will get the cardiac output and the other values which are derived from PA catheter without having to inject boluses of cold saline. Now let's look at the dye dilution method. So here uh, the indicator dilution was done using a dye which was indocyanin green and it was very popular prior to the introduction of the thermodilution method using cold saline. The dye used to be injected in a central vein and continuously sampled from arterial blood. 
and the change in concentration over time was detected by a densitometer. So here again, you will see that this is also slightly cumbersome where you need a special device to measure the change in concentration of the dye over time. Then we have lithium ions or lithium chloride. So this is used in the method which is known as LIDCO and this is one of the less invasive methods where a simple arterial catheter can be used to measure the cardiac output. And uh, this is a continuous method and it is comparable with the thermodilution method by PA catheter also. Now let's look at some of the alternative techniques to estimate carbon, uh, estimate the cardiac output. And uh, here most of these techniques are the less invasive or the uh, non-invasive techniques. Uh, and also uh, this table shows that what is the accuracy of each of these techniques when compared to the uh, PA catheter based uh, cardiac output measurement, which is still taken as the gold standard. So first and foremost is the TE Doppler, which is the transesophageal echo. And this has a very high accuracy compared to the PA catheter. Then we have the TE Doppler, that is the transesophageal Doppler probe. And uh, this uh, in this, the accuracy is not so good as compared to the uh, PA catheter. Then TE2D, again, this is also a standard TE and its accuracy is good compared to the PA catheter. Then we have the indicator dilution method, that is the LIDCO. As I told you, that is highly, again, uh, comparable with the uh, PA catheter. Then uh, the transpulmonary thermodilution or the PICO, this is again, uh, the accuracy is uh, very good compared to the PA catheter. The arterial pulse wave, which, which is again used by the LIDCO, PROACT and flow track techniques. Uh, this is also good, but maybe not so accurate as compared to the PA catheter, but it definitely can be used in uh, non-cardiac surgeries, which require invasive monitoring. Now, what is the volume clamp method? Now, we know that for measurement of non-invasive blood pressure, we use an arm cuff. But this volume clamp method is something new and it uses a finger cuff for measurement of blood pressure continuously. So basically what was the uh, concept behind developing this method was that we are able to provide a continuous hemodynamic monitoring to uh, patients outside the ICU and the HDU setting in wards and even at home. So it can be very useful in uh, certain uh, scenarios, especially like the COVID problem which we were facing. But uh, of course, uh, the continuous non-invasive blood pressure monitor cannot be as accurate as cardiac output by PA catheter. So then we have the methods uh, bioimpedance velocimetry, bioreactance, uh, which are again good for uh, non-cardiac surgeries and they are not as accurate as compared to the uh, thermodilution by PA. Now let's look at some of these methods uh, individually. So the transpulmonary thermodilution method uh, what are the parameters that we can measure by this method? So there are some discontinuous parameters and some continuous parameters. So among the discontinuous parameters, we get the thermodilution cardiac index, the stroke volume index, the global and diastolic volume index, cardiac function index, the ejection fraction, extravascular lung water, very, very important in critical, uh, critically ill patients, pulmonary vascular permeability index and the oxygen delivery index. Now, looking at the continuous parameters, uh, it gives the pulse contour cardiac index, the SVI, stroke volume variation, very, very important to tell us that what is the response of this patient to volume infusion. Then a pulse pressure variation, cardiac power index and LV contractility. So how does this work? The transpulmonary thermodilution is available for bedside monitoring and uh, it is present in devices like PICO2, EV1000 and volume view. Here, there are two devices that we need or two invasive lines that we need, basically a central venous catheter and an arterial catheter with temperature and pressure sensors. So normally the arterial catheter is uh, inserted in a large central artery like the uh, femoral or the brachial or axillary, sometimes the radial also. Uh, the added advantage of this method is that it measures extravascular lung water, as I told you before. So it correlates very well with pulmonary edema and has been found very good uh, in critically ill patients. So again, the curve which is obtained in the transpulmonary thermodilution method also is similar to the earlier thermodilution method that we saw. And uh, the area under the curve is basically the cardiac output and it is calculated by the Stewart hamilton equation. The only good thing is that we also get other factors like global uh, end diastolic volume and extravascular lung water by this method. 
Now, cardiac output by ultrasound technology. So this is uh, a minimally invasive method and is becoming more and more popular. So both stroke volume and cardiac output can be measured by various uh, echocardiographic techniques, uh, 2D, 3D and Doppler ultrasonography. But for this, an adequate image quality is essential. So obviously the uh, learning curve is there for the operator. Now, how do we calculate cardiac output from here? So it is the difference between the end diastolic and the end systolic volumes, which is the stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate. Transthoracic or transesophageal echo can be done intermittently to calculate the cardiac output. Recently, there has been a monoplane transesophageal probe also, which has become available, which can stay in place for 72 hours and it can give a continuous hemodynamic transesophageal echo monitoring. But of course, it is monoplane, so it cannot give us all the views. With the 2D and 3D echo probes, we cannot keep the probe continuously in C2. And of course, the patient would need a slight degree of sedation to uh, allow insertion of the probe or the patient should be completely uh, sedated and paralyzed for that. So these are some of the limitations of the uh, ultrasound technology. But of course, it is uh, very, very useful. So what is the Doppler principle that is based on the Doppler ultrasound probe? So the stroke volume is equal to VTI, that is the velocity time integral multiplied by the cross-sectional area at the site of flow measurement. So mostly the uh, cardiac output is measured at the LVOT. So we will need to me measure the cross-sectional area at the left ventricular outflow tract and uh, we can use that to calculate the stroke volume and then the stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate is the cardiac output. Now, how do we get cardiac output from arterial pulse wave analysis? So arterial pulse wave is obtained from an arterial catheter, which is invasive or non-invasively by the volume clamp method, which is the finger NIV pickup that I mentioned to you when we were discussing the table. So the concept again here is that pulsatility in the arterial tree is directly proportional to the stroke volume generated by the heart. So the parameters which are derived from the pulse contour analysis are the pulse contour or the pulse wave cardiac index and the stroke volume index, stroke volume variation, pulse pressure variation, the uh, SVR or the systemic vascular resistance, cardiac power index and the LV contractility. So these devices, uh, as we saw, are suitable for use in non-cardiac surgeries requiring invasive monitoring. Invasive monitoring in cardiac surgery and major vascular procedures is still provided either by the PA catheter or the transesophageal echo or a combination of both these techniques. However, the non-invasive devices are of great help outside the ICU and HDU setting for continuous monitoring of hemodynamic parameters. Then we have cardiac output from bioimpedance and bioreactants. The concept here is that cyclical increase in the blood volume in the great vessels in the chest and alignment of blood cells in the thoracic aorta during the ejection phase cause concomitant changes in the electrical impedance of the thorax. So here uh, the stroke volume, cardiac output and SVR and the thoracic fluid content also can be determined, but their accuracy is limited when compared to the thermodilution technique. Now we come to the second part of the talk that is how can the transesophageal echo be an a hemodynamic monitor. So transesophageal echo itself is an entire subject in itself and uh, the transesophageal echo is a diagnostic tool. It helps in confirmation of preoperative diagnosis. It helps in uh, confirmation of the repair or uh, the surgical procedure which has been done, whether it is accurate or not. And of course, it is a hemodynamic monitor. So today we will only focus on what are the functions of the transesophageal echo as a hemodynamic monitor. So basically four main things, assessment of volume or hydration status, the cardiac output, ejection fraction and stroke volume calculation, cause of hemodynamic instability intraoperatively or in the critical care unit, development of new regional wall motion abnormalities intraoperatively. So one by one, we will look at all of these. So first of all, talking about the volume status. So uh, if we see the transgastric short axis views on transesophageal echo, they can clearly demonstrate the status of LV filling. If the patient is volume depleted, then almost no cavity will be visible in the left ventricle, especially during the systolic period when the ventricle is contracting. The anterolateral and the posterior median, these are the two papillary muscles which are seen in the transgastric short axis papillary view, and they will be touching each other in systole, and this is known as the kissing papillaries, and correlates well with the pulmonary artery diastolic pressures also, 
which is a direct indication of the left ventricular endiastolic pressure, which means that the filling of the end of diastole. So if we have both the T probe in C2 and the transesophageal and the uh, and the PA catheter, we will see that if uh, the T shows that the patient is volume depleted and uh, during systole the LV, LV is not showing almost any cavity. And at that time, if we correlate with the PA pressures, the uh, diastolic PA pressures will also be low. So now you can see over here in this picture, this is very common, this phenomena of uh, poor intravascular volume is very common in hypertensive patients or patients who are having a very thick LV wall or LV hypertrophy. So here we can see uh, a highly hypertrophied uh, left ventricle and uh, such a small cavity which is visible over here. So since this is a still picture, you will not see the movement, but during systole, you will see that almost this whole cavity is being obliterated. That means the intravascular volume status is poor and this patient should be hydrated well. Now, the cardiac output, uh, stroke volume and ejection fraction, which is nothing but the left ventricular systolic performance. So this is also, this can be measured by the transesophageal echo and it can be monitored uh, throughout the interoperative period at different time points. We can calculate these values and we can see that what is the improvement or the deterioration in the systolic performance of the left ventricle. So what is the stroke volume? It is the difference between the LV end diastolic volume and the LV end systolic volume. And uh, if we want to calculate the ejection fraction from this, then this formula will be applied in this way that the stroke volume divided by the LV end diastolic volume multiplied by 100. So now uh, LV end diastolic and LV end systolic volumes can be obtained by either endocardial fractional shortening or fractional area change. And cardiac output, the formula again stays the same. If we have calculated the stroke volume already, then we just multiply it by the heart rate. So intermittent measurement of these values in a high-risk patient undergoing surgery or in the critical care unit can predict hemodynamic events and it can guide management. That is whether the patient requires more fluid infusion or the patient requires inotropic support and that will be shown by the transesophageal echo as well as the PA catheter. So now this video I specifically wanted to share. This uh, belongs to a patient who was uh, undergoing redo mitral valve surgery. He already had a mitral valve in C2, but it was stuck and it needed to be replaced again. So uh, here you can see that this is the left ventricle and the interventricular septum, which should normally be convex towards the side of the uh, RV. It is convex towards the side of the LV and you can see it over here. So the patient is having RV dysfunction and poor LV systolic performance. Now looking at the, and the, this was the uh, mid esophageal four chamber view. Now if we look at these two pictures, these are the transgastric views of the same patient. This is before the replacement of the uh, stuck valve. Here you can see again that the interventricular septum is convex towards the LV. And now this picture in the same patient, if you see after replacement of the mitral valve, you see that the interventricular septum has almost become straight and it is slightly even convex towards the RV. So you can see that in this patient, uh, before the replacement of the stuck valve, he was having poor RV function and poor LV function and very high PA pressures. And as soon as the mitral valve was replaced, this is immediately, this is taken immediately after coming off bypass and the patient was hemodynamically stable. PA pressures had also reduced and this was the uh, picture on transesophageal echo. So they both correlate very well and they show that uh, yes, for a short period of time, the patient experienced an improvement in the LV systolic performance after the valve was replaced. Then the next thing which the TE can help us is uh, the detect the cause of hemodynamic instability. So the hemodynamic instability can be due to hypovolemia, poor volume status that I already discussed. We will see it in the transgastric short axis mid papillary view. Then the next cause can be ischemic changes, new ischemic changes, which may have occurred intraoperatively. If a patient is predisposed to uh, ischemia, then he can develop uh, in the perioperative period a new ischemic change. So abnormal motion of any of the ventricular walls uh, may correspond with the episodes of hemodynamic instability. Then development of, or exaggeration 
of uh, existing ischemic mitral regurgitation. So as we know that in a patient of coronary uh, artery disease, if there is ischemia of the left ventricular musculature, the papillary muscle, which is a part of the left ventricular muscle only, that also uh, may undergo ischemia. And because the caudi tendini, which uh, are helpful in the opening and closing of the mitral valve, are attached to these papillary muscles. So when these papillary muscles undergo infarction and they are not able to contract, then what happens is that ischemic mitral regurgitation develops. And the mitral valve, which should be closed during the systole, that remains uh, regurgitant. And that is what is known as ischemic MR. So if the patient already has ischemic MR, that may get exaggerated or a new episode of ischemic mitral regurgitation may develop. So all of this can be seen in the transesophageal echo. Then new RWMAs. So as I said before, that there can be ischemic insult to a specific coronary artery territory. So a preoperative echo transthoracic is helpful in compa comparing the intraoperative findings. And again, if we see that any new uh, regional, motion, uh, re regional wall motion abnormality has developed intraoperatively, then anti-ischemic therapy should be instituted uh, immediately. Also, if new MR is detected, then also anti-ischemic therapy is essential. Hemodynamics should be supported by inotropes and vasopressor agents. And of course, fluid administration should be limited at that time because the PA pressures would be raised. Now, these are some of the events which can be detected by the use of transesophageal echo and how uh, we can manage them. So coronary graft occlusion, this will show ECG changes corresponding with new RWMAs and systolic dysfunction. Of course, the treatment would be to revise the graft. Coronary air embolism, again, ECG changes, new RWMAs, systolic dysfunction. Here we need to improve the coronary perfusion pressure with the help of inotropes. Uh, then embolization of calcium or atheroma inside the uh, coronaries. Again, it will show ECG changes, new RWMAs, systolic dysfunction. We need to improve the coronary perfusion pressure. Aortic root dissection. We can visualize a dissection or hematoma in the root of the aorta or the ascending aorta. The treatment would be to repair the dissection. Uh, coronary spasm where ECG changes and new RWMAs will be visible. Uh, we should use coronary vasodilators in this case. And venous air embolism, which is uh, very common in the sitting position craniotomy. Here also transesophageal echo is a very good, uh, uh, of very good use as a monitor. So uh, venous air embolism is detected as sudden hypotension, sharp drop in ETCO2, uh, presence of arrhythmias, mill murmur, and a visible air embolus in the right side of the heart. So here we need to stop the procedure, cover the surgical field with saline and uh, stop nitrous oxide, of course, uh, aspirate air from the CVP line and fluid infusion. Now we come to the third part of today's talk, that is the intra-aortic balloon path. So IABP is basically not a monitoring device, but a mechanical support device to take over the function of the failing systemic ventricle. So it was first introduced in 1968 and is still an effective treatment for left ventricular failure. Counter pulsation, which are properly timed IABP improves the myocardial oxygen supply and decreases oxygen demand to some extent. It remains useful for stabilizing and improving the hemodynamics in selected patients with low cardiac output, but it cannot substantially augment forward flow in severe MB failure. So according to the 2013 ACCA AHA recommendations for use of IABP in patients of STEMI, what does it say? It says that it's a class 2A recommendation with level of evidence B. The use of IABP counter pulsation can be useful for patients with cardiogenic shock after STEMI who do not quickly stabilize with pharmacological therapy. The indications for implementation of mechanically, mechanical circulatory support, that is if after the use of IABP also, the parameters are not improving, parameters which show that there is adequate perfusion in the body, then we need to go to a higher mechanical circulatory support like a ventricular assist device or probably ECMO. So if the patient still has hypotension after using IABP, MAP less than 60 and SVP less than 90, cardiac index less than 2, uh, PCWP or the right atrial pressure more than 20, SVR more than 2000 and oliguria, low SVO2 and rising lactate, all of which are indicators of uh, poor tissue perfusion, then we need to go to a higher mechanical circulatory device. So what are some of the components of the intraiotic balloon pump? So first of all, the balloon, this is made of biocompatible material and it blocks the way of the blood. 
in the aorta at a specific time point, which we will be discussing in the subsequent slides. Then we have the console, which is a monitoring device. Uh, and in this console, either the ECG determines the phase of the cardiac cycle, or it is the diacrotic notch of the uh, arterial blood pressure uh, curve. And helium is used to inflate the balloon when the aortic valve closes. Then we have the catheter, which attaches the balloon with the transducer. And of course, the transducer, which is compulsory for continuous BP monitoring. A double notch in the aortic pressure curve, which measures the time of expansion and the contraction of the balloon. Now, this is the picture of the console. Here we have the screen, which is the monitor, which shows the ECG and the uh, non-augmented and the augmented blood pressure. And from either from the ECG or from the blood pressure curve, the, uh, the, the device takes its timing of inflation and deflation of the balloon. And the rest of the this whole uh, structure, this contains the helium cylinder and the connecting devices to the transducer. So uh, how is this inserted? It is inserted percutaneously through the femoral artery, most commonly by the surgical uh, team. It is advanced retrogradely up the aorta, positioned just distant to the origin of the left subclavian artery and guided by transesophageal echo. So here the need to position it distant to the origin of left subclavian is that because it will stay in C2 for several days together probably and repeated inflation and deflation uh, may lead to uh, interruption of blood flow in the left uh, upper limb and that may lead to ischemic changes in the left upper limb. So that should be avoided. Now, how does it function? So the balloon inflation occurs in diastole. Uh, what does it do? It occludes the aorta, increases the aortic root pressure. So we know that the coronaries are arising from the aortic valve uh, cusps on the root of the aorta. So it improves the coronary perfusion pressure and the myocardial oxygen supply is thereby improved. Then when does the deflation occur? Just before the next stole. So this abruptly decreases the pressure in the aorta and it improves forward ejection from the failing left ventricle. So a better stroke volume can be expected and a lesser myocardial work. Now these two pictures, they show that this is the deflated balloon, which is occurring in systole, helping the LV to pump more blood with the improved stroke volume with every beat. And this is the inflated balloon, which is occurring in diastole. So the pressure in the root of the aorta is increased and improved coronary perfusion occurs. So the timing uh, of this inflation and deflation is key to optimal hemodynamic benefit. So the usual trigger is the R wave of the ECG, otherwise the diacrotic notch of the arterial pressure curve. Depending on the need for support, the balloon inflation can be triggered with each cardiac cycle, which is one is to one, with every other cardiac cycle, that is one is to two, or with every third cardiac cycle. Augmentation of cardiac output can occur maximally up to 25 to 30 percent, but not beyond that. Additional benefits are improved microcirculation in the brain and kidney and decrease in the systemic acidosis. So here you can see this is what the uh, curve on the uh, monitor will look like. So this is the native non-augmented systolic peak and this is the IBP augmented peak. Some of the contraindications to the insertion of uh, intraaortic balloon pump are clinically significant aortic insufficiency, aortic aneurysm, a friable atherosclerotic plaque in aorta or ascending aortic dissection. Thank you. This is uh, nicely presented and I will like to talk to you about uh, that IAVP is very useful when patient has a CHF yes, and uh, post-cardiac surgery also. Yes, sir. And certain condition where heart failure is there. Yes. And it's life-saving. We usually put IAVP one is to one ratio triggering so yes, that uh, uh, support. Same time when uh, heart start improving, we slowly one is to two. Slowly one. reduce. Yes, yes. Augmentation oh. only. Yeah. Augmentation where early inflation may be sometimes dangerous, but that is what we have to see to it. Yes. Nice. And uh, postgraduate, and thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And from audience, uh, you can ask. So there's uh, one question to uh, Dr. Manpreet that if there is any difference in the waveform and the value of IVP between radial and dorsal spadus cannulation. Uh, Actually, I had uh, explained in the uh, presentation itself, when you talk about dorsalis pedis, as you go away from the heart, the 
the systolic pressure that rises and you get the diacrotic notch at a, a little more distant compared to the when you talk about radial. However, regarding the cannulation technique, it's almost the same. Worldwide now, the use of guide wire is picking up. Right now, like I'm in US, so they routinely use guide wire for cannulation of all the arterial cannulations. So that makes the process even much more easier for cannulation of any artery, whether it be radial, whether it be dorsalis pares. Thank you, ma'am. And there are no more questions. Um, so that answers the query. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much uh, to both the speakers for giving their valuable contribution to EPEC 23. Thank you. So moving on to our next session for today, I would like to invite a very eminent faculty, Dr. Naveed Manutra, sir. Sir is senior professor and is heading the pain management center at PGIMS Rotha Karyana. And sir's area of special interests are chronic pain. We welcome you, sir. And I hand over the proceedings of the session to you, sir. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, Monday morning in the APEC 2023. And I thank Dr. M.D. Kaur and other uh, team of APEC 2023 for the warm invitation. And I, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Sanjula Virmani, Director Professor, G.V. Pandit Institute of Postgraduate Medical Education and Research, Delhi and her areas of interest are cardiac anesthesia, and she will be deliberating on congenital heart disease and its anesthetic implications. Dr. Sanjula Virwani, please. Good morning, everybody. In a patient with congenital heart disease, presenting for non-cardiac surgery, the anesthetic implications are based on three things. One, the nature of congenital heart disease. Secondly, the degree of cardiopulmonary impairment, and most importantly, the type of surgical procedure. So if the surgery is elective or it is less urgent and the cardiac disease is severe enough to require a surgical correction, for example, if a patient is presenting for elective hernia repair and has severe pulmonary stenosis, perform the pulmonary valvotomy first before taking up the patient for the elective surgery. If, on the other hand, if the cardiac surgery or the intervention procedure is not indicated, for example, if the pulmonary stenosis is not very severe, the patient can be optimized with medical management before cardiac surgery is undertaken with risk stratification. Now, on if the surgery is of emergent nature, for example, if the patient of tetralogy is coming to you for drainage of an abscess, then the surgery should be undertaken with high or intermediate risk. But even if it is an emergency surgery, it does give us a few, a couple of hours in order to optimize the medical condition. For example, we can, uh, we can correct the acidosis, we can correct the electrolytes, and we can even perform a phlebotomy in order to improve the microcirculation. The anesthetic implications can be best understood if you have a very clear knowledge about the pathophysiology of congenital heart disease and most importantly of the shunt lesions, left to right shunts and right to left shunt because shunt lesions are the most commonly encountered congenital heart diseases. We have already seen that the uh, fetal circulation is a parallel circulation in which the oxygenated blood flows from the placenta via the ductus venosus into the inferior vena cava into the right atrium. There, from there it gets deflected by the crystal dividends into the left atrium and then is ejected into the left ventricle and from there it comes into the aorta. Now the desaturated blood from the SVC flows into the RA, from there it goes into the RV and the PA. But because of the very high PVR, little blood enters the PA, most of it gets shunted through the ductus into the descending aorta. Now after birth, there occurs an increase in the SVR, there occurs a decrease in PVR because of lung expansion, change in arterial oxygen tension, and because of the action of certain vasoactive mediators. In the absence of congenital heart disease, a transitional period of fetal parallel circulation is transformed into the normal series circulation. The pulmonary artery pressure equals the systemic pressure immediately before birth. Immediately after birth, as ductus closes and the lungs begin breathing air, the PA pressure decreases rapidly to half of the systemic levels. Thereafter, 
there occurs a gradual decrease over weeks to reach the adult levels with the result that normal pH hemodynamics is achieved. And the normal mean pulmonary artery pressure is less than 25 millimeters of mercury at rest. And if it occurs, to, it increases to more than 25 millimeters of mercury at rest or more than 30 millimeters with uh, exercise, it is known as pulmonary artery hypertension. At birth, both the RV and the LV are approximately equal in size and wall thickness. The increase in LV pressure leads to thickening of the ventricular wall over the first two years of life. This diagram illustrates the normal pressure and the saturation in various cardiac chambers. The blood on the right side is desaturated and reaches the left side after oxygenation in the lungs. The PFO and the uh, ductus, they close, which maintains the normal uh, physiology. Uh, now, intracardiac shunts are the most common cardiac lesions uh, which are seen in congenital heart disease. So the congenital heart disease is broadly classified into acyanotic and cyanotic congenital heart disease with or without the presence of a communication or shunt between the chambers which are normally separate. In uh, cyanotic heart disease, the blood flow across the shunt is from right to left and uh, bidirect, may be bidirectional as seen in tetralogy, TGA, tricuspid atresia. And whereas in the left to right shunt, like, such as in cases of VSD, AST, PDA, the shunt is from uh, left to right. In patients with congenital PS, AS, cooptation of aorta, no shunting is present. So uh, shunting is, means there's normal systemic and pulmonary circulations are separate and a simple shunt is said to exist if a direct communication exists between various chambers or between uh, chambers and vessels. A complex shunt is said to exist when the associated with, um, simple shunt is associated with an obstructive lesion. We'll first see the pathophysiology of left to right shunts in patients who have ASD, VSD, PDA because these are most commonly seen congenital heart diseases which come for non-cardiac surgery. So this figure shows some of the commonly occurring uh, left to right chanting of blood at various levels. And in patients who have left to right chanting of blood, there is seen a step up in saturation from SVC to, uh, to PA. Now left to right chanting of blood causes increase in the pulmonary blood flow, leading to an increase in the precapillary vascular obstructive changes increase in resistance to blood flow leading to pulmonary artery hypertension. Now, if this condition remains uncorrected, the pulmonary artery hypertension becomes unresponsive to pulmonary vasodilators. Ultimately, the pulmonary vascular resistance becomes so high that the shunt reverses and becomes right to left, a clinical setting which is known as Eisenmenger's syndrome. Now, clinically, on auscultation, Patient with BST will have a harsh, long systolic, crescendo, decrescendo murmur, best heard along the left sternal border. P2 may be palpable and loud with narrow split. In ASD, the patient will have a white, split and fixed second sound with soft ejection systolic murmur. And in PDA, there will be a machinery continuous murmur will be heard. A 12 lead ECG is recommended and it may reveal right bundle branch block, right axis deviation as a consequence of atrial and ventricular enlargement. X-ray chest will relieve uh, features of uh, pulmonary, increased pulmonary circulation, chamber enlargement, which is specific to the type of lesion. For example, this is an X-ray of a 31-year-old woman with ostium secundum ASD. Pulmonary hypercirculation can be seen. There is increase in size of uh, RA, RV, main pulmonary artery and in this is a patient of VSD. Here you can see that there is pulmonary overcirculation, there is an uh, enlarged LA and there is uh, but normal or the caliber of aortic arch. In PDA, there is a pulmonary overcirculation, enlarged LA and prominent aortic arch. If Eisenmenger develops, then there will be relative pruning of the peripheral vessels. This is an echocardiography picture of a patient with uh, a VSD. Here you can see that uh, this is a um, aortic valve in long ax longitudinal axis of the aortic valve at 120 degrees. There, this is the aortic valve. This is a subaortic VSD. 
with left to right chanting of blood across it. Let us move on to the right to left chant, which have decreased pulmonary blood flow. This slide shows the commonly encountered cyanotic heart diseases. Most commonly seen is tetralogy, tricuspid atresia, Epstein's anomaly, TGA. These are less commonly encountered diseases. Now, to understand the pathophysiology of a cyanotic heart disease, we have to understand the shunting. We have already seen that a complex shunt is one in which a simple shunt is associated with an obstructive lesion. At this is the obstructive lesion which is present at the right ventricular outflow tract. This will lead to an increase in the right ventricular pressure and this will cause a, a shunt to increase from right to left. If the RVOT obstruction is dynamic, as occurs in case of tetralogy, it can, which may occur because it might increase because of sympathetic overactivity, the right to left chanting of our blood increases. And this is the reason for the hypersyanotic spell, which is seen in tetralogy of Palo. This is, uh, is one of, TOF is one of the most common cyanotic lesions. There occurs a VST. Then there is an RVOT obstruction like pulmonary stenosis, which may be valvular or infundibular overriding of the aorta and uh, when right ventricular hypertrophy. Now, due to predominant right to left shunting, there is desaturation of blood. And since the obstruction is dynamic, this shunt fraction can change. This is an, uh, we can, uh, the net result. This is one of, this is a picture of uh, echocardiography picture of uh, tetral, a patient with tetralogy. And this is a longitudinal axis of the aorta at around 120 degrees. Here you can see that there is a uh, there is a mosaic pattern here which shows that there is pulmonary stenosis. There is a that is right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. There's a small VST here, is overriding of the aorta and right ventricular hypertrophy. Now the net result of right to left shunting of blood is there results hypoxia, congestive cardiac failure, and coagulation abnormalities. Hypoxia is the root cause of all the problems. It leads to polycythemia, increase in blood volume, vasodilatation, alveolar hyperventilation, and chronic respiratory alkalosis. All these adaptive mechanisms lead to coagulation abnormalities, increase in vascular resistance, and they impair the global ventricular function. Chronic hypoxia causes polycythemia, which leads to peripheral sludging of blood. And this causes an increase in the intravascular stasis and thrombosis, followed by a state of hyperfibrinolysis due to decreased clotting factors and decrease in the number of functional platelets. The vitamin K dependent coagulation factors also decrease, such as factor two, five, seven, and nine. This is this occurs because of uh, hepatic dysfunction secondary to cardiac failure. Now the coagulation abnormalities can be corrected uh, by uh, replacement of coagulation factors, correction of anemia, phlebotomy in order to improve the microcirculation, and also we can add administration of vitamin K. Now let us come to the anesthetic management of congenital heart disease. We will first see the anesthetic management of uh, patients who have left to right shunt, followed by patients in whom there is right to left shunt. <clears throat> A preoperative assessment and pre medication will be similar in both types of uh, shunt cases. A good pre-operative uh, assessment is essential in order to determine the physiological status of the patient. This should include recording of height, weight, and a thorough physical examination, and all current medication that the patient is receiving. Blood investigation such as hemoglobin, coagulation profile, renal function test, liver function test, blood grouping should be done. A physical examination should include blood pressure in all extremities, baseline oxygen saturation in all limbs, and the effect on oxygen saturation due to exercise. Edema, cyanosis, murmur, crackles, all should be taken note of. Investigations such as X-ray chest, recent echocardiography, MRI reports should be reviewed. And uh, if the patient is receiving any pulmonary artery, uh, hypertension reducing uh, drugs, they should be continued perioperatively. Pre-medication, a good pre-medication is very important. It reduces anxiety. It makes parental separation easy, especially in case of children. It also reduces the catecholamine release. 
and it helps in smooth uh, induction. It also re reduces the chances of hypersynotic spells in patients who have tetralogy. Hyperventilation, hypercarbia should be avoided. Pulse oximetry should be start monitored after pre-medication. <clears throat> the choice of drugs includes midazolam 0.5 mg per kg orally or 0.05 to 0.2 mg per kg intravenously. Triclofos can be given in orally in a dose of 50 to 70 mg per kg body weight. Ketamine 1 to 2 mg per kg IV or 5 mg per kg orally if there is no IV access. Uh, in managing patients of left to right shunt lesions, we know that the patients are prone to develop URI and this should be treated adequately before surgery. That means the patient should be maximally decongested before taking up the patient for any kind of surgery. The preoperative fasting time should be minimized and adequate hydration should be ensured. <clears throat> in small children, there are psychosocial considerations and they should be discussed with the parents. The risk of paradoxical hair embolism should not be forgotten. Care should be taken to de-air the lines properly. Now, endocarditis profile access should be undertaken as per the institution protocols. Most patients with left to right shunt tolerate surgery and anesthesia well, unless pulmonary artery hypertension is present. The anesthetic goal is directed towards decreasing the shunt flow, maintaining the cardiovascular respiratory stability, and providing adequate tissue perfusion and oxygenation. And while following all these goals, the, we have to minimize the left to right chanting and this uh, to minimize the left to right chanting we have to decrease the SVR, maintain adequate preload, avoid any increase in pulmonary artery pressures such as hypoxia, hypercarbia, acidosis and if there is presence of pulmonary artery hypertension, pulmonary vasodilators can be used. In the wake of pulmonary artery hypertension, the, a good level of sedation and analgesia is necessary. We have to avoid hypercarbia, hypothermia, acidosis, use pulmonary vasodilators like nitroglycerin, nitroprusside, prostaglandin, sildenafil, nitrous oxide should be avoided, and we should consider elective postoperative ventilation. A few words about Eisenwenger syndrome. We've already seen that in the pathophysiology of left to right shunt, how shunt reversal can occur due to suprasystemic pulmonary artery pressure and long-standing pulmonary artery hypertension. This is generally seen with uh, ventricular level shunts and the patient may present with central sinusitis, dyspnea, fatigue, hemoptysis, and co, right-sided heart failure. And uh, pul pulmonary vasodilators should be used in symptomatic patients. Now, uh, fixed pulmonary vascular resistance, it precludes rapid adaptation to perioperative hemodynamic changes and changes in SVR are mirrored by changes in the intracardiac shunting. So any decrease in SVR will be accompanied by any increase in right to left shunting and decrease in, in the systemic saturation. Now general anesthesia is generally used because of the hemodynamic maneuverability is better with general anesthesia and it should be the preferred technique. However, regional anesthesia too has been used successfully, but the local anesthetic should be delivered slowly in incremental doses with close monitoring of the blood pressure and saturation. Currently, the pulmonary vasodilators, which have been approved, belong to four classes, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, such as sildenafil, endothelin, receptor antagonists like bosentan, prostacyclin like aloprost, and all these can be used for in the presence of pulmonary artery hypertension. Surgery should not be performed if the PA systolic pressure is more than two-thirds of the systemic or if the pulmonary vascular resistance is more than two-thirds of the systemic, or there is a net right to left shunt in the wake of lesions which are predominantly with left to right shunting of blood. <clears throat> now let us come to the anesthetic goals that are seen in patients with left to right shunt lesions. The patient should be pain-free and asleep. Should be, there should be maintenance of hemodynamics and we have to minimize the right to left shunting by avoiding any sudden decrease in SPR or increase in PVR, avoiding any adrenergic surges. And if it does occur, then we can use beta blockers like uh, Esmolol. <clears throat> All intravenous agents can be safely used. Morphine, fentanyl, midazolam, because all of these will cause decrease in SPR. So it is not the type of the drug. It is the rate and the dose which is administered, which is more important than the drug itself. 
they should be given in small incremental doses with careful monitoring of the blood pressure and the saturation. Inhalational induction can also be used. Seboflurane halothane can be used, but it may prolong <clears throat> because of the right to left chanting. And but this is rarely a pro problem clinically. <clears throat> the need for invasive monitoring depends upon the nature of surgery and the underlying cardiac lesion. There should be no central lines in patients who have already got a cabopulmonary connection such as Fontano gland. Arterial pressure on the contralateral side should be used in patients who have a BT shunt existing. And we should be aware that capnography will underread the PACO2 in the presence of right to left shunt. T can be used in order to aid in the hemodynamic management. <clears throat> in the presence of a hypersanotic spell, if it occurs intraoperatively, this can occur because of any because of the presence of dynamic RVOT obstruction. And this may increase due to any decrease in SVR or because of decrease in the systemic arterial pressure. So if this does occur, then we have to give beta blockers like metoprolol, esmolol, and we can also give a small dose of noradrenaline in order to increase the SVR. So this to uh, end all the all the details that we have studied till now, this is a cardiac grid, which you can find in any of the standard textbooks. And it summarizes the pathophysiologic goals, which is choice of anesthetic drugs that can be used to achieve the goals that we have just covered. So a pregnancy in heart disease is a separate lecture because of the implications. In the presence of congenital heart disease, the patients are counseled against becoming pregnant because there is a high chance of complications with abortion rates of around 43%, PPH 50%, arrhythmias 29%, and heart failure can occur, especially between 23 to 30 weeks and at the time of delivery. So delivery has been safely conducted using neuraxial catheters, but because of easy maneuverability of hemodynamics, general anesthesia is preferred. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, for an excellent lecture. I can say that you had made it appear so simple and uh, explained it very nicely uh, to all the delegates that I myself was enjoying listening to you. And uh, still there are some questions. We can take it up now or at the end of the session. So we'll take up the questions towards the end of the session. So, so we can go now ahead with the second speaker. Uh, very dear Dr. Vivek Gupta, we shall be deliberating on CABG with or without bypass. And uh, he is a renowned faculty consultant in the Department of Cardiac Anesthesia and Intensive Care and coordinator of ECMO program. His areas of interest are ECMO in toxicology, basic and advanced CPR training, RRT in ICUs, quality in healthcare, infection control in ICU, advanced hemodynamic monitoring, including PE, has got numerous publications to his credit in national and international journals, and he is chairman of the Research and Ethics Committee, vice president of ICMO Society, past secretary of ICMO Society, and so and so forth. Lots and lots uh, of uh, credits to him. Uh, he even avoided FACTA also, section editor of GOCP, uh, API textbook 2016 an editor of Anesthesia Update 2016. I invite Dr. Vivek Gupta to deliberate on off-pump or on-pump CABG. Dr. Vivek Gupta, please. Good morning, all. First of all, thanks to organizer for giving this opportunity to me. I'll be speaking on anesthetic management in CABG patients, both on-pump means use of cardiopulmonary bypass or off-pump means on the beating heart. Off-pump CABG is not actually a recent invent, uh, invention. Before the cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, off-pump CABG was performed for coronary revascularization. But because of the um, adv advancement with the cardiopulmonary bypass and cardioplegia technique, uh, this technique was not used regularly. But in the early 80s, it was found that this can be useful in certain high risk category of the patient to prevent the neurological complications and the real complications. And it was again started. 
quickly, we'll have a look on the coronary artery, the coronary circulation. Two arteries, left uh, main coronary artery divides into left circumflex and left anterior descending, which reaches up to the apex of the heart, and right coronary artery, which uh, gives the posterior descending artery and reaches up to the crux of the heart. So let's start with the case of 50, 60 year old patient who had a chest pain of the last 15 days, while uh, especially while walking and treating with the rest. He also had the breathlessness. Uh, though he was uh, stable hemodynamically, he's a known diabetic and hypertensive. After an incident, is stabilization. A coronary angiography was done and it was found to have a triple vessel disease. So he was planned for CABG and a pre anesthetic assessment was sought from us. So quickly, um, how this myocardial ischemia takes place. It is basically imbalance between the oxygen delivery and the oxygen demand. When the delivery decreases, the condition where there is a decreased coronary blood flow or decreased arterial oxygen content due to the anemia or hypoxemia, or if there is decreased oxygen extraction, or when there is an increased oxygen demand because of tachycardia, increasing wall stress, or increasing cardiac contractility. So if there is an imbalance, this will lead to myocardial ischemia and will have more patient will have the anginal pain or ECG changes. So basically, what are our goals as an anesthesia? We must provide a safe anesthesia um, with using a technique which offers the maximum myocardial protection and hemodynamic stability. We try to stabilize uh, hemodynamically throughout the procedure by using a physical and pharmacological method. We allow an early emergence, fast track uh, extubation, and we ensure that we are giving adequate analgesia in the post-operative period. So a pre-operative assessment will guide us about the risk stratification so that we can explain the perioperative, intraoperative, and post-operative risk to the patient. So a thorough history, we should include the review of the paper as well as confirming the history from the patient, and we can have take further history depending upon the comorbidities. It should be the history should focus on the primary problem progression of the disease as well as the comorbidities. Our examination should be focused on the general examination, airway assistant and systemic examination, and we should review all relevant investigations for that uh, patient depending upon the comorbidities. So a history, where angina is stable or unstable, uh, what is the grade of dyspnea? Uh, is there a history of any recent market infarction? Patient is having episodes of cardiac failure, or there is a flash pulmonary edema? in the recent uh, period. While evaluating, we should look for any edema, tachycardia, hypo or hypertension, raised GVP, and presence of any murmur suggestive of any mechanical issues like uh, mitral regurgitation or a ventricular septic fracture. It is important to look for a recent or rapid progression of the symptoms, um, severity, particularly the onset of angina, we should alert an anesthesiologist that this patient is, may have the perioperative ventricular dysfunction. We should assess the activity status by looking at the METs. So if the MET is above 7, it means it's good. But if it is less than 4, it means it's poor. We can look at the various grades of angina, grade 1 from the, the no angina on the ordinary physical activity to increasing trend to a grade 4 where the patient is unable uh, to carry out any physical activity without discomfort. Similarly, uh, heart failure, class A and YHA class uh, 1, where no limitation of the physical activity with all the ordinary activity, and class 4, where patient is unable to carry out any physical activity without discomfort. So we look at the X-ray uh, that will guide us the cardiomegaly, any pericardial effusion, um, <clears throat> parenchymal, lung parenchymal changes, and about the aorta, that there is no calcification. We look at ECG, we compare with the previous ECG, we look at the territory of the infarct, whether it's anterior, inferior, or, uh, um, or uh, anterior septal, um, any recent infarct, or there's a development of the Q wave, any conduction abnormality, or atrial fibrillation. 2D echocardiography will guide us about the LV functions, about the hypokinesia, or akinesia, or any valvular lesions, or any other uh, concomitant disease. Coronary angiography will talk about number and site and severity of the disease, whether it's a left main or left main equivalent, uh, such as ostite, osteal, uh, um, the left anterior descending, or right coronary artery disease. Um, 
to evaluate the respiratory system of the patient, take any history of the recent respiratory tract infection, smoking, asthma, or COPD. Uh, is the patient is having a shortness of breath at rest? There are crepitation or bronchi. Uh, look at the X-ray. If the patient is a chronic smoker or COPD, look at the blood gases. And lung function test is required if we suspect a severe obstructive or restrictive lung disease, but one should be careful uh, for a patient who is having NGI. I evaluate renal functions. Um, if patient is having any uncontrolled diabetes or hypertension, any nephrotoxic drug patient is taking, our patient has undergone any surgery, our patient is on regular dialysis. Look at the serum electrolyte, especially the potassium, serum creatinine and blood urea, and if needed, do an ultrasound uh, abdomen to evaluate the renal function. GI tract uh, um, history and evaluation to look for the gastroesophageal reflex disease and peptic ulcer disease. This will help to reduce the risk of regurgitation and we can see for any contraindications such as uh, mediastinal radiation is particularly structured for the placement of the transesophageal leukopidograph. Look at the liver enjoying, enjoying uh, protein profile and serum protein. Patients should be assessed neurologically uh, for any history of CVA or syncopal attack, which uh, syncopal attack can be suggestive of even complete heart block. Uh, evaluate for the, any residual weakness if we had the cerebral acid accident um, or any sensory loss are carried through. And if uh, needed, if needed, patient may undergo CT or MRI, but carried to apply to rule out any uh, atherosclerotic changes in the carotid artery. Uh, assess the diabetic status for how long the patient is having diabetes, what treatment he is taking, and how, what, how good is that control is. And always look for the complications such as neuropathy, nephropathy, and retinopathy. Uh, if the patient is having underlying uh, thyroid disease, look for the thyroid status, any surgery patient has undergone for the thyroid, what current treatment patient is taking, and what is the present TSH and uh, functional T4 status. Look for the other allergy, especially the allergy with the seafood, because patient can have the protomate reaction. Current medication, all anti-anginal, anti-hypertensive, anti and um, anti-diabetic drugs, but remember, uh, we should avoid any ACE inhibitors for these patients. Assess for the patient cooperation that will help you to insert the line on the day of surgery and do a thorough airway assessment. There are certain investigations which must be performed routinely for all patients and certain investigations which are specific for certain patients who are having underlying pathology are certain history. So a blood count, progression, studies, blood group, determination, electrolyte, uh, renal functions, hepatic functions, uh, 12 DCG, and the angiography report is uh, mandatory, is a routine preoperative investigation for almost all patients. So a coronary angiography and echocardiography should be uh, see, uh, seen thoroughly by an anesthesiologist. By doing this, <coughs> sorry, you can have uh, assess the risk of post-operative morbidity as well as the post-operative mortality. Uh, in the cardiac surgical procedures, we follow certain uh, uh, scoring system, though it is not important for the uh, anesthesiologist to evaluate these scoring system, but it, should, it is done by the surgeon and anesthetic should have a thorough knowledge of these uh, scoring systems. So uh, the communication to the patients or patient relative will be similar. So there are multiple variables, different uh, scoring system, like a commonly used a personal system or Euroscore 2. Uh, they take the various uh, factors like uh, age, female gender, cardiac functions, what is the type of surgery, how urgent is the surgery. Uh, the commonly used is the Euroscore 2 now. Uh, however, certain hospitals use the personal score as well, which ranges from 0 to 4 scoring uh, risk of death is less than 1% and if the score goes beyond 20, the chances of mortality is as high as 30%. Uh, the Euroscore 2 also uses uh, several factors, uh, several parameters, variables, and accordingly, the risk calculation for the morbidity and mortality can be done. Whatever the risk uh, stratification method is being used, the most common factors which are associated with the higher risk is the age above 80, decompensated heart failure, cardiogenic shock, or acute kidney injury patients. Factor with the moderate risk are age above 70, 
uh, reduce surgery, emergency surgery, patient is having pulmonary hypertension, or a patient is a acute case of chronic kidney disease. The other factor which increases the risk include the diabetes, hypertension, obesity, ejection fraction less than 40%, patient is having a simultaneous valve surgery, or there is an aneurysm, or a female patient. So how to pre-medicate these patients? The focus should be on the reducing the fear and anxiety and making a patient comfortable. So we can use the sedation, diazepam or clorazepam, night prior to surgery and the day of surgery in the morning hours. However, we can give the medazolam intravenously on the day of surgery, one to two milligram to make patient comfortable and uh, as an anxiolysis. Um, patient must receive all his anti-anginal, anti-arrhythmic and anti-hypertensive except the ACE inhibitors. Oral hypoglycemic and insulin should not be administered, but during the intraoperative period, an insulin infusion should be started um, depending upon the how much is the blood sugar number. Once the patient has arrived to the operation room, patient receives uh, may receive more anxiolytics if needed, if patient is anxious before doing the uh, cannulation. And the temperature and other ambience in the operation room should be comfortable to the patient. As an analgesic, we can use the morphine intramuscularly 0.1 to 0.15 mg per kg, or we can use the fentanyl 50 to 70 microgram intravenously. Uh, how we manage the anesthesia during the CABG, once the patient has arrived, we should ensure that we are giving oxygen to the patient. We attach the ECG, pulse oximeter, and non invasive blood pressure. We can do a, a cannulation of the radial artery. Uh, with the help of uh, under local anesthesia, and we can send an ABG sample and we can initiate a continuous artery blood pressure monitoring. We can place the central venous catheter or pulmonary artery catheter in a high risk patient uh, before induction of anesthesia itself under local anesthesia if the patient is cooperative. Uh, most important monitoring is the ECG monitoring. It should, the electrode should be placed on the back of the patient. We should focus with the lead 2 and lead 5 and ensure that you are getting an adequate ECG trace on the monitor throughout the surgery and especially you are able to identify the P wave and the QRS complex because while manipulating the heart during uh, the cam, uh, grafting, uh, there will be change in the ECG shape. Um, and whenever you are doing ECG monitoring, ensure that there is a ST segment uh, monitoring is in progress. So any change in the trend of the ST segment, you can quickly identify. <coughs> now here you can see on the upper end of ECG, there is a sub ischemia in the form of ST depression, while there is a transcortical ischemia in the form of ST elevation. Arterial blood, gas, uh, blood pressure monitoring with the use of radial artery, it will give a continuous B2B to B arterial blood pressure monitoring and it will give us a good guide. But before placing the radial artery cannula, we should ensure that the other collateral circulation on that particular arm is adequate by using the modified LN test. Um, it should be used uh, usually in the non-dominant side, but if the surgeon is taking out the left radial artery, then it should be placed on the right radial artery. There can always be difference in the post cardiopulmonary bypass period in the radial artery and the femoral artery pressure. So a femoral artery cannulation in the CABG patient must be done which can be helpful for placing an intraaortic balloon in case of patient is not recovering and a continuous arterial blood pressure monitoring um, while revolving. Central venous cannulation is needed because uh, large uh, fluid, large, good amount of fluid is required and patient requires a multiple drug uh, infusion as well. It will help us to give a guide for the filling pressures, though it is not a diet very good surrogate for uh, left atrial pressure, but uh, still by looking at trend, we can understand the uh, filling pressures. Um, but uh, we should remember while placing the central venous catheter during, before the induction, and we have already given the sedation to the patient, we should give a supplemental oxygen to avoid any hypoxia prior to induction of the patient. Multilumal catheter will help us to administer fluid and drug infusion simultaneously. The pulmonary artery catheter should be kept only for those patients who are having an impaired ventricular functions, our patient is uh, having a high risk of intraoperative ischemia, our patient is having a severe comorbid conditions, or we are going to perform the uh, 
two or three processes together. For example, CABG with mitral valve uh, replacement or CABG with the carotid and artery, etc. Uh, because pulmonary artery catheter will guide us about the pulmonary capillary pressure, PA diastolic pressure as a surrogate for the filling pressure. Uh, Transesophageal echocardiography. This is another uh, tool uh, to give a good guide in the intraoperative period for the ventricular preload contactility or identifying the myocardial ischemia and several other things such as aortic annulation site or even the valve pathology um, and identifying any uh, defect like a ventricular septal defect or arterial septal defect can be identified in the intraoperative period. So it can help us to identify very quickly the uh, myocardial ischemia and if there is a segmental wall motion abnormality uh, even before the ECG changes we can quickly identify uh, with the help of transesophageal echocardiography. Um, uh, we use usually the short axis mid papillary muscle view to look for the any regional wall motion abnormality and it can be helpful in those patients especially when there is a bundle branch block or extensive Q wave or STT changes where it is difficult to identify any ischemia the T will be a a good guide to identify it. How do we manage the anesthesia during uh, CABG? A baseline arterial blood gas before intubation or induction of anesthesia. Um, then uh, we induced uh, anesthesia and ensured that we have placed the proper endotracheal tube. Um, we ensure a baseline activated uh, clotting time. Um, which is usually 80 to 120 uh, second, which will help us to guide about the heparin doses. Police catheter for urine output assessment, temperature monitoring, both for the poor temperature with the use of bladder and esophageal and uh, um, nasopharyngeal temperature, which will guide us for the brain temperature. The central monitoring can be done with the use of bispectral index or using of the entropy or PSRA. Uh, uh, whatever method we are using, this will guide us to ensure the adequate depth of anesthesia. How do we induce the patient? Um, it is important to understand that while inducing the patient, there is a risk of hemodynamic instability, uh, especially when there is a patient's cardiac functions is not good. Now, so um, a titrated dose of the drug induction agent should be administered irrespective of the type of the induction agent. While inducing, we should avoid both hypertension and tachycardia are hypotension and bradycardia, both can be detrimental because both will make an imbalance between the oxygen supply and demands. There is no single strategy for all cardiac surgical patients. We can use hypnotics, opioids, volatile anesthetic agent, or combination of the both for induction and maintenance of anesthesia. The commonly used drug for the induction of anesthesia can be thiopentone, propofol, or uh, etomidine. So a thiopentone, um, we can use the hypnotic dose ranging from 50 to 125 milligram uh, it, because it leads to a decrease in the cardiac output, stroke volume, and systemic vascular resistance. Um, and the decrease in the marker contractility also can take place. Um, we should always uh, remember that it can increase the airway resistance, it can precipitate the bronchospasm, and it may lead to a post operative nausea and vomiting, more risk as compared to the propofol. The other drug induction agent, which is very commonly used with the Propofol, the induction dose is 1.5 to 2.5 milligram per kilogram of body weight, but should be reduced 25 to 50 percent in cases of elderly patient. Uh, but propofol uh, also reduces the systemic blood pressure, decreases the cardiac output, and systemic vascular resistance. So we should be careful that there can be risk of hemodynamic instability. The most cardio stable drug is the etomidine. It can be used in the dose of 0.2 to 0.4 milligram per kilogram of body weight. It is an ideal drug for the rapid induction of anesthesia in the patient with ischemic heart disease. But the limiting factor is the depression of the adrenocortical uh, depressed uh, depression of the adrenocortical function in, if the drug is being at the repeated doses. Ketamine is it is not a good choice for induction of the anesthesia in the patients with the coronary artery disease because it increases the heart rate increases the cardiac output and blood pressure so that it increases the myocardial oxygen requirement. The other drugs which are commonly used is the benzodiazepines. The most commonly used drug is the midazolam, which is used as an induction agent from the dose of 0.12 to 0.2 milligram per kilogram body weight over 30 to 60 seconds. 
um, but it uh, leads to a slower induction uh, because it has a slower onset of action as compared to the other induction agent and it takes longer time for awakening from the anesthesia. All neurobuscular blocking agents has been used for the cardiac surgical patients. Uh, longer acting agents can be used for a patient where we are not um, extubating patients early, we are not doing the fast tracking. So pancuronium can be a good choice because it has an additional advantage of uh, offsetting the bradycardia because of high dose of opioids. However, the rocurinium uh, is a most hemodynamically stable uh, neurobuscular propagation and it can help for the fast track anesthesia as well. Uh, we can maintain the anesthesia with the use of intravenous anesthetic agent. We avoid any high dose of opioids or long acting drugs so that uh, the patient can recover from anesthesia quickly. So, shorter acting drug in the form of propofol infusion, ravifentanil, or sufentanil infusion can be used, or even a combination of low dose metazolam with the opioids can be used. Volatile anesthetic agent, it uh, basically decreases both oxygen supply as well as the demand. Um, it decreases the afterload and the systemic rest of resistance, and it decreases the contractility as well. And they can have the protective effect because of preconditioning. However, there is a risk of coronary steel, especially the iso, uh, use with the use of isoflurin. However, how much it is clinically significant, it is difficult to say. If we have planned for the um, on-pump CABG, means with the use of cardiopulmonary bypass, we should, as an anesthesiologist, we should ensure that we are maintaining the adequate hemodynamics prior to going on bypass, so ensuring a adequate brain and kidney perfusion. Um, especially when the surgeon is manipulating the heart, there is a, always a risk of reduction in the blood pressure, which can be detrimental, so the hemodynamics should be maintained with the help of volume uh, resuscitation, Trindenburg position, as well as with the use of a small dose of phenylephrine for increasing the blood pressure. Uh, how do we manage when we are planning to going on bypass? Make sure that the adequate heparinization has been done and ECT is above 400. Uh, while the surgeon is doing the venous cannulation, make sure that there is no arrhythmia. Uh, when uh, they are doing the aortic cannulation, uh, bring down the systemic blood pressure around 90 to 100 millimeter of systolic blood pressure. Because there is a risk of aortic dissection or there can be risk of emboli because of clog or air. So one should be careful while the surgeon is cannulated. Once adequate uh, heparinization has taken place, uh, CPP can be started and the pump flow can be gradually increased to 2.5 to liter per minute per meter square. Uh, once surgeon is ready and has done the cross clamp, they can administer the cardioplasia to stop heart completely and we can stop ventilation once the full flow has been achieved from the perfusionist side. We try to maintain the mean arterial pressure on 50 to 80 millimeter of mercury, so to ensure the adequate organ perfusion. Um, because there is a hemodilution because with the use of priming solution uh, that we use as a crystalloid, so uh, we try to maintain a hematocrit between 20 to 25 and always add the sedatives, analgesic as well as the muscle relaxant, anesthetic drugs, on the cardiopulmonary bypass because the drugs are getting diluted because of the uh, priming solution. Interoperatively, make sure blood gas analysis is being done every half hourly. We are looking at the blood glucose levels, serum pot uh, potassium levels, and ACT is also done um, every half hourly. And on cardiopulmonary bypass, the ACT is maintained on 400 to 500. PEG is not done routinely, but if you are ex expecting a coagulation abnormality and bleeding risk, our baseline PEG should always be done to compare uh, for the future. Uh, trans, uh, um, uh, thromboelastomer. Once the revascularization is complete and the rewarming has been done, the weaning from the cardiopulmonary bypass should be initiated. But as an anesthesiologist, one should be ready with the inotropes or vasopressors, whatever you are choosing for that particular case. But, um, atrial and ventricular pacing on the epicardial lead um, may be required in the patient, especially if the patient is having the AV block or bradycardia. And once the sinus rhythm has recovered, because this will give a best cardiac output, so we should always maintain a sinus rhythm. If the patient is not responding with the epinephrine, dopamine, or dobutamine, and cardiac index is not improving, then patient may require intra-antritic balloon pump in the intraoperative period. 
Once we have come off bypass and patient is hemodynamically stable, we reverse the to heparin uh, with the protamine in the ratio of 1 is to 1, but the protamine should be given slowly because of there is a risk of um, uh, reaction. Once the adequate hemostasis has been achieved, the chest closure should be done and patient should be transported to the recovery area. Transesophageal lipopartic probe should be removed, a stomach should be decompressed, and patient or contrast monitoring should be done of the ECG blood pressure and SpO2 while transporting the patient. While transporting, one should be careful that the chest tube is under water seal so that there is no pneumothorax and the mediastinal tube is not clamped. Otherwise, there is always a risk of temper. If we have chosen the off-pump CABG, it has certain advantage over the on-pump CABG. Here, um, there is less risk of systemic inflammatory response because we are not using a cardiopulmonary bypass. It's a foreign circuit and uh, oxidative. There is a less risk of a risk of coagulopathy because uh, hypothermia, we are avoiding hypothermia as well as we are using the less heparin as compared to the on pump CBG. There is a less risk of uh, neurological dysfunctions or renal dysfunction, less chance, uh, less uh, ICU stay as well as better survival, less myocardial injury and less requirement of the transfusion. So it is beneficial in the high risk patient, especially the patient with the neurological disease or patient with the renal disease. But there are certain conditions if the patient is having an intracavitary thrombus or there is a malignant ventricular arrhythmia or there is a deeper intramyocardial muscle uh, or we are planning for the combined procedure, then off-pump CABG should not be performed. So what are the goals? Goal remains the same in the off-pump CABG as well. We provide a safe anesthesia, we maintain the hemodynamics, we allow an early emergence and we ensure adequate pain relief. Um, what strategy should be followed during the off-pump CABG? We should use a shorter acting induction joint. We reduce the dose of opioids but ensure adequate analgesia. Uh, so we use a shorter acting opioids. Administration of opioids should be done in terms of infusion and we maintain with the combination of inhalational agent and the propofol. Uh, intensive monitoring and maintenance of pneumotyramics throughout the procedure so, can, so we can do an early extubation and a, pain, a good pain relief with the help of uh, thoracic epidural or the intraarterial opioid should be done for an early extubation. Anesthetic approach, here we can use the general anesthesia with the opioids and inhalational agents or we can combine the general anesthesia with the thoracic epidural or intraarterial morphine or even we can do an awake regional anesthesia with the use of thoracic epidural anesthesia alone. Problems uh, with the off-pump CABG, surgeon usually faces two problems. Because when they are doing an anosmosis, so they may have a difficulty of adequate exposure because of the cardiac motion. And second, um, there is a risk of myocardial ischemia during the, uh, when they are doing a grafting, there's a flow interruption. For this purpose, how we can help them? Uh, we must be prepared uh, for any severe hemodynamic alteration, a transient deterioration in the cardiac pump function, or acute intraoperative myocardial ischemia. So hemodynamic management is very, very important during this time while they are positioning. And there should be good communication between the surgeon and anesthesiologist. And anytime the patient has deteriorated, there's a particular fibrillation or cardiovascular collapse and patient is unresponsive uh, to the treatment, quick uh, shock and treatment, then it should be converted to the cardiopulmonary bypass. These are the different positions. Uh, while grafting, you can see the stabilizers have been placed and the grafting is being performed. Uh, the different hemodynamic changes which can happen during the off pump CABG, it can be because of myocardial ischemia itself or because of the stabilization of the required a different position. We are twisting the heart or we are elevating the heart. So all these leads to a compression of the RV free wall or there is a verticalization of the heart. So the uh, atria has to work more to pump the blood to the ventricle or there is a distortion of the mitral or tricuspid wall. All these leads to um, hemodynamic variation. So how do we manage? We uh, give the treatment position, we use a fluid if needed, our vasopressors are anotropic drug, and if not responding, we can always evaluate with the help of transesophageal cardiography or pulmonary artifacts or other modalities. So how do we maintain the hemodynamics? A team approach is must, um, especially in the off-pump CABG, a good, good communication between the surgeon and the anesthesiologist. We try to maintain the normothermia, and we always bring the pressure up while the surgeon is manipulating the heart. 
and a sequence of grafting is important at which vessel has to be grafted first and uh, uh, ischemic conditioning by lifting the heart releasing it and lifting again is helpful when the patient is hemodynamically unstable there are certain situation where we need to convert uh, to the cardiopulmonary bypass when the patient is having a cardiac index less than 1.5 for a prolonged time or there is a decrease in the mid arterial pressure and is not improving in spite of the adequate vasopressors or there is a persistent st elevation for more than 2 millivolt or there is a sustained malignant arrhythmia so immediately we should switch over to the cardiopulmonary bypass perioperative mi which can be assessed with the help of ecg or the regional valve washup laboratory of transesophageal echocardiogram how we can avoid we should maintain a blood pressure of above mean arterial pressure of 70 uh, we should reduce the marker in the oxygen consumption and we should avoid any significant bradycardia so a pacing is important to maintain the cardiac output um, and whenever the ischemia um, is happening during the distal anosmosis coronary shunt can be used to avoid the um, ischemia during the grafting period this patient can be planned for early extubation uh, if they are hemodynamically stable and they have the uh, normothermia. So, low risk patient can be easily extubated even on table, um, but it should be planned and discussed when, uh, before the surgery itself. So, the patient has been primed, you are ready, and surgeons is also aware that you are planning to extubate this patient. But a careful control of the blood pressure is important because if the blood pressure will shoot up, there is always a risk of bleeding after the extubation. So whenever we are doing planning for early extubation, we should look for the body temperature, we should look at the arterial pH, patient should be hemodynamically stable with a cardiac index more than 2, with a um, respiratory rate should be 10 to 12, um, above 12 and less than 25, patient is having adequate PO2, and x-ray should not have any major abnormality. Patient should have adequate urine output. Patient should be awake, cooperative, and moving all extremities. And there should not be uh, significant drainage to the mediastinal or chest tubes. So, what should, how we should manage this? A preoperative education. An aesthetic technique should be uh, tailored for the early extubation with the use of the short-acting drugs. Um, this should be the nurse and respiratory therapist driven protocol early extubation for a stable patient. Patient should be early mobilized so that we can remove the catheters, tubes, and the other devices quickly. Early ICU discharge and hospital discharge uh, if the patient is meeting with the criteria. Post operative uh, pain relief, it is very, very important with the use of various IV opioids, not NSAIDs, patient controlled energy with the intercostal nerve block thoracic epidural anesthesia, intrathecal opioids are the, with the help of intrapleural local anesthesia. What is important that we use the multimodal analgesia to achieve the adequate pain relief so that we can minimize the side effect of the Easter. So to conclude, a thorough clinical evaluation, including the primary disease, cardiac status of the patient and comorbid condition should be done for the risk stratification and the risk should be explained to the patient and their relatives. A close communication amongst the team um, um, for the plan of surgery, whether we are doing off pump or on pump, but what should be the sequence of grafting? What are the expected complications in the perioperative? Adequate pre medication so that patient is not anxious on the table, and the, all the cardiac medication should be given except uh, ACE inhibitors. The plan of anesthetic management should be tailored as per the cardiac function as well as. What our is our plan for the post-operative recovery? Always remember the anticoagulation of the use of heparin. An appropriate planning and communication is key to success, especially in cases of off pump, because there's a lot of hemodynamic variation while they are twisting uh, the heart or lifting the heart. A judicious use of anesthetic induction agent and technique to optimize the hemodynamics and cardiac function throughout the induction of anesthesia and fast track. A management should be discussed in the preoperative period and a good pain relief with the use of multipodal analgesia so that we can achieve a fast track recovery. Thank you very much. I'll be happy if you have any question to ask. Sir, as of now, there are no questions in the chat box. 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Vivek Gupta and Dr. Virmani for such an excellent deliberations on two very important topics which are of practical importance pertaining to congenital heart disease as well as CABG. And I must compliment both the speakers for an excellent deliberation on these topics. And uh, just one question. Uh, is there any first questions in the chat box? We'll pick up that first. No, sir. There, as, as of now, there are no questions in the chat box. I think the, both the speakers are so superb that they made the things very, very clear and lucid to all. Um, Dr. Vimani, just uh, see, the, for the postgraduates, uh, the most common uh, anomalies we face nowadays is uh, VSD or uh, pathology of fellate coming for brain abscess and uh, PDA and ASD if they come for emergency surgery. So what will you advise your postgraduates how to go ahead about that? I hope Dr. Virmani is here. So ma'am is not there. She has, uh, she had some uh, OT thing lecture going okay. on, so she has left. Okay, so uh, over to Dr. Vivek, an excellent talk on uh, off time and on pump uh, CABG. Just uh, take home, you have very literally told about the take home points for the postgraduates. We all understand that nowadays majority of the surgeries are done off pump and fast tracking is the key uh, to it. Any particular inputs about uh, highlighting the role of regional anesthesia in such surgeries? Uh, yes, sir. Not really. Uh, yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, nice question that uh, role of regional analgesia. It is important, sir, for the early recovery of these patients. And we do put, uh, if not contraindicated, we do routinely put uh, thoracic epidural in these patients. And that gives an excellent... Uh, recovery in the post-operative period and even the interoperative period, we are able to reduce the, uh, the drug, the anesthetic drug, doses of the anesthetic drugs. So we can expect a faster recovery in these patients. But one should be very thorough for uh, uh, during assessment that there is no contraindication. Patient cooperation is must. One thing we should remember, we should not try a multiple attempts for thoracic epidural. If it is, you are not able to put on first or second attempt, it's better to leave because you are going to hepatize your patient. So there is no very less risk of uh, uh, hematoma, but there is always a risk of hematoma because you are going to have a uh, 10 years back, we used to put one day prior, but now uh, we have learned more and we are putting on the day of surgery itself. Uh, for a but clinically, suppose the bloody tear occurs and we are doing it on the day then of we surgery. Have to, then we have to, this is why I'm saying we should not, uh, we should always make sure that we are not doing a multiple attempts. Yes, sir. And if it is, if it is a bloody tap, then? Then, yeah, the it has to be deferred. Yeah, it has to be postponed for yes. at least 24 hours. Yeah, so that's a beautiful role of regional analgesia, but still we have to be cautious. Thank you, Dr. Vivek, for such a uh, nice... Sir, I think some question has come up in the panel. Yes, yeah. sir. There are questions in the chat box. Uh, so, can you help me in reading those? Yes, sir. So, where heparin is uh, administered in the, and in the what dose? When, administer, when heparin is administered and at what dose? Great. Good question. Uh, if we talk about the CABGs, if it is the off-form CABG, our target is to keep the ACT around 300. So, we give a load initial dose of 2 milligram. It all depends on the what kind of a conduit surgeon is taking. If the surgeon is taking out both internal memory artery, then they give a half dose at the when they are cutting the internal memory artery, the distal end of the internal memory artery, half dose, and second half dose when they have completed the bilateral uh, internal memory artery. Right? If surgeon is taking only a single conduit of internal memory artery, so when they are cutting the internal memory artery, at that time only we give the full dose that's around 2 mg per kg of body weight and with the targeting the ECT of around 300. But if it is the on pump surgery, the target remains uh, above 400 for all patients as we do for any other uh, on-pump surgeries. So we give a dose of around 3 milligram uh, per kilogram of body weight and we look at the ACT and uh, if it is less than 400, then we always, before going on bypass, we give another dose and then we check the ACT. 
they were allowed to go on bypass before the ACT has reached to a fourth level. Sir, any extra consideration in robotic CABG? Uh, personally, I do not have much experience of robotic CABGs, but related with the heparin, dose remains the same that as we do for the off-pump CABG. Thank you, sir. There are no other questions as of now. Thank you, Dr. Thank Vivek. You, Dr. Thank, you, Thank you, Dr. Vivek and Dr. Vimani. And it was a pleasure interacting with all of you at APIC 23. Thank you, the organizers. Uh, back over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Naveen, sir, for, for being with us. Now we will have the MCQ uh, quiz one. Which, are, which is a set of two MCQs and you have to give the answer. The first MCQ is the main advantage of off-pump CABG includes all except less risk of SIRS, grafting is easier, fast track extubation and less risk of renal dysfunction. The second question. The second question is, of the following, which line would be considered a central line? An 18 gauge in a patient's external jugular vein, a pick line in patient's right upper arm, a midline IV in the patient's left upper arm, and a 16 gauge in the patient's left brachial vein. Thank you, everyone. Now we'll have a short tea break and then proceed within five minutes.
welcome back after a quick tea break let's move on to the next session which is a long case presentation of a 48 year old female patient with hypertension posted for modified radical mastectomy and for this case discussion i would like to invite the external examiner dr bikash ranjan roy ray sir is additional professor at the department of anesthesiology pain medicine and critical care at all india institute of medical sciences new delhi Sir's area of special interest are critical care, regional anesthesia, ultrasound in critical care and anesthesia, and outcome-based clinical approach. Sir has several publications to his credit. We welcome you, sir, to FP3. As a moderator for the session, I would like to invite Dr. P. Priya. Ma'am is Associate Professor at ABVIMS and Dr. RML Hospital, and her area of keen interest are ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia and palliative care. Welcome, ma'am. The case will be presented by a postgraduate student, Dr. Akash Jadon from ABVIMS and RML Hospital. He is a final year postgraduate student. Over to you, sir, for the proceedings of this session. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for your kind uh, uh, introduction. So am I audible? Yes, sir, you're audible. So um, uh, good morning, Dr. Supriya and Dr. Akash. Could we start the presentation? Yes. Good morning. I will be presenting uh, the case of patient uh, with hyper, hypertension for modified radical mastectomy. Uh, uh, my patient, uh, Mrs. Vimla, she is a 48 year old female and uh, house uh, homemaker by uh, she is a homemaker and resident of West Patel, Nagar, New Delhi. And she's educated up to 12th standard and uh, she belongs to upper middle class socioeconomic status. Uh, she presented with a complaint of uh, lump in her right breast since six months. Uh, she was apparently normal six months back, then felt a mass in the right upper part of the breast and uh, progressively increasing size. Initially, it was around the size of peanut and sudden, uh, suddenly it started to increase in the, in the size of present, uh, to the present size. And uh, the uh, swelling is not associated with pain or discharge and there's no history of fever trauma to the breast and uh, no history of nipple retraction and nipple discharge, no history of loss of weight and loss of appetite. There's no history of similar complaint in the other breast and uh, no history of swelling in the axillary region and uh, no history of backache, shortness of breath, blood in sputum, pain, yellowish, discoloration of skin, sclera, sclera and headache or seizure. There's no history of radiotherapy or chemotherapy in the past and the patient, uh, when the patient went to general surgery department with these complaints one month back and uh, she was diagnosed with carcinoma breast after the workup and was uh, advised to uh, for surgical excision of the same. Uh, uh, my patient is a known case of hypertension since four years, uh, four years and the patient has a history of a mild to moderate headache and a family history of hypertension. Uh, when she went to clinic, she was diagnosed as hypertensive uh, on evaluation and started on medication for the same. Uh, the symptom relieved over a period of time and uh, 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 she was compliant to the treatment and on regular follow-up with the physician. Uh, this was not associated with any kind of chest pain, gabbard palpitation and uh, difficulty in breathing. Uh, there is no history of weakness, paralysis of extremity, and a sudden episode of loss of consciousness and uh, visual vision abnormality, decreased urine output, peripheral edema or puffiness in the face. Uh, uh, there is no history of a severe headache, bleeding from nose, undue anxiety and redness, dizziness. There is no history of uh, any psychiatric illness. There is no history of weight gain or loss and uh, uh, no history of uh, steroid intake or any other drug abuse and anticipation. Uh, she has no history of snoring and no history of any allergy uh, or a seizure disorder in the past and she is uh, fully vaccinated uh, for uh, COVID and uh, she has no history of uh, uh, any infection in the past. And uh, there is no history of previous hospital admission or any other chronic medical illness 
like diabetes, asthma, tuberculosis, and thyroid disease, and no history of allergy or surgical intervention in the past. Uh, family history, she is uh, married for 28 years with two children and her father has a history of hypertension and uh, there is no history of breast cancer in the family members, no history of chronic medical illness like diabetes, asthma and tuberculosis or thyroid disorder uh, in the family. Uh, personal history, she fo follows mixed diet and uh, she has a normal sleep and wake cycle and a normal blood power habit. She is a non-alcoholic and non-smoker. And she is married for 28 years, non consecutive marriage, and uh, I have two children. Uh, both are full term and vaginal delivery and breastfed uh, breast adequately. And uh, uh, Menage at uh, 12 years and attained menopause at 45 uh, years. No history of OCP and uh, any hormone replacement therapy. There is a uh, in treatment history. She is uh, on hypertension medications in four years, four years, and uh, she is on uh, tablet Telma H40 by 12.5 mg or OD dose, and uh, she is compliant to treatment. And uh, drug and doses were confirmed by seeing the prescription. On examination, uh, patient, oh, one second, yes. uh, Doctor Rakas. Uh, so yes. till now, can you summarize the case? Uh, so, uh, my patient is a forty-eight-year-old female. Uh, she is a known hypertensive, and uh, she presented to the uh, pre. Uh, she uh, pre. Uh, she presented with a complaint of a breast lump in right breast, uh, which was uh, uh, since uh, six months. Uh, and now posted for yeah. yes so yes. this question is a hypertensive with a breast lump posted for a breast surgery yes. that is the case right? yes. so uh, so in between uh, there are few history you have taken uh, regarding uh, history of intake of oc pills and other how does that affect so the, because of that, sir, uh, there is an increased exposure to the estrogen. That is a, sir, a causative factor for uh, sir, breast cancer. Uh, okay. Uh, anything with cardiovascular disease? Sir? OCPs and cardiovascular diseases are associated? Anything? Sir, there is an increased uh, phenomena of uh, thromboembolism uh, uh, because of uh, use of estrogen and uh, also, sir, it increases the chances of a hypertension, uh, causes hypertension in patients. Also, uh, there is some history you have taken that no history of any chemotherapy or radiotherapy for uh, this, uh, this person has not received any chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So what is the anesthetic concern of the patient if you received some chemotherapy or radiotherapy? Sir, patient receiving chemotherapy, is, uh, there, uh, there are uh, chemotherapeutic agent like uh, cyclophosphamide and uh, doxylovision, uh, uh, usually used in uh, uh, adjuvant, uh, new adjuvant therapy for the breast can before breast cancer surgery to reduce the size of uh, the lump. And sir, it is associated with the cardiotoxicity and uh, that uh, uh, that causes the cardiomyopathy and uh, also causes sir, QT prolongation uh, that will uh, affect the supports of surgery and uh, intraoperatives. And what about uh, radiotherapy? What are the concerns with radiotherapy? So, uh, okay, we'll discuss in the end uh, what the concern with radiotherapy. You can continue your case. Yes, sir. Uh, on general physical examination, uh, the patient was examined uh, with the uh, patient was examined uh, after the in, uh, informed consent in presen presence of a female attendant. The patient was uh, conscious oriented to time, place, and person, sitting comfortably on bed. Uh, her height was 165 centimeter and weight 60 kg and BMI was 22 kilometer per meter square and uh, she was afibril on touch, uh, no pallor, ictus, cyanosis, clubbing or lymphadenopathy seen. The JEP was normal and the venous axis was easy. Uh, the pulse rate was 80 beats per minute. 
in right radial artery which was regular in rhythm and good in volume normal character no radio radial or no radio femoral uh, delay and all peripheral pulses was well and uh, bp was 128 by 84 mm of hg measured in right upper arm in supine position and uh, uh, respiratory rate was 15 per minute normal thoraco abdominal type and uh, sp2 was 99% on room air in airway examination uh, the feces were normal uh, nose bilateral nasal was equal and no uh, uh, deviated nasal septum or growth and the uh, mouth opening uh, was more than 3 finger intercisal gap is 5 cm uh, with good oral hygiene no loose uh, artificial buck teeth and uh, body file malampatti uh, class was one and the neck sternomental thyromental hyoventral distance were within normal limit and the their the full range of motion movement of the neck on local examination uh, inspection done in sitting position the level of nipple right nipple appear little lower uh, when compared to the left and the uh, on examination of right breast a mass is seen in upper outer quadrant of the right breast and the skin over the swelling looks normal no prominent vein redness edema and uh, no dimpling or puckering no nipple traction or discharge seen the left breast look normal and bilateral axilla look normal on palpation right breast uh, there is no rise in temperature and ill defined lump of size 6 to 5 cm in upper outer quadrant and the lump was hard irregular in margin non tender mobile not fixed to skin and free from nipple areolar complex and uh, pectoris muscle and uh, chest wall and the nipple areolar complex was normal left breast was normal and bilateral axilla was normal on systemic examination uh, cardiovascular system inspection the shape of chest was normal no visible precordial bulge seen and no scar sinus dilated veins were seen no visible pulsation or raise in jiggle when is pressure apical impulse was seen in fifth intercostal space and 1 cm medial to mid clavicular line no abnormality in spine or rib cage noted on palpation inspectory finding were confirmed and apex speed confirmed to be in fifth intercostal space 1 cm medial to clavicular line no heave or thrill were palpable on on percussion the right border of the heart correspond to the right sternal border and the left border of heart correspond to apex peak and auscultation s1 s2 was heard and no murmur and advent tissues or added heart sound was audible on the examination of respiratory system on inspection trachea seems to be in midline and the respiratory rate was 15 per minute thoraco abdominal type and uh, bilateral chest movement equal and symmetrical no visible scar sign sinus swelling ulcer over chest wall and back or other and no uh, usage of accessory muscles of respiration in the pal on palpation temperature was normal no tenderness bilateral equal movement of chest and the chest expansion uh, on full inspiration is 4 cm and diameter ap is 30 cm and transverse is 43 cm and the vocal framework is normal on both side on percussion resonant in all area in sitting position and auscultation bilateral vesicular breath sound in all area no added sound or vocal resonance was normal and uh, abdomen examination of abdomen inspection uh, the uh, abdomen is scaphoid in shape all quadrant moving uh, equal on respiration umbilical central in position in normal shape no visible scar and sinus or pulsation no visible lump and uh, anal sides was free palpation inspectory finding was confirmed and all nine quadrant palpated no superficial tenderness no organomegaly and uh, on percussion tympanic note on percussion no shifting dullness or no bladder dullness and auscultation bowel sounds were present once in his examination uh, the patient was conscious oriented and cooperative and high with high mental function uh, normal and uh, no neck rigidity the cranial nerve examination was normal and the uh, motor system the nutrition was adequate tone was normal and the grade 5 uh, power in all four all four limbs and uh, there is no involuntary movement seen and sensory function superficial sensation to uh, pain touch and temperature was normal and the uh, deep vibration joint senses and position sense were present and uh, reflex superficial reflex was normal deep reflex and visceral reflex were not all normal and cerebral test was normal this uh, 
sir uh, my patient is 50 year old female known hypertensive on regular treatment since 4 year and uh, presented with a lump in right breast uh, Uh, okay, uh, so Dr. Akas, uh, this patient is uh, posted for a modified radical mastectomy. So, what are the uh, spreading uh, anesthetic concerns in this patient for you? Sir, uh, for the patient, she is a known hypertensive uh, and uh, she is on regular me medication. And, sir, uh, for uh, such patients, sir, uh, because uh, she is on a uh, uh, ACE inhibitor and, uh, sir, hydrochlorothiazide, so because uh, uh, Hydrochlorothiazide is a diuretic antihypertensive. Uh, there can be sir, concerns like. Uh, uh, okay, uh, we'll discuss those things. But the main concern, sir, patient is uh, non hypertensive, controlled, and other concern is, is an antihypertensive drugs. Okay, concerns related to the drugs. So, how do you define hypertension? The hypertension is uh, defined as the in, uh, increased uh, systolic uh, systolic uh, blood uh, blood pressure uh, one uh, one for more than one forty mm of Hg, and or or diastolic uh, blood pressure more than uh, or uh, more than ninety mm of Hg on uh, taken on uh, different time time points uh, or and reason. Okay, so is there any subtypes of hypertension? After the current sir, guidelines, so hypertension can be sir primary or secondary. Uh, the primary hypertension is also called sir essential hypertension. Uh, that is uh, most prevalent and seen in ninety percent of the hypertensive patients. And in, in the secondary uh, hypertension, sir, it is associated with the pathology, uh, with uh, uh, with cardiovascular or uh, neuro neuronal or hormonal uh, pathologies. So, uh, can you uh, say to what is the probable or probable? Sir? You are not audible, sir. Uh, am I audible now? Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Akas? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, so, sir, I can't hear you right now, sir. Uh, so, I can hear you, but I don't know how the Dr. Sapriya, am I audible? Yes, sir. Now you are audible, sir. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Akas. Yes. So, what is the uh, pathophysiology for primary hypertension? Sir, in primary uh, hypertension, uh, sir, uh, because of uh, sir, there, there is a uh, there is a sir, deranged. Uh, uh, Sir, uh, because uh, there is an increased uh, tone of a uh, vascular tree, and uh, there will be sir uh, uh, the ratio of uh, uh, the ratio of uh, uh, the uh, vessel wall to the internal diameter is more, and uh, the uh, systemic vascular resistance is increased. Sir. So the all these things occurs because of the there is a uh, and deviation there is normal renin. Aldosterone yes. have uh, RAS, uh, path, path. RAS. Yes. Okay. So, uh, oh, okay. can you uh, classify the uh, systemic blood pressure, pressure like what are the current guidelines for this uh, stage one, stage two, and those things? Sir, in, uh, sir, uh, the uh, sir, less than uh, one uh, one twenty mm of Hg systolic and uh, less than eighty mm of Hg. Uh, uh, diastolic pressure is uh, taken as uh, normal, and uh, sir, in the pre hypertension pre hypertensive is uh, one twenty to one thirty nine uh, systolic uh, blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure uh, eighty to eighty nine mfg is taken as a uh, pre hypertensive, and uh, sir, is, uh, in stage one pre hypertension uh, is stage one hypertension, uh, sir, it is uh, the systolic blood pressure will be uh, one forty to one fifty nine. And the diastolic uh, will be uh, 80 to 
uh, uh, so 90 to uh, uh, 90 to 100 mg of fg and in stage 2 it is uh, sir 16 uh, more than 160 mg of fg and uh, the diastolic will be uh, more than 100 mg of fg sir. and what is a refractory and what is a resistant hypertension sir what is re- resistant hypertension and what is refractory hypertension sir in resistant hypertension sir uh, that is a uh, not uh, uh, that, uh, that cannot be sir, uh, sir uh, that is not uh, responsive to uh, the treatment sir and in refractory hypertension sir uh, it will, sir after the treatment it will go away but uh, it uh, it uh, so as soon as treatment is uh, stop sir it will uh, the uh, the blood pressure will increase sir. is there is there anything with the- the number of anti hypertensive taking the person is taking so uh, the resistance is basically a resistant hypertension is a resistant but the hypertension episodes are not controlled even after taking three anti hypertensive drugs one of them should be diabetes yes. so similarly the refractory is a one where more than five anti hypertensive drugs required are there okay so and what is uh, uh, So, oh, what is the significance of it? Systolic hypertension or diastolic hypertension? What does it signify? Uh, sir, uh, in the systolic hypertension, is uh, sir in, during the sir uh, uh, during the con- uh, contraction phase of the uh, sir heart. Uh, this this is due to the uh, uh, due to the after uh, after uh, due to the after uh, due to the sir preload of heart and. Uh, and uh, the diastolic will be uh, uh, because of the uh, systemic vascular resistance uh, during the diastolic phase so pathophysiologically the diastolic blood pressure represents a microvascular level pathology whereas yes. the systolic says it is a macrovascular level pathology and is there any special uh, significance of both this if the person is systolic hypertension what can you predict for anesthesia and if that is diastolic hypertension can you what, what is the prediction for the anesthesia and electrical complication sir uh, because of hypertension sir there can be uh, end or end organ damage and uh, sir in cardiovascular there can be sir left ventricular hypertrophy and uh, because of that uh, uh, there is a more uh, Uh, work during the diastolic phase, uh, the atrium uh, atrium will be doing the more work to fill the left ventricle, and uh, during sir tachycardia, there will be uh, more uh, oxygen demand and uh, chances of uh, ischemia in the uh, left ventricle uh, ischemia uh, b- because of left ventricular hypertrophy. And uh, in sir, uh, sir, in sir. So if you, uh, which one, which one is much more dangerous for uh, perioperative morbidities, a systolic or a diastolic hypertension? Both are both are uh, is different, but which one is much more concern for you? Sir, uh, diastolic, sir. So it has been found that the person with diastolic hypertension has the increased risk of morbidity, especially cardiovascular accidents in the perioperative years. Okay. As 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 you rightly told, the it's much more a um, uh, organ damage, end organ damage, or such type of end organ damage. So, what are the end organ damage with a uh, hypertension that occurs? What are the organs that are affected mostly, and how sir, can you evaluate um, it? Sir, mostly, sir, uh, cerebral and uh, sir, uh, sir, sir, sir uh, because of that there can be sir uh, ischemic events and. Uh, and there can be retinopathy or there can be sir renal damage uh, uh, and because of sir raised hypertension so is the cardiovascular cns and the renal are the mostly important affected yes. okay so uh, uh, in this patients so oh, if you start anti hypertensive what is your target what is the target of uh, hyper, uh achievement you said this patient is controlled on medications so when do you say that your target is achieved and the patient blood pressure is controlled sir the the ta- the target blood pressure will be sir less than uh, 140 systolic and uh, less than 90 so diastolic uh, blood pressure sir. is there some different target pressure for diabetic and ckd patients sir is the is the blood pressure target different for diabetic and uh, chronic renal disease patients in uh, chronic renal uh, disease patients uh, the uh, 
the uh, it can be said uh, systolic will be it's a uh, less than 160 and uh, diastolic will be it's a less than 100 sir no and what about diabetics you target for a lower rather than higher one okay if it is 140 normal it is 130 by uh, 80 target that you go for so uh, this person, what are the uh, investigation you asked for before the radical modifier radical mastectomy? Uh, before, before this, sir, uh, I will uh, advise uh, for uh, uh, complete uh, blood cell count hemogram uh, to see uh, uh, to see the sir hemoglobin and the sir various cell count uh, uh, w, uh, WBC and platelet count and sir uh, I'll advise for a liver function test with uh, liver enzyme and uh, renal function test uh, and serum with serum electrolytes and uh, uh, ECG to see sir, uh, for any left ventricular hypertrophy or strain patterns and uh, chest x-ray uh, uh, chest x-ray for sir, any uh, lung pathology or uh, uh, see the sir, cardiothoracic ratios uh, if, the, if there is a cardiomegaly in this patient. Would you ask for any uh... Uh, echocardiography this question. Uh, if sir, uh, ECG, if uh, there is sir, any ECG finding and uh, any any kind of sir uh, end organ damage is seen, sir, then I will ask for echocardiography in this patient, sir. Since uh, uh, and sir, uh, in patient for uh, modified medical restrictomy that are undergone the sir, chemotherapy, uh, the echocardiography uh, will be essential. Uh, to see the ejection fraction in, of any, and wall uh, movement. All yes, type of chemotherapy or any specific groups of drugs that the patient has received? Sir, uh, mostly, sir, uh, cyclophosphamide and uh, doxorubicin that are cardiotoxic, uh, sir, uh, echocardiography is essential. So, uh, and uh, these patients, uh, why do you specifically ask for the electrolyte in this patient? Sir, because the, uh, my patient is on a hydrochlorothiazide that is diuretic, sir, there can be electrolyte uh, abnormality in these patients, sir. Uh, most is hypokalemia. Any other, any other, uh, what, what is the, the patient is on diuretics, what are the electrolyte abnormality that is you suspect? Sir, uh, Along with sir, hypokalemia, what can occur? Hyponatremia and sir, hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia. Yes, hypomagnesemia is epidural. Okay. Uh, and anything else? Calcium, sir. What will happen to calcium? Then maybe hypercalcemia, like we just. So that's okay. Mostly we go for a hypercalemia and hypermagnesemia. Okay. So, uh, so this person is receiving uh, a, a diuretic and a AC inhibitor. AC inhibitor. So, what are the concerns with AC inhibitors used? Sir, uh, sir, what are the uh, concerns? What are the perioperative concerns with you? The person is using AC inhibitors. Uh, sir, because of uh, AC inhibitors, sir, the, there can be uh, perioperative hy hypotension. Uh, perioperative hypotension because of AC inhibitor, if there is a major fluid shift or uh, sir, uh, pro uh, prolonged fasting, is there? No, what is it? You are continuing the AC inhibitors or you are stopping the AC what will happen sir, if you uh, stop the AC inhibitors and what will happen if you continue with the AC inhibitors and what are the current recommendations? Uh, mostly, sir, in literature, it is uh, given that, sir, we can uh, uh, we can continue the AC inhibitor in the surgery in which uh, uh, no, major, fluid, major fluid shift or uh, hemodynamic variability is not uh, predicted. So what are the concerns? If you continue, what happens? Uh, if you say it should be, uh, uh, it, uh, it should not be taken uh, 10, 10 hours prior to the surgery. And uh, sir, uh, it, it is associated with the sir, uh, hypotension, which is uh, uh, no, uh, not reactive to uh, 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 drugs. Uh, so hypotension after induction. So if you continue AC inhibitors, there is a chance that there is a hypertension which will be refractory to the normal standard medications after induction. Okay. So what if you what is in those cases? Is there any specific group of drug which are indicated? Sir, uh, 
if the person has a hypotension after induction after the inhibitors uh, after induction uh, sir uh, uh, we can use phenylephrine uh, phenylephrine in uh, 25 to 50 mics bolus sir and uh, yes, sir uh, that is uh, okay so if you stop it what will happen if you stop the inhibitors what will happen sir if we stop AC inhibitors sir, there there can be sir uh, raised sir interop uh, raised interop sir blood pressure sir. so there will be roller coaster light there will be much more fluctuation throughout the fluctuation and so volatility so what is what is the current recommendation should you continue or should you stop uh, sir, in, sir, I will uh, avoid the ACE inhibitor prior to the sir, uh, prior, prior to the prior to the surgery, uh, one day prior to the surgery, and uh, I will uh, 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 I will take my patient on sir uh, uh, calcium channel blocker uh, for uh, maintenance of uh, blood pressure, and I will ask for uh, uh, blood pressure charting of the patient. Okay, so if you the you, you want to stop the ST inhibitors, does it depends on which type of ST inhibitors uh, if the patient is taking? Is, is does it affect your uh, decision making if it is a shorter acting ST inhibitors or a longer acting ST inhibitors, or if the patient is taking multiple antihypertensives along with the ST inhibitors or only single uh, medication that is ST inhibitors? Does you that does your decision change? Uh, for uh, long acting ac inhibitors sir uh, and the, uh, and the we sir, for long acting ac inhibitor we can sir continue and uh, sir for uh, short acting sir we have to stop prior to the surgery is it not sir, the reverse one because long acting are much more prone to do or to produce the post induction hypertension no? So, what would normally, uh, if the patient is taking a multiple antihypertensive drugs, and the, and you can definitely stop the AC inhibitors because already the patient is on four or five drugs, and if the patient is taking only one antihypertensive drugs, you can consider continuing it. If it's not a major surgery, as you said, if there is no chance of major fluid shift and those things, you can definitely continue with that. Again, those drugs who can affect whether it's an inner pill or an after pill because they say one is a longer acting and one is shorter acting. That can also the shorter acting produces lesser lesser chance of post-operative hypertension, uh, post-induction hypertension. Okay. So, any other investigation you like in this question? Am I audible, Doctor? No, sir. No, sir. Okay. So, uh, you have done the investigations. And in this case, what will be the uh, pre-operative? Um, uh, uh, I'll ask. Pre yes. Sir, I will ask for, sir, uh, uh, consent, uh, return and form consent. And uh, ask the, uh, sir, NPO for uh, six hour for solid food. And... Uh, the uh, blood uh, blood demand to be sent and uh, sir bp charting and uh, uh, sir i will uh, ask to stop the uh, ace inhibitor and uh, continue sir hydrochlorothiazide and uh, uh, for the bp charting and uh, i will advise the pre medication uh, uh, tablet uh, ranitidine 150 mg uh, od and uh, uh, and uh, tablet alprazolam 0.25 mg uh, Night before, uh, night before the surgery and uh, two hours prior to the surgery. Okay. So, if the uh, patient, you, you go for the pre-RS3 checkup and the patient is having blood pressure of 230 over 110. So, will you continue with the surgery or you are planning to postpone the surgery? Sir, uh, sir I will uh, take... Uh, take the... Uh, Take the patient and uh, sir, I will take uh, another reading. Uh, see if the patient is uh, sir anxious, and uh, and uh, sir, if the um, uh, BP drops uh, drops to less than sir uh, one one eighty hundred, sir, I will uh, take the case. So your target most of the time for elective surgery, you take up any case that is less than uh, systolic less than hundred eighty and diastolic less than diastolic hundred. Okay. Anything else you check during these things? Does cuff size or how you are measuring the blood pressure affect? Uh, 
Yes, sir. Uh, for measurements, uh, the sphygmomanometer should be adequately uh, should be cali well calibrated, and uh, sir, uh, the size of a bladder should be eighty percent of the arm circumference, and uh, sir, the width should be uh, forty percent of the arm circumference. Sir. So, what will happen if it is smaller, and what will uh, if what will happen if you are using a larger curve? Uh, if it is sir, smaller, sir, it will. Uh, uh, the uh, the readings uh, the measurement will be raised and sir if it is uh, larger the measurement will be sir uh, yes. decreased do you have any guess how many percentage it will change with the not inadequate pressure if you are using a larger cup or a smaller cup what will be the approximate change in the blood pressure just any guess so if you're using a smaller cuff, it's normally the it will be to give a higher reading weight up to 20 to 30 milligram of MMOHG. Okay. So uh, with that, so uh, if the person is suppose the person is having a you've taken multiple readings and all the readings are more than 200 or around 200 and the astrolytic is more than 110. So what will you do? Uh -huh. Sir, if the if, sir, uh, I'll see if the sir, uh, sir um, because sir, this is uh, in this in this case have been modified radical mastectomy. Uh, sir, this is a semi semi emergency procedure, and sir, for that uh, I will sir uh, continue uh, with the case because sir because sir uh, the risk benefit ratio is sir uh, for the surgery to be done. Sir. And uh, so you are thinking because this is a uh it is a uh cancer surgery will continue but what is the what do you what do you define a hypertensive emergency and what is a hypertensive urgency so in sir hypertensive urgency sir there is a raised to blood pressure more than uh, uh systolic more than 180 and and diastolic more than 100 mfg and if it is associated with any end organ damage then sir it is a hypertensive emergency and urgency? Sir, urgency is sir, raised, uh, raised blood pressure without any end organ damage. And sir, if the end organ damage is associated, then it is a hypertensive emergency. So what do, what do you category, if this person have a BP of 230 by 110, is it urgency yes, or emergency? Sir, uh, uh, I'll see for the sir. Sir, any end organ damage associated, like sir, uh, there is a decrease here, uh, urine output or uh, on fundoscopy, there is a uh, uh, pebble edema, and sir, then it will so be. So, this person emergency. doesn't have anything, those things. The creat is not raised, and uh, those things are not there. So, uh, so this person is mostly a hypertensive urgency in that scenario. Yes, yes. yes. So, in a hypertensive urgency, how do you treat this? Uh, it is a hypertensive uh, emergency, sir. Uh, I will uh, give sir uh, uh, patient uh, uh, five uh, five to twenty mg of sir uh, uh, labetalol. And five to twenty so mg of sir. Even if I will give the monitoring. Yes, uh, so if this is a purely elective, suppose laparoscopic cholecystectomy, and with this BP, what you will do? Sir, if it is a uh, elective, uh, purely elective procedure, sir, then uh, I will uh, I will delay the surgery and uh, sir uh, advise the patient for the uh, adequate management of the blood pressure. And uh, sir, after that, uh, I will uh, tell the patient. What is what is the current uh, what is the time limit normally you give to the patient after which uh, which time the elective surgery should be done or controlled with a controlled blood pressure? Sir, uh, sir, around two around two weeks, sir. Uh, say electric surgery, you can go for four to six weeks uh, before reposting the surgery. And in the hypertension emergencies, that should be like you told if the patient is a hypertension emergency, that should be managed immediately with intravenous and hypertensive before shifting or uh, discharging the patient from for adequate management. You should, if it is an emergency, you should have to manage the patient immediately in a quiet room and then you decide how to proceed. Okay. So in this question, uh, you are, everything is okay. So you plan for this and you uh, plan to go ahead with the surgery okay so if in this case also if if there is a if you every time the bp recording is normal but you go to see the patient the patient is having a higher systolic blood pressure what does it uh, signify uh, 
sir sir it, uh, it is uh, maybe because of the sir white coat hypertension sir because of yes. anxiety yes. or allergies so most of the time that will only affect the systolic hypertension rather than a diastolic one okay so with that uh, so any any special uh, thing you find in case of a if the person is hypertensive on physical examination any signs of hypertension that you can find if the person is a long standing hypertensive sir different system they, mainly in the cardiovascular system sir there can be sir edema associated uh, sir ियर <laughs> Sir, if the patient uh, is on beta blocker uh, uh, for a long time, sir, it is it is beneficial. And uh, sir, if the patient uh, is uh, taken on beta blocker in the pre-operative period, sir, uh, uh, sir, it is uh, not uh, advised to start the patient uh, on beta blocker pre-operatively, sir. And uh, sir, beta blocker, sir, is a uh, uh, contraindicated for use in the patient with the reactive airway. and uh, it can also mask the signs of sir uh, hypertension and uh, uh, hypertension and uh, tachycardia related to the uh, um, blood loss intraoperatively and uh, do you recommend starting beta blocker so if you the patient is continuing on beta blocker you can do that and you don't start any beta blocker if the patient is non beta blocker and sir beta blocker has shown sir uh, uh, Some protective action uh, in the cases of the uh, ischemic heart disease. But the patient uh, it decreases the uh, heart rate and sir uh, uh, avoid the ischemic ischemic events. Sir. So uh, with that, so that this patient is uh, you plan for a what is your plan for to for to go ahead with this surgery in this patient? Uh, this sir, I sir, I'll take. Sir, I will take the uh, patient inside the OT, sir, and attach all the uh, ASM monitor. That's okay. Uh, so your plan? What is your plan? You say. General anesthesia, regional anesthesia. I'll uh, take this patient, sir, under general anesthesia. General anesthesia. With a tracheal intubation, or you go for tracheal? So I'll go for uh, tracheal intubation because, sir, in uh, such surgery there can be, sir, uh, uh, positioning. For the patient, uh, in, in that sir, uh, airway uh, has to be sir, maintained. So, uh, suppose in any case with the hypertensive patient, you can is there any benefit of using a supra uh, glottic airway device? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, there is a benefit of using supra glottic airway, sir. It uh, avoid it avoid the sir laryngoscopic response uh, during the intubation and uh, during the phase of immersion. Uh, 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 During the phase of sir extubation, sir, it also reduces the coughing due to the uh, coughing or uh, uh, reflex due to the endotracheal tube during the extubation phase. Okay, what are the monitoring you will use in this patient? Sir, in this patient, uh, I will I will use sir on standard ASA monitor, sir, uh, including sir uh, uh, ECG, uh, sir five lead ECG, and uh, uh, SpO2 uh, and uh, uh, non-invasive blood pressure and the temp uh, temperature, uh, sir, temp uh, temperature and uh, to maintain the sir uh, intra-op uh, to avoid intra-op hypothermia and uh, sir uh, urine output uh, should also be measured for that I will catheterize the patients. Okay, so normally uh, depends upon uh, 
Catheterizer is a small device you can avoid, but you can definitely you look after the urine output in this case. Okay, any major uh, surgeries. So with this monitoring, how will you induce this person? Uh, I will, uh, sir. I will induce the, this uh, sir. I will sir, uh, uh, secure a whiteboard cannula in the sir ipsilateral arm, avoiding the side of, of the surgery. And uh, sir, I will uh, preload the patient uh, prior to the uh, prior to the uh, induction. Uh, and sir, for uh, angiolysis, I will give a uh, sir in, uh, injection midazolam uh, one one mg. And uh, I'll, uh, sir, before that, I will pre-oxygenate the patient. Uh, and uh, uh, I will give sir uh, injection midas one mg for uh, angiolysis and uh, injection uh, fentanyl uh, uh, with two mics per kg body weight uh, for uh, uh, for reducing the intro, uh, for reducing the laryngoscopic response and uh, and uh, decreasing the dose of uh, induction agent intraoperatively and uh, uh, I will induce this patient with uh, injection etomidate. Uh, which is a cardio stable uh, induction agent, and uh, I'll prior to the intubation, uh, 90 second prior, I will give sir injection uh, xyl uh, xylo injection lignocaine 1.5 mg per kg uh, to avoid the uh, laryngoscopic response hemodynamic variability, and uh, I'll intubate the patient with uh, PVC and a tube, and uh, and so, uh, so, uh, so you have used the xylocaine uh, for to reduce the response to endocrine intubation and laryngoscopy and endocrine intubation. So, uh, what are the different way of uh, decreasing the uh, endocrine laryngoscopy and uh, endocrine intubation response? What are the different drugs or different things that you can do to decrease the response? Uh, decrease uh, and, uh, and laryngoscopy response. Sir, the laryngoscopy should be less than fifteen second. And the uh, uh, de uh, the plane of anesthesia should be deep, and uh, sir, opiates can be used like fentanyl can be used uh, for uh, one to three mics per kg body weight uh, yeah. in higher doses, or sir, uh, in, uh, beta blockers like asmolol uh, can be used uh, at a dose of 0.5 to 1.5 mg per kg 30 or three minutes prior to the uh, laryngoscopy, and sir. Other uh, and xylocaine also can be used, uh, uh, and xylocaine spray uh, can also be used, and sir, uh, other agents like uh, nitroglycerin and calcium channel blockers can also be used. So, if you are using opioid, what should be the dose of opioid to decrease the laryngoscopic response? Or to decrease, uh, uh, sir, it, it should be sir uh, in, uh, three to five mics per daily volume. Yes. So normally, what you are using is not going to uh, not going to be adequate dose. If you are use, using it to decrease laryngoscopy response, you have to use more than uh, three mics at least, three to five mics or even more. Okay. And do you use etomidate standardly for all these patients? Yes, sir. Uh, sir we, we can also use uh, uh, thiopentone and uh, sir propofol in titrated doses. Yes. So normally, you don't use etomidate in this patient if the patient is not a CADN. Other yes. So you can go ahead with the normal standard induction agents like thiopentone and propofenone. But as you correctly said, those would be titrated at small boluses rather than giving a uh, instant bolus. Okay. So with that, you intubate the uh, thing. So for maintenance, you have any preference? Any any preference of uh, induction agents? Uh, for uh, maintenance, uh, maintenance, I will use uh, inhalational agents, sevoflurane uh, and. Uh, uh, CO4 and, and nitrous oxide. Uh, so, uh, so I, I would uh, avoid the desflurane because the uh, rapid change in the concentration of uh, desflurane is associated with the tachycardia and uh, raised blood pressure intraoperatively. So, any other drugs you will avoid during the intraoperative period or induction or maintenance? Sir, in, uh, sir intraoperatively, I will avoid sir, NSAID for uh, uh, analgesia. Sir, that is associated with the increasing sir, blood uh, uh, blood pressure because of uh, sir, retention of sodium and uh, sodium sodium in the body. Sir. Any, any other drug? In induction sir, agent, any other specific? 
sir ketamine I, I, i would like yes. to avoid sir because it is treated with increasing uh, intracranial and uh, blood pressure and uh, all, all other pressure and regarding in states also it is not a contraindication to use if the renal function is normal you can definitely use it but these are the concern you should know if these are the concern okay so with that uh, you have oh, we are making any uh, what about fluid how do you uh, maintain fluid sir i i'll uh, sir i'll give the fluid according to the sir uh, the sir patient was on mpo for since six hours and uh, sir uh, i'll calculate the maintenance fluid and uh, promptly uh, replace the uh, blood loss because in patient in such uh, in, in patient with uh, hypertension sir uh, this uh, these changes will not be evidently visible because of the uh, rigid intravascular uh, intravasculature uh, sir it will not be visible so i will promptly replace the uh, blood losses so if you what are the concern if you give lesser fluid what will happen and if you give higher fluid what will happen sir if uh, if i give sir uh, lesser fluid sir there can be sir a hypoten- uh, hypotension will be there sir and uh, so if, if the uh, adequate fluid is not replaced lesser fluid giving that intraoperative hypotension sir fluctuates will be much more and yes, similarly sir. if you are giving a higher fluid that the fluid sir, required us kya hoga sir there will be sir increased uh, preload on uh, heart and sir there can be yes. chances of ischemia also But, the chances of post operative hypertension will be high because yes. the vasodilatory effect during the intraoperative will be gone and the post operative the chance of post operative hypertension will be high okay so this patient after induction suppose the bp crash to oh, 60 by 30 what will do uh, bp is uh, during the intraoperative period the bp Uh, just after induction the bp crash what will you do sir uh, i will sir uh, first i will uh, so decrease the concentration of inhalational agent uh, not much so that the awareness will be there and uh, after that sir i will uh, uh, increase the sir iv fluid and uh, see for the fluid responsiveness and uh, if uh, it still continue to decrease sir uh, i will uh, give sir uh, iv phenylephrine uh, Um, that was 25 to 50 micrograms okay so you will mostly uh, decrease those things give fluid and, and, and what happened if during the surgery if the patient bp uh, goes to again to 20 by 110 intraoperative at a point how will you manage sir sir i'll uh, first of all sir i will uh, rule out rule out the factors like sir i will see for the, if the uh, bp cuff is uh, epic of is uh, adequately or sir uh, okay everything there, is sir. okay you have checked those things how will you manage sir i will see for the plane of anesthesia and uh, and pain or any kind of surgical uh, uh, stimulation is there sir and uh, i will see for if the bladder is full so it can also cause sir uh, and how will you manage sir i will manage it by sir uh, uh, giving sir uh, 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 keeping the patient with sir infusion for sir nitroglycerin uh, nitroglycerin sir at uh, is uh, anything point. else before that anything else you can do or normally we do sir i'll uh, sir uh, i'll see, uh, give sir opiate for analgesia sir and uh, increase the plane of again is the vp is already 230 depend the plane of anesthesia so the if the analgesia is the point will take some time anything else you can do before that so depend the plane of anesthesia yes how will do that uh, by increasing the uh, concentration of uh, inhaled anesthetic yes so those are the thing must you do first and you definitely take care of the analgesia and those things okay so in this patient uh, so what is what is your plan uh, for analgesia in this patient sir uh, for this uh, i will sir use a multimodal anesthesia sir in which uh, i'll give sir uh, iv pcm and uh, opioids and uh, sir in po- uh, after sir uh, post op- operatively sir uh, i'll uh, plan for sir paravertebral block in the uh, fourth uh, fourth and fifth uh, sorry thoracic vertebrae sir ne uh, do we will put the block in the preoperative period or after the surgery uh, i will 
sir, I'll put the block after the after the surgery, sir. In the under no, the GA. Why don't you put the block before the surgery and take advantage of that during intraoperative period? Sir, inter, sir, I can also sir, do that. Sir. Do you? <laughs> So, uh, what are the other options for regional anesthesia for a breast surgery? Uh, sir, we can uh, also do it in sir. So we can also do sir awake uh, awake uh, awake by sir uh, giving sir thoracic epidural uh, to the patient and sir uh, and continuous care uh, putting the catheter in the paravertebral space. Uh, so by that uh, also can be sir, it can be done. And uh, post operatively, sir, uh, for uh, analgesia, we can give pack one, pack two block in serratus anterior block. So, can you say the, what is the nerve supply of the breast? Uh, uh, the breast is uh, supplied uh, uh, with a sir, second to sixth, uh, se second to sixth uh, 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 anterior and lateral intercostal uh, nerves. Sir. Which is uh, which originate from the sir, spinal cord at the level of uh, thoracic vertebrae, and it uh, it is in close uh, uh, close proximity with the serratus anterior and going uh, under the uh, uh, under the sir, rib also is same. So, uh, so you see, uh, you can do it uh, without general anesthesia also, and you can supplement the regional anesthesia with general anesthesia. Uh, for pain, the intraop and post management. So, is there any advantage advantage of using these regional blocks in the hypertensive patients? Sir, uh, sir, uh, using this uh, uh, regional block uh, in hypertensive patients, sir, can uh, uh, can help in decreasing the uh, uh, decreasing the pain intraoperatively and post operatively. Sir, that is a that can be a cause of. Uh, Increase uh, raised uh, blood pressure uh, during this uh, this uh, uh, these periods, and uh, sir, it also reduces the opioid dose uh, that is uh, post operatively related to the uh, respiratory depression and uh, decreased bowel movement and uh, post operative nausea vomit. Uh, okay, so uh, between uh, parapetal and epidural, which one do you prefer and why? Uh, in uh, sir in epidural sir uh, there will be sir uh, bilateral bilateral blockade will be there and uh, in sir paravertebral there, there there is a unilateral blockade uh, on the site we are giving and, uh, any any other benefit any other advantage of using a paravertebral uh, in paravertebral sir, uh, there is a decreased sympathetic blockade sir paravertebral also, you are moving away from the neuraxial no? a bit. So, the chances yes, of yes, chance. any Neural neuraxial point. complications will be less. Yes. That is the main advantage. No? So, if you are planning a parabotial block at which level you block, and if you are not using a catheter, what is the volume we should use? Sir, uh, we should uh, use around uh, uh, 15 ml of uh, uh, long acting, uh, 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 long acting, sir, local anesthetic like. Sir, and which, which level you will give? Sir, we'll give it at uh, level sir T for uh, T3 and T4, and sir for axillary blockage we'll give at the T2 T2. Okay, the so 15 ml is less. You have at least to go for 20 ml or more. Okay, so how how, how is pack one pack two is given, and how is serratus plane block is given? Sir, at what uh, level? Sir, for pack one pack, uh, pack two blocks, sir, it is uh, given at sir uh, below the. Uh, Clavicular, sir, it will be given at the third uh, third rib, and uh, in plane uh, by using sir ultrasound ultrasound guided uh, in plane, and uh, sir first there will be uh, uh, pectoralis major, and under this sir pectoralis minor, the pec one block will be given, uh, and, and uh, after that sir serratus anterior uh, will be there uh, for pec two block. At which level? The serratus uh, block uh, is given at which level? Serratus is given at sir. Uh, Four trips. Okay, so do you use ultrasound? Sir, we can use ultrasound, and uh, or we can sir ask uh, ask the uh, surgeon to sir. Uh, 
so using ultrasound is a better model given this uh, okay so uh, with this uh, uh, here in this person so what have you used in this person what will you are going to use in regional anesthesia or you are running systemic analysis systemic analysis here? sir i will yes, sir sir uh, after induction we can sir uh, we can give sir a paravertebral block to this patient uh, and uh, after that we'll uh, start the start the surgery sir it will give around uh, 10 to 12 hours of sir uh, analgesia to the patient sir okay so uh, so the uh, surgery uh, goes on smoothly so now uh, so uh, do you take any special uh, precautions during extubation in this patient extubation sir extubation yes, sir uh, during extubation sir uh, i will uh, Sir, uh, I'll sir uh, uh, extubate this patient in this deep, uh, deeper plane uh, to avoid the uh, to avoid the sir, uh, sympathetic response because of the uh, coughing uh, with the endotracheal tube in C two sir, and uh, that will okay. raise the tachycardia. How do you want to use a deeper plane extubation, or what is a deeper plane extubation? Why why can't you use other methods to decrease the extubation response? Sir, uh, uh, sir, other situation normally in this person. Sir, uh, sir, we'll prefer the uh, uh, extubation deeper plane, sir, to avoid sir the tachycardia and uh, raised blood pressure, sir, in this patient. So and you... sir, we can also use a uh, sir beta blocker like Esmolol uh, to uh, decrease to decrease the response and the interoperative uh, opioids are if, if given in the liberal doses. Uh, the, this can be avoided, sir. So, During what avoid is what is the discernment of using a deeper plane next to us, sir, rather than in the pharmacological treatment? Sir, in patient, sir, sir, in patient with difficult airway or obese patient, sir, uh, there, uh, there, there can be chances of, sir, uh, chances of being able to lose the airway. Post uh, extubation airway complications, airway related complications or problem will be high. Na? So, you go yes, for a better those the same thing that you used for prevent uh, response or laryngoscopy and intubation yes, can sir. be used at this point also. You have to be safe yes, with that. Yes, okay. So, as you said, you can use a beta blocker and uh, those things. Uh, yes, vasodilator like nitroglycerin. Uh, so, if the patient, uh, again in the post-operative period, the patient is in the recovery and the patient again uh, having a BP of around uh, uh, 210 by 110. So, what are the causes that may cause this post-operative hypertension? Sir, so, uh, during the post-operative period, sir, it can be because of, sir, uh, uh, because of, sir, uh, uh, inadequate analgesia or uh, sir uh, patient can be hypothermic or uh, uh, hypercarbia uh, will be there and anything else so because of sir, increased intraoperative fluid in, fluid is being given yes. sir and uh, so, sir uh, the reason may be analgesia lack, mainly most commonly it's analgesia problem or other causes like in, increased intraoperative no, no. fluids, full bladder or so, hypothermia and uh, hypoxia. Uh, hypothermia of those things. So how will you manage this? Sir, we'll, uh, sir, uh, uh, we'll uh, give the patient, sir, uh, uh, opioid analgesia or sir, uh, sir we'll uh, uh, eliminate these factors after that sir so you will treat whatever the, the cause is cause is yes, sir okay so if it is a full bladder you catheterize if there is pain you give analgesia even if all those things if the patient persistent having a hypertension uh, then what will you do even after that if the patient is a uh, hypertensive sir uh, I will Take the patient on, sir. Uh, uh, IV, uh, sir, uh, continue the uh, 
medication sir which was being given to the patient pre you can restart the medications restart uh, the antihypertensive but uh, so but if the if it it will take some time if it is a, again an emergency what will you give what are the uh, iv agent that will you sir, uh, i'll use the labetalone sir uh, any 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 preference uh, why you do choose the labetalone rather than a calcium channel blocker sir uh, sir labetalone sir uh, sir calcium channel blocker can also be used sir like uh, sir uh, sir newer uh, newer so what is uh, the disadvantage of using labetalone Sir, there can be sir, it is a, sir, uh, there is a beta blocker action that can cause uh, in reactive airway. There can be sir. Uh, okay. One thing is that in the air. Sir, bradycardia. Yes. Bradycardia. So beta blocker. Uh, if the person is already having a lesser heart rate or heart rate, if the person is previously beta blocker, it's a long acting agent. Labat is a long acting agent. So yes, repeated uses may be. Concern. So rather than calcium channel blockers, may be a better agent. Can you use nitroprusside in this case? Huh? Can you give, use uh, NTG or sodium nitroprusside for postoperative management? Yes, sir. We can uh, use uh, nitroprusside, but it is associated with a tachycardia, which uh, uh, we want to avoid, sir, so that. Uh, so what is the mechanism of action of nitroprusside and sodium nitroprusside? Uh, sir. Uh, Sir, they act by uh, uh, sir, uh, atrial and venodilatation by uh, uh, secreting the nitrous oxide, uh, vascular uh, uh, sir, uh, nitric oxide in the uh, vasculature, uh, and it will sir, dilate atrial and uh, venous sir, vasculature. So, sir, there is a uh, hypo. Uh, there will be hypotension and a reflex tachycardia will be there. Uh, and any other concern with the use of nitroprusides? If you are using nitroprusides at any, any, uh, any time, sir, uh, nitroprusides is uh, associated with sir, uh, cyanide toxicity. If it is used and uh, and uh, methylglobinemia, sir, will be there. Okay, so we use mostly NTG mm -hmm. and those things as a bridging therapy till other effects. Yes, sir. And sir, nitroprusides we also have to uh, cover it and protect it from sunlight. So do we have to do we have to cover it? Do you routinely cover those things? Sir, we have to uh, cover the syringe in which a nitroxide is being made, and sir, to avoid the exposure to sunlight. So it will, sir. Uh, sir, uh, the drug will, sir. Uh, so as you told, is there any sunlight in the OT? No, sir. Uh, light, uh, not sunlight. From the exposure from the lights, light source. So definitely those are the concerns and older concerns. Nowadays, mostly how much it is normally, it is affected around 8%. The degradation is around 8%. So you can increase the dose and diet it. You are, anyway, you, you are using a short duration of time. So what you are telling is correct, uh, but you should know what is uh, the effect. So uh, you have managed the uh, post-operative uh, period. And if you are using a catheter uh, or uh, for regional anesthesia, so how do you how much duration and uh, how will you manage that for post operative anesthesia? You are using a paraportable catheter, sir. Uh, with uh, epidural catheter, sir, uh, uh, after this, sir, bolus of uh, five, five ml of uh, long acting, uh, uh, long acting, uh, sir, local anesthetic, we can uh, start uh, start the patient on, sir, three, three to five ml of uh, uh, five ml per hour of infusion. Uh, of a point two five percent of okay. Okay, and preferably use a multimodal approach also. Yes. Okay. So we have uh, discussed most many aspect of the patient hypertensive patient who is posted for a uh, surgical uh, assistant of modified uh, radical mastectomy. Uh, some person was will be maybe missed. So I will now request uh, Doctor. Uh, 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 Priya to continue with a summary of the lecture of the recommendation that we have currently in literature for a managing a hypertensive patient for injury elective surgery. Uh, Dr. Sipriya, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Vikas. It was a very extensive and very elaborate uh, case discussion. Uh, I'm sure that students must have benefited from this uh, case discussion. Oh, okay. 
आपका वीडियो आ रहा है सो आई जस्ट क्विकली समराइज विद दिस केस पेरी ऑपरेटिव मैनेजमेंट ऑफ पेशेंट विद सिस्टेमिक हाइपर टेंशन so uh, how to define uh, systemic hypertension it is uh, of two types primary and secondary so primary systemic hypertension is defined as persistent that is average of two or more readings on two or more occasions the persistent systolic blood pressure more than 140 mmhg and or diastolic blood pressure more than 90 mmhg in adults in absence of any known precipitating causes primary systemic hypertension <laughs> so jnc 8 that is joint national committee 8 uh, they have categorized the hypertension uh, as previously assumed as previously believed 120 80 was optimal uh, bp but now the normal bp is classified as less than 120 and 80 and the uh, they have added this uh, category pre hypertension or elevated hypertension that is between 120 and 139 systolic and 80 to 89 diastolic bp then comes the stage 1 hypertension that is 140 to 159 systolic and 90 to 99 diastolic and beyond 160 mmhg systolic and uh, diastolic more than 100 mmhg is stage 2 hypertension european society of hypertension 2018 they categorize a uh, blood pressure as optimal that is less than 120 80 normal 120 to 129 systolic and 80 to 84 diastolic they have divided the pre hypertension into normal and high normal high normal comes under 130 to 139 systolic and 85 to 89 diastolic then they have graded 1 2 3 hypertension 1 is 140 to 159 systolic 90 to 99 diastolic and grade 2 is 160 to 179 systolic and 100 to 109 diastolic Grade 3 is more than 80 and 110 uh, mmhg. Isolated systolic hypertension in, is when systolic BP is more than 140, but diastolic remains less than 90 mmhg. So we can uh, classify uh, hypertension as essential, that is primary or with unknown etiology, and if there is some underlying secondary cause. because of renal endocrine neurogenic or any miscellaneous causes we call it secondary hypertension so renal causes are manifold like acute chronic glomerulonephritis chronic pyelonephritis polycystic kidney diabetic nephropathy in endocrine there are so many uh, conditions in which uh, bp can be raised like adrenal causes cushing's primary aldosteronism congenital adrenal hyperplasia pheochromocytoma neurogenic in increased intracranial tension and dysautonomia sleep apnea in miscellaneous coarctation of aorta pih polyarthritis nodosa so when we see the basis and on a lifetime basis it consists of a very delicate balance between nervous system hormonal system to maintain the blood pressure to normal or near normal basic mechanism is the feedback control mechanism that consists of pressure sensors and effector mechanism basically the two type of mechanism are there first is fast and neurally mediated baroreceptor mechanism and a slower or for long term control of blood pressure that is hormonally regulated ras that is renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism the sympathetic vasoconstrictor system is very important in uh, maintaining the bp regulation which is regulate uh, which is located in reticular system and lower uh, uh, third of pons and is uh, responsible for providing sympathetic and parasympathetic outflow to the effector organs so uh, when we see the baroreceptor when we see the baroreceptor mechanism it is initiated by the switch process that is uh, uh, situated in the receptors within aortic arch and carotid bodies that transmit the feedback signals uh, to central nervous system for minute to minute regulation this this is uh, very res this respond very rapidly so it um, the signals uh, signals are nucleus tractus solitarius in the medulla and they inhibit the vasoconstrictor activity center and stimulate the vagal center so basically these four uh, centers that is 
arterioles, post capillary venules, heart, and fourth one is kidney. These centers are mainly involved in maintaining minute to minute BP regulation. Bero reflex, humoral mechanism, renin angiotensin, aldosterone system, they regulate all these above four sites. Also, the local agent like nitric oxide, they also help in regulating the blood pressure. Blood pressure, that is basically cardiac output and uh, the systemic vascular resistance. So, they maintain this. In hypertensive patient, this bero reflex and renal blood volume control system, it is set at higher level. So, autoregulation also needs to be, uh, we have to be cautious when we are lowering the blood pressure because the uh, cerebral autoregulation, they all are set to, uh, they shift towards the right side and set at a higher level. And all antihypertensive acts via interfering with the normal mechanism. So this is the algorithm that shows the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which is, as I said, it is low hormonal mechanism for long-term blood pressure control. So it starts with uh, angiotensinogen. So renin cleaves this angiotensinogen, renin that is secreted by juxtaglomerular cells of kidney and angiotensinogen generated by liver. Renin cleaves the angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. This angiotensin 1, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme acts on this angiotensin 1 and converts it into angiotensin 2. Basically, this angiotensin 2 acts on various sites and it controls the blood pressure and it increases the blood pressure. So it uh, helps in norepinephrine release. It acts on pituitary gland and release vasopressin. It acts on adrenal cortex and release uh, aldosterone. That leads to uh, sodium water reabsorption through kidneys. It uh, acts on brain and increases the thirst. So basically, uh, on all sites, it helps to increase the blood pressure and various antihypertensive agent that act on the this RAS mechanism. Uh, they act at different that that is shown in the red color, like renin inhibitors. They act on renin and inhibit the conversion of angiotensinogen to angiotensin one. And AC inhibitors they act at this site and they inhibit the conversion of angiotensin one to two and hence help in reducing the blood pressure. So this hypertension, this has effect on each and every organ of the body. So all the organ, if hypertension is persistent, it affects all the organ and causes end organ damage. In cardiovascular system, it causes left ventricular hypertrophy, angina, myocardial infarction. It can cause arrhythmias, CCF, and aortic dissection. In brain, it can cause lead to stroke, transient ischemic attack, hypertensive encephalopathy. It can lead to uh, renal nephropathy and retinopathy and papillary edema also. So when patient is pre in pre-hypertensive phase, he is usually asymptomatic, and then uh, it affects each and every organ of the body. In initial phases in uh, kidney, it causes proteinuria, nephrosclerosis. Lead that can lead to chronic kidney disease and end stage renal disease. Heart, left ventricular hypertrophy, it can lead to coronary artery disease, angina, systolic diastolic dysfunction, various conduction abnormalities, and can lead to CCF, MI, and ventricular tachycardia and fibrillation. Similarly, in brain, it can lead to retinopathy, dementia, TIA, and stroke. So what should be our preoperative goals? It is different for elective procedures, and it is different for emergency procedure. So it is always a dilemma for anesthetist when to cancel the case, when to proceed with the case if a patient is hypertensive. So there are uh, different uh, uh, guidelines for elective and emergency. So uh, asymptomatic patient with mild to moderate, that is stage one and two, we should proceed without uh, increased risk. And evidence of end organ damage should be considered like in severe hypertension. In those cases, stage 3 hypertension, BP should be gradually lowered to 140-90 over 6 to 8 weeks. There is no cosmetic correction. There is nothing like that emergency correction of blood pressure and proceed with the case. But in case of emergency procedure, we have to take up the case. So maintain the systolic and diastolic BP in around 20% of baseline and mean arterial pressure uh, in around 25% of baseline. 
So 25% decrease in mean arterial pressure usually reaches the lower limit of autoregulation. So this is the recommended uh, blood pressure goals according to uh, JNC 8. We will discuss that in general goal should be less than 140-90 but uh, in older patient it is less than 150-90 but uh, with diabetes and chronic kidney disease again it is less than 140-90. So there is some difference in JNC-8 and recommendation of AHA. Uh, when there is initiation of treatment threshold and target, JNC-8 says in adults more than 60-year-old systolic and diastolic treatment initiation threshold and target of 150-90, while AHA-ACC recommends lower the systolic treatment initiation threshold to 140 uh, uh, for adults less than 80-year-old. Similarly, in uh, there is some uh, racial difference in non-black adults, including diabetes, first-line therapy, according to JNC-8, includes thiazide, calcium channel blocker, AC inhibitors, and angiotensin receptor blockers. While in black adults, including diabetes, first-line therapy include thiazide or calcium channel blocker. And with uh, chronic kidney disease, first-line therapy include AC inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blocker. While in AHA, they recommend multi-drug therapy for black adults. So angiotensin uh, antihypertensive agent mainly targets the this RAS, renin angiotensin system. These come under the first line treatment. AC inhibitors like captopril, lisinopril, ramipril and angiotensin receptor blockers like all the sartans, losartan, valsartan, candensartan and direct ren uh, renin antagonists like ls -carin. Then alpha blockers are there propranolol, these usually come under the later uh, uh, regime. This does not come under the first line treatment. So these are propranolol, metoprolol, etinolol, and uh, combined alpha beta blockers like labetalol, carvedilol, and alpha blockers like prazosine, terazosine, and fentolamine. Mm -hmm. Calcium channel blockers, they come in the first line treatment of uh, hypertension. Uh, um, they have classes phenyl alkylamines like virapamil, dihydropyridine like amlodipine and benzothiazepine diltiazem. Diuretics also come under first line uh, uh, treatment of hypertension which are thiazides, hydrochlorothiazide, loop diuretics that is furosemide and potassium sparing or aldosterone antagonists like spironolactone. Other antihypertensive agents are vasodilator, hydralazine, minoxidil, and centrally acting alpha 2 agonist clonidine and methyl dopa and ganglionic blockers like trimetapen. So blood pressure is basically uh, uh, correlated with cardiac output and vascular resistance. Cardiac output is based on contractility, heart rate, heart rate and preload and vascular uh, resistance through arterial and venous vasodilation. So the centrally acting agent, they act on central nervous system, which again act on heart and it decreases the contractility and heart rate. Beta blockers, they act on beta 2 receptors of heart and also on RAS system. And they act on both uh, by reducing heart rate contractility as well as by arterial and venous vasodilation. Diuretics, they act on kidney by salt and water balance defect and they decreases the preload and hence decrease the cardiac output. AC inhibitors and angiotensin uh, renin antagonists, they act on RAS system and they cause decrease the preload and arterial and venous vasodilation. Calcium channel blocker, they act on heart as well as vascular smooth muscle and reduce the BP. These are the various antihypertensive agents, their dosage, onset, and duration. So these uh, nitroprusside, nitroglycerin, esmolol, labetalol, we can use it as bridging therapy when we have stopped AC inhibitors or in the post-op period before uh, resuming their uh, usual antihypertensive agents. So these uh, short-acting antihypertensives can be uh, used as uh, bridging therapy in, during perioperative period. So preoperative essence, if we see, we need to know that hyper whether hypertension is primary or secondary, we should know the, about the cause, underlying cause of hypertension. 
and what is the stage of hypertension whether a patient is taking treatment or not whether it is white coat hypertension anxiety related and uh, what uh, organ damages have happened so we need to have some uh, uh, investigations beforehand and we should uh, look for uh, cva cad lvh and creatinine report should we see and uh, x ray in hypertensive breathless patients so in evaluation we do the systemic investigation that include the um, cbc renal function test electrolytes liver function test sugar levels ecg x ray and investigation to ascertain the underlying cause ultrasound abdomen renal function test thyroid profile fasting blood sugar hba1c cortisol banalel mandelic acid and to ascertain end organ damage echo chest x ray ecg fundus examination and pertaining to anti hypertensive treatment electrolytes and echo as uh, described by dr vikash during the case discussion so pre operatively uh, all anti hypertensive drugs should be continued even on the day of surgery and regarding ac inhibitors and arbs they may be omitted on the day of surgery if major hemodynamic changes or major fluid shifts are anticipated during the surgery uh, otherwise they can be continued and hypokalemia hypomagnesemia should be treated if present and uh, if patient is on diuretics and in case of white coat hypertension benzodiazepines should be administered as pre medication night before the surgery so in pre medication uh, anxiolysis is very important beta blocker calcium channel blockers to continue arbs can be discontinued otherwise it can cause refractory hypotension so possibly 10 hours before it should be stopped uh, clonidine for better hemodynamics and sedation and dexmed better in myocardial infarction but increase incidence of hypotension and bradycardia should be kept in mind so in intraoperatively monitoring depends on individual cases basic monitoring is needed in all cases like ecg nibp pulse oximetry etco2 urine output in cases where major fluid shift is uh, uh, anticipated or major cardiac uh, case or uh, other uh, cardiac uh, condition is involved then we'll need the invasive uh, bp monitoring like pulmonary artery catheter only for patient with ccf or recent mi so basic intraoperative goal is to minimize wide fluctuations of bp and to prevent myocardial ischemia cerebral hypoperfusion cerebral hemorrhage and hypertensive encephalopathy and renal failure as these patients are very prone to wide swing in blood pressure uh, during uh, induction emergence and even during the surgery because of surgical stimulus so we have to avoid these wide fluctuations and it can as it can be disastrous so this intraoperative hypotension and hypertension can be caused by various reason like the uh, stimulus of laryngoscopy intubation surgical stimulus inadequate plane of anesthesia or analgesia hypothermia hypervolemia during reversal and recovery when patient is coming out if hypoxia happens or uh, full bladder it all can cause to hypertension while the uh, so, uh, Uh, sympathetic blockade by spinal epidural anesthesia or due to, due to inhalational anesthetic blood loss hypovolemia mechanical ventilation arrhythmia other drugs all can lead to hypotension so uh, while induction induction has to be very properly managed the usual drugs inducing agents like thiopentone propofol and fentanyl are acceptable but if given in uh, titrated doses and very slow we have to be uh, very cautious about this as it can cause excessive hypotension ketomidate is okay but ketamine uh, can raise heart rate and uh, it can increase the bp so ketamine is not advisable and uh, during laryngoscopy laryngoscopy and uh, intubation is a very strong stimulus it can lead to very strong sympathetic stim uh, stimulus 
and uh, because of that uh, wide fluctuations of bp can happen and it can increase the bp during the time of laryngoscopy so the time of laryngoscopy should be minimized uh, aim should be less than 15 seconds some drugs are there that can we can use to blunt this uh, uh, laryngoscopy response like opioids lignocaine esmolol labetalol and uh, intraoperative hypertension can be controlled by either anesthetic or also by an antihypertensive agents so opioids inhalational agent butorphenol lignocaine and obviously the balanced anesthesia and uh, uh, is very important to control the hypertension the antihypertensive agent that can be used are uh, adrenergic blockers alpha blockers as we have already discussed beta blockers and combined alpha beta blockers like labetalol calcium channel blocker diltiazem nicardipine virapamil can be used ac in ac inhibitors enalapril can be used direct vasodilators hydralazine nitroglycerin and nitroprusside can be used in iv infusion and dopamine dopaminergic agonist phenoldopam can be used we should be uh, cautious about mean arterial pressure that should be maintained between 20% of baseline because in these patient the auto regulation it has shifted up so we should not target bp to be very low it should be around 20% of baseline we should use regional anesthesia and analgesia wherever possible because pain is one factor that can cause to increase in blood pressure intraoperatively as well as during emergence and post operative period we have to keep this in mind that ipbv and hypocapnia can decrease cardiac output intraoperatively fluid management is very important because the patient who are already on diuretic therapy and vasoconstrictor they usually are hypovolemic and adequate fluid replacement without overhydration uh, is important to prevent post op hypertension in presence of left ventricular hypertrophy left ventricular compliance curve shifts upwards and leftward a higher left ventricular diastolic pressure is attained thus higher pulmonary artery occlusion pressure is needed so hypertension uh, in post operative period may also be result of intravascular volume overload from excessive intraoperative fluid therapy it can persist to can uh, persist up to 48 hours until the fluid has been mobilized from the extravascular space it can also rise due to discontinuation of blood pressure medication post operatively so the bridging therapy is very important that has to be kept in mind that iv uh, uh, short acting drugs can be used during extubation and emergence very important point are adequate analgesia should be maintained wherever possible regional blocks can be used to supplement analgesia antihypertensive should be considered before extubation hypothermia hypoxia hypercarbia full bladder all these should be avoided so these are the post operative concerns that can lead to hypertension as we have discussed so there there is always a dilemma in uh, anesthetists that uh, when we should cancel the patient and when uh, we should proceed with the cases so this is just to summarize that that in stage 1 and 2 hypertension who do not have evidence of organ dysfunction thus we should proceed to the surgery although surgery may not have to be delayed but appropriate referral should be made so that patient will have future appropriate post operative management of inadequately managed hypertension we should watch out for intraoperative labile and fluctuation blood pressure and significant target organ involvement should be considered for preoperative treatment okay so stage 3 hypertension it is probably justified to postpone elective surgery to investigate for target organ damage and to institute therapy stage 4 hypertension it presents significant perioperative risk and surgery should be deferred for treatment and there is no place for cosmetic correction immediately prior to surgery and these patient should be given at least 4 to 6 weeks to optimize isolated systolic hypertension more than 180 and pulse pressure more than 80 is reasonable reason to postpone for optimization of bp we should remember that hypertension has disappeared from clinical risk from perioperative guidelines but hypertension still a concern for the perioperative period it has to be managed properly left ventricular hypertrophy tachycardia and hypotension they are the dreadful triad in hypertensive patient 
so to conclude basically we need to identify the cause of hypertension if present end organ damage to be identified and goal of controlling perioperative hypertension is to protect organ function proceed with elective surgery for class 1 and 2 and maintain bp to 20% of baseline all antihypertensives should be continued till the day of the surgery intraoperatively fluid management is very important and special care during induction and extubation thank you thank you dr sudhya for a extensive uh, guidelines and recommendations that we have currently for management of hypertension uh, is there any questions no questions sir sir um no questions in the chat box Thank you. You may conclude the session, sir. You may conclude the session, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Akash, Dr. Zubia. Now we'll leave. We'll continue the next program that we have. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your uh, such uh, detailed discussion about hypertension. Thank you, Dr. Shivpriya, for an such an informative uh, presentation on hypertension and its implications for anesthesia so we will now move on to our next uh, session Moving on to the next session, I would like to introduce the chairperson for this session, Dr. Vijay Kumar Nagpal, Sir is Professor at ABBIMS and Dr. Armel Hospital, New Delhi, and Sir's area of keen interest are pediatric and cardiac anesthesia. We welcome you, Sir, and over to you, Sir, for the proceedings of this session. Thank you, Dr. Vijay. Uh, we have a great afternoon today. Uh, we have teams today. Professor Mohandeep Kaur. She is the head of the department and professor and consultant at ABIS and uh, Dr. R M L Hospital. Her area of interests are critical care, trauma and resuscitation, airway management, ethics in anesthesia, research, medical education, and administratively, she is there of. Good relations within the department and between departments. Doctor uh, Professor Mondeep Kaur is about to speak on equipment. Thank you, Doctor Nagpal. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. My topic is IV fluids and parenteral nutrients. so before i go to the topic let's talk of a few terms and few things which are pertinent to the talk fluid compartments the as per the body water it is distributed between two major fluid compartments separated by cell membranes that is intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid extracellular fluid is further divided into interstitial and intravascular fluids Now, then there are osmotic forces created by the trapped solutes, which govern the distribution of water between the compartments and ultimately each compartment's volume. Now, for these osmotic forces that I've talked, two terms are very pertinent: osmolality and osmolarity. These always confuse the PG students. Let's make it clear. Osmolality is the number of solute particles in one kg of solvent, and changing osmolality of one compartment affects osmolality of the other compartment. Osmolarity refers to the number of solute particles per one liter of solution, and then solutions could be isosmolar, hypoosmolar, or hyperosmolar, depending upon if. 
the solution has same amount of particles and water it's iso or smaller solution with fewer particles and then water is hypo or smaller and hyper or smaller has got more particles than water now again this is a composition of intra and extracellular fluid compartments in milli or small per liter here this chart is given in every book but i wish to focus your attention on the thing that sodium and chloride are mostly extracellular and potassium and magnesium are intracellular calcium is also more in the extracellular compartment now the principal electrolytes in intracellular fluid is potassium and it has a key role in maintaining the transmembrane potential Sodium is more in extracellular fluid and is responsible for maintaining osmolality of the blood. IV fluid therapy. Now coming to the topic, IV fluids include crystalloids, colloids, and blood products. My talk would restrict it to crystalloids and colloids, and our parental nutrient admixtures. These are the drugs. IV fluids are not simple water or fluids. You know these are the drugs with specific indications, dose ranges, portion, and side effects. And we have to institute this IV fluid therapy when you know this hydration, effective circulating volume, and tissue perfusion are not adequately maintained by the oral fluid intake. So that is when we give these. IV fluids to the patient. Now, dividing the IV fluids mainly, you know, the these are divided into crystalloids and colloids. Crystalloids are your glucose-containing solutions or electrolyte solutions. Then mixed glucose with electrolyte solutions, and then we have colloids, which are divided into proteins and proteinaceous and non-proteinaceous colloids. Now, crystalloids. These are the solutions of sterile water with added electrolytes to approximate mineral content of human plasma. These are the initial fluid resuscitation fluids of choice in hemorrhagic and septic shock, burn patients, head injury, whereby you know maintain we maintain the cerebral perfusion pressure. Patients undergoing plasma pheresis and hepatic resection. For losses primarily involving water, replacement is with hypotonic solutions. If losses involve both water and electrolytes, then replacement is with isotonic electrolyte solutions. Now, dividing crystalloids further, we can divide these as per tonicity into hypotonic, isotonic, or hypertonic. And it is pertinent to know these because dextrose five percent, which we are usually Using in the OT is, you know, it is hypotonic. Half normal saline is also hypotonic. Hypotonic, isotonic solutions would be your normal saline, Ringer lactate, and plasma lights. Hypertonic salines are dextrose solutions are also there in the OTs and ICUs, and we use in it in specific indications. Then crystallides. Are divided on the basis of ionicity into ionic and non-ionic. Non-ionic ones being your dextrose solutions. So let's describe normal saline. Indications for this would are it provides major extracellular electrolytes, corrects water and electrolyte deficit, and substantially increases IV volume. It causes hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis as it contains high concentration of chloride, that is 154 milliequivalents per liter, as compared to plasma. Now, another one is Ringer's lactate or Hartman solution. Two names of two scientists are important as far as Ringer's lactate is concerned. One is Sydney Ringer in 1880 added potassium and calcium to normal saline to improve the cardiac contraction and cell viability and called it Ringer solution. Then Alex Hartman, who was a pediatrician, added sodium lactate to Ringer solution to buffer metabolic acidosis 
and this was then called Ringer's lactate or Hartmann solution. The advantages being no significant effect is there on acid base balance. Physiologically, it is similar to plasma. Sodium lactate in Ringer's lactate is metabolized to bicarbonate in liver, which is useful in correcting metabolic acidosis. Disadvantages are serum lactate levels may increase in critically ill patients due to impaired lactate clearance because of circulatory shock or hepatic insufficiency. The indications for Ringer's lactate are severe hypovolemia, displacement fluid in post-op period, burns, fractures, diarrhea, induced metabolic acidosis and hypovolemia. In diabetic ketoacidosis, Ringer's lactate provides free water, potassium, and it corrects metabolic acidosis. Contraindications are shock, hypoxia, severe liver disease, severe congestive heart failure, vomiting or continuous nasogastric aspirate with wherein it causes worsens the metabolic alkalosis. Then simultaneous infusion with blood, it is not indicated. Calcium in Ringer lactate inactivates the anticoagulant and leads to clotting of donor, donor blood. Then drugs like thiopendone sodium, amphotericin B, doxycycline and ampicillin bind with calcium in Ringer lactate. So leading to their decreased bioavailability. For anesthetists, the most important drug is thiopentone. So we should not use it with Ringer lactate. Dextrose available into in various concentrations, dextrose 5%, then this 5% in combination with 0.9% normal saline, in combination with 0.45% normal saline, dextrose 10%, 25%, and 50% with various indications. D5, the, it, the effects would be volume effect, protein sparing effect, lactate production, and hyperglycemia. So let's see further. It is indicated in giving calories to the body. When the patient is not eating anything, D5 gives us some calories. Prevention and treatment of dehydration, though not a fluid of choice. IV administration of various drugs. Prevention and treatment of ketosis in starvation, vomiting, and diarrhea. It protects livers against toxins and correction of hypernatremia due to pure water loss, that is diabetes insipidus. Limitations, herein we should not be using it. Neurosurgery as it aggravates cerebral edema and raises the intracranial tension. Acute ischemic stroke aggravates cerebral ischemic injury damage by aggravating tissue acidosis due to anaerobic glucose metabolism. Then in hypovolemic shock, it gives poor IV volume expansion as glucose absorption leads to decrease in osmolality and increased cellular hydration. Moreover, fast infusion of dextrose leads to osmotic diuresis, which worsens shock. In hyponatremia and water intoxication, D5 worsens the condition. Hypernatremia, herein we should give it slowly. Otherwise, fast administration would lead to Rapid correction of plasma sodium levels coupled with slow correction of brain cell sodium and leads to permanent neurological damage. Limitations, uh, uh, more limitations to be mentioned are blood and dextrose cannot be administered through same IV set as hemolysis occurs due to hypotonicity leading to clumping of the RBCs. In uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, it again leads to more hyperglycemia. Then dextrose administration causes hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and hypophosphatemia. Next, crystalloid, DNS, combination of dextrose with normal saline. It supplies major extracellular electrolyte, energy, and fluid, so corrects dehydration. It corrects vomiting or, N or NG aspiration-induced alkalosis and hypochloremia along with supply of calories. Induces diuresis, leading to increased urine output in partially corrected shock. It's not hypotonic because of sodium chloride and hence is compatible with blood transfusion. Limitations being severe hypovolemic shock, fast infusion of this causes diuresis and bursting of shock. D10 and D25 mostly used as source of calories. 
These ply energy prevent catabolism used for fast replacement of glucose in conditions like hypoglycemic coma given in congestive cardiac failure, cirrhosis and renal failure for fluid restriction. In liver diseases, as first drip, it inhibits glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. And then treatment of a given for treatment of hypokalemia along with insulin. Limitations being not to be used in patients with dehydration, anuria, intracranial hemorrhage, delirium tremors, rapid infusion would lead to glycosuria. So given over uh, 45 to 60 minutes time in the absence of hypoglycemia. Plasma light, it is a low chloride crystalloid and uh, with various contents uh, as mentioned. Osmol LAT is same as plasma, 295 milliosmoles by liter. Acetate and gluconate are metabolized to carbon dioxide and water along with consumption of H ions and this is the alkali alkalizing effect. Coming to colloids, these are based on crystalloids. We say these have water and electrolytes with added components of colloidal substance. And they have larger molecular weight, more than 30,000 Daltons, which prevents pre-diffusion and restrict them to IV compartments. These retained molecules create osmotic force called colloid oncotic pressure. That is why colloids increase intravascular volume quicker and using less volume than crystalloids. These are three times more effective in expanding plasma volume than crystalloids. Now, crystalloids are divided into proteinaceous and non-proteinaceous, proteinaceous ones being gelatin and albumins. Then, you know, we have non-proteinaceous ones as starches and dextrans. Starches would include hydroxyethyl starch, penta starch and tetra starch. Colloids again can be divided into natural and artificial, natural being the blood products, fresh frozen plasma, albumin 5% and 10% plasma proteins, artificial ones, again dextrone, hydroxyethyl starch and gelatins. Let's come to albumin. This is the main determinant of colloid on cortic pressure accounts for 75% colloid osmotic pressure. It is a principal transport protein in the blood and inhibits platelet aggregation and this maintains fluidity of blood. It is indicated in emergency treatment of shock due to loss of plasma, acute management of burns, pancreatitis induced hypoalbuminemia, patients with liver cirrhosis after liver transplantation, therapeutic plasma viruses as an exchange fluid to replace removed plasma available as 5% albumin and 10% albumin and 25% albumin. 5% has 50 grams per liter. Colloid and cortic pressure here is 20 mmHg, which is closer to plasma. Expands plasma volume to same as volume infused and infusion rate would be 1 to 2 ml per minute. It is used as replacement fluid except in traumatic brain injury. 25% albumin. Proportionate 20, 250 grams per liter. Colloid osmotic pressure is 70 mmHg. Expands plasma volume by four to five times of the volume infused. And initial infusion is 25 grams to be given at the rate of one ml per minute. Its use is associated with an increased risk of renal injury and death in circulatory shock. So to be used in, with caution in these patients. Starches. Hydroxyethyl starch classification is both based on molar substitution ratio, which is defined as number of hydroxyethyl groups per glucose molecular molecule, and then concentration, molecular weight, then C to C6 ratios. This describes the hydroxyethylation pattern of carbon atoms in the glucose ring at C to C6 positions. Concentrations available as 3% hypo-oncotic, 6% as iso-oncotic, 10% as hyper-oncotic. When molar substitution ratios, we can divide these into heta starch, this is 0.7, penta starch 0.5, 10% 
tetra starch 0.4 molar substitution ratio that is volume when which is often used and it is associated with increased morbidity in patients with sepsis and septic shock total parenteral nutrient intermixtures this picture shows it as three in one also called all in one there are separate bags having glucose fats and amino acid solutions contents can be mixed to make tpn admixture depending upon the osmolality may be infused through peripheral or central line now with those uh, tpn admixtures which have got osmolality up to 900 milliosmoles can be used peripherally and more than 900 milliosmoles we give them through central line these supply macro and micronutrients in one go and also three in one bag this prevents excessive handling of nutrients by the nursing staff now interlipid 20% this comes as 500 ml bottle and contains these contents soya bean oil egg phospholipid glycerol the energy given is 2 kilocalories per ml so one bag of 500 ml of 20% interlipid is going to give us approximately you know 900 kilocalories osmolality here in is 350 milliosmoles per kg indications it is used as a nutritional supplement as part of tpn for calories and source of essential fatty acids it's contraindicated with abnormal fat metabolism and pancreatitis if it is accompanied by hyperlipidemia dyslipidemias and liver diseases and a patient having known hypersensitivity to egg soya bean and peanut protein we must exercise cautions in lipidemia must clear between daily infusions and sometimes you know just the inspection of plasma can be good enough to show that there is no that plasma is clear that means there is no lipidemia existing albumin toxicity may occur in a patient with kidney disease amino acid solutions again are constituent of tpn with uh, you know 10% has got uh, 100 grams of amino acids which gives us 16.2 grams of nitrogen and total energy is 400 kilocalories however we do not use it as a source of energy in a tpn admixture we try to complete calories from the fats and carbohydrates and amino acid provides us proteins so that you know the catabolism is reduced or reversed and these have got an osmolality of 1070 milliosmoles most at this is given through the central line and dose is 1 to 1.5 gram amino acids per kg per day weight per day depending upon the severity of the catabolic state and amino acid requirement now here in i have shown the calculation of daily requirement for a 60 kg stable you will make patient with moderate stress so let's see fluid how much will we give 30 ml per kg per day in a 60 kg man 1800 ml per day or 1.8 liters per day calories 25 kilo calories per kg per day would come to 1500 kilo calories per day protein requirement moderate stress i am writing as 1 gram per kg per day easy to remember 60 grams per day fat requirement how do we calculate fat requirement 40% of total calories calculated so like 1500 kilo calories 40% would come to 600 kilo calories and 1 gram fat gives us 9 kilo calories so in all we require 67 grams of fats and carbohydrate requirement easy to calculate total calorie requirement 1500 minus fat calorie 600 so would come to 900 kilo calories are required from carbohydrate source 1 gram dextrose gives us 4 kilo calories so here in we would need 225 grams of carbohydrates to give us 900 kilo calories so 50% dextrose if we use it provides 50 grams per 100 ml to provide 225 kilo calories 450 ml of 50% dextrose needs to be infused 
and you know electrolytes trace elements and vitamins are added as per indication these are available as separate solutions and with this you know thank you very much i hope you know you have understood this commonly used iv fluids which sometimes you know we are not able to respond in drug viva these are the uh, very important fluids they are the examiner is very fond of asking iv fluids and then these parental nutrient admixtures so thank you so much thank you chat box um, so there's one question uh, after calculating blood loss how to administer fluid considering crystalloid versus colloid latest guidelines considering the ratio of crystalloid versus colloid one is to one or one is to three for ml of blood loss Earlier, we used to substitute 3 is to 1 crystalloids for the calculated blood loss. However, now, you know, the studies are showing the different uh, uh, perspective. There's, we are even giving, studies are being done on 1 is to 1 ratio. And, you know, colloids, uh, we are using 1 is to 1. But crystalloids, I think 1.5 times the blood loss. That is how um, the practice is uh, being uh, ad, uh, advocated these days and the studies are going on in this regard again. Three is to one is however now being, not being practiced so far. Fine. No, questions? Uh, no sir, there are no more questions. That's the only question that we had from delegates. Well, if there are no more questions, and do the session. Unmute sir, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you for your um, for being here. And thank you, ma'am, for such an informative lecture and uh, making such a boring topic in a very interesting way and in a very useful way when it comes to opening for the exam. So you just pinpointed the very essential things, very must know areas. I'm sure it will help and benefit all the postgraduate students in their upcoming exam. Thank you. So we will move on to our next session for today, which is a short case presentation of a 54 year old female with Coley's fracture for open reduction and internal fixation. And for this, we have a very eminent faculty with us as an external examiner. I would like to invite Dr. Parun Malik. Ma'am is Professor of Anesthesia in the Department of Anesthesia at VMMC and Subdajang Hospital. And Ma'am's area of special interest are obstetric anesthesia. She is actively involved in the teaching and training programs pertaining to BCLS, CCLS, ATLS, and NELS, and has several publications to her credit in various national and international pub, uh, journals. We welcome you, ma'am, on this podium. As a moderator, we have Dr. Anjali Singh. She's a senior resident at ABBMS and Dr. RML Hospital. The case will be presented by our first, final year postgraduate student, Dr. Shitish Toma. He's a final year postgraduate student from ABBMS and Dr. RML Hospital. Over to you, ma'am, for the proceedings of the session. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today we will be discussing the case of police fracture and aesthetic management. Uh, I'm Dr. Chitish Sumur. I'll be presenting it under the moderator of uh, moderation of Dr. Anjali Singh Ma'am and examiner Dr. Parul Mulikma. 
my patient name is meera she is a 54 years old female resident of silampur delhi she came in the casualty with chief complaint of pain and swelling in the left wrist for one day history of presenting illness there was a history of fall on outstretched hand one day ago the patient presented with pain which was sharp stabbing progressive in nature it was relieved on medication there was swelling in left wrist there was no history of numbness or paresthesia in the injured limb there was no external bleeding present there was no history of loss of consciousness vomiting ent bleed or any other injury past is the patient is a known case of hypertension for last 10 years her blood pressure is well controlled there is no history of corticosteroid or any other except anti hypertensive drug patient has no history of diabetes or any other medical history she had one child 20 years ago Uh, by LSCS uh, under spinal anesthesia, which was uneventful. Her personal history was that she achieved menopause two years ago. Patient has no history of allergy. Patient has no history of smoking, alcohol intake, or any drug addiction. She is vegetarian by diet. Informed consent was taken from the patient prior to general physical examination. On general physical examination, the patient was conscious, cooperative, oriented to time, place, and person. She was sitting comfortably on bed. She was moderately built. Well nourished. Her weight was sixty kilogram on the height of one sixty one centimeter. Her body mass index was twenty three point one four kg per meter square. She was febrile on touch. There was no pallor, ictus, clubbing, cyanosis, neuropathy, or edema. Her neck vein was not engorged. Her pulse rate was sixty six per minute, which was palpated on right radial artery, which was regular in rhythm and good in volume. All peripheral pulses were palpable. Her blood pressure was one thirty six by eighty four millimeter of mercury, measured in right upper arm in setting position. Her respiratory rate was fourteen per minute, which was regular. Her renal saturation was ninety nine percent. On airway examination, there was no visible maxillary fissure abnormality, and on uh, airway examination, there was no any significant abnormality in the examination. Uh, on respiratory system examination, there was bilateral air entry equal. It was clear there was no adult sound. On cardiovascular system examination, S1 and S2 were normal, and no murmurs were present. On central nervous system examination, the patient was oriented to time, place, and person. The higher mental functions were normal. On peripheral nervous system examination, there was no neurological deficit. On local examination. On inspection of the left upper limb, after adequate exposure, no external breach of skin was seen. Swelling, bruising, and deformity, which was dinner fog deformity, was seen over the left wrist. There was no visible scar or sign. On palpation, there was local rise in temperature. Tenderness was present on the wrist region, but no tenderness was present on the anatomy of snuff box. Crepitus was present. Radial and ulnar nerve. Both palpable. Capillary replay time was less than two seconds. There was no distal neurovascular deficit. Uh, on movements examination, painful restriction of movements was present. Uh, there was painful supination, painful pronation. There was no movement restriction at distal interphalangeal joint. Abduction and adduction of digits was normal. On sensory examination, there was no sensory deficit presentation. Mm, we are not audible. Uh, I am not able to hear you. अंजली मैम इस फारोल मैम ऑडिबल टू हेलो मैम एक्चुअली यू नॉट ऑडिबल यस मैम यस मैम बट इट्स स्टिल नॉट ऑडिबल मैम नो मैम 
हम लिखे हम लिखे दो लाइक दिस बात कर ले बात कर ले मैम से हेलो यस मैम हम ऑडिबल यस मैम ओके देन मैम माय पेशेंट इज अ 52 इयर्स ओल्ड पोस्ट मेनोपॉजल हाइपरटेंसिव फीमेल विद फ्रैक्चर ऑफ डिस्टल रेडियस मोस्ट प्रोबेबली कोविड फ्रैक्चर पोस्टेड फॉर ओपन रिडक्शन एंड इंटरनल फिक्सेशन मैम यू आर नॉट ऑडिबल एट ऑल शुक्रिया यार Um, actually, there is some issue with your mic. Is this okay? Hello, is it audible now? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, fine. All right. So, what is Coley's fracture, uh, Shetaj? Uh, ma'am, Coley's fracture was first described by Abraham Coley's, which is caused by fall on outstretched hand with wrist in dorsiflexion. It is defined as an extra articular fracture of distal radius at its corticocanceller junction. Within 2.5 centimeter of distal articular surface, with dorsal combination, dorsal angulation, dorsal displacement, and radial shortening. Okay, so what is dinner fork deformity? Do you know that you said that there was a dinner fork deformity uh, in your patient? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, dinner fork deformity is uh, defined when there is dorsal angulation and dorsal displacement of along with the radial shortening. So, beta, what basically yeah. happens is that when you in a patient who has Coley's fracture, so when you see the side view of the wrist, it can be compared to the shape of a fork which is facing down because there's a distinct bump in the wrist which is quite similar to that of the neck of a fork. So that's why you call it as a, a dinner fork deformity. Okay. So what is the incidence of this fracture? Ma'am, the incidence of Coley's fracture in male is nine per ten thousand per year, and in females it is thirty-seven per ten thousand per year. The incidence of Coley's fracture is more in females than males. And basically, another thing that you must know is that there is a bimodal distribution uh, of these fractures. Like in young athletes, it's seen in mainly men because of sports injuries. But in elderly people, it is seen in due to osteoporosis, and it's more common in uh, post-menopausal women because they have estrogen deficiency. Okay, so how will you prepare this patient, ma'am? I would ask for the baseline investigations. I would ask for complete hemogram, liver function test, kidney function test, serum electrolyte, fasting blood sugar, and I would ask for baseline ECG and X-ray. and my uh, pre-op pre ha huh. my pre-op order in, yes ma'am my pre-op advice in this case would be i would advise nil per oral for 8 hours i would uh, take a written informed consent of the patient i would uh, advise the patient to take anti hypertensive drug on the morning of surgery with sips of water and i would i would advise tablet alprazolam 0.25 mg one night prior to the surgery Okay, so uh, what is your anesthetic plan, ma'am? Uh, I would plan this under regional anesthesia, which is ultrasound guided supraclavicular block with intravenous sedation. So, uh, what is the advantage of regional anesthesia over general anesthesia? Ma'am, regional anesthesia has several advantages over general anesthesia. It decreases the periop opioid consumption. it provides better post op analgesia it decreases the post op incidence of nausea post op uh, incidence of post op nausea vomiting it decreases the hospital stay by providing early mobilization of the patient okay so can you tell us about the anatomy of brachial plexus yes ma'am ma'am brachial plexus it originates from ventral rami of spinal nerve root c5 to t1 to form three trunks in lower part of the neck between anterior and middle scalene muscle the upper trunk is formed by c5 and c6 nerve root middle trunk is formed by c7 nerve root and lower trunk is formed by c8 and t1 nerve roots 
each tongue divides into anterior and posterior division behind the clavicles forming the three chords the chords are named according to their position in comparison to axillary artery posterior chord is formed by posterior division of all the three chords lateral uh, chord is formed by anterior division of upper and middle trunk uh, and lateral trunk is uh, middle trunk is formed by anterior division of uh, lower trunk these chords end up in terminal branches uh, terminal nerve branches which are radial nerve axillary nerve musculocutaneous nerve median nerve and anterior nerve so uh, what are the approaches to a brachial plexus block Ma'am, the different approaches to brachial plexus block is interscaling brachial plexus block, which covers shoulder to elbow. Ma'am, other brachial plexus block is supraclavicular brachial plexus block, which covers from distal two third of arm to the head. Infraclavicular brachial plexus block, which covers from distal arm to hand, and axillary brachial plexus block, which covers from distal forearm to hand. Distal forearm, but a distal arm to hand, right? Distal portion of the arm also it covers. Now. Then, uh, all right. So uh, basically, what it is is that interscalene block. When you are giving, you are basically blocking the nerve roots, and at the supraclavicular, you are blocking the nerve trunks and the divisions. At the infraclavicular region, you are blocking the cords, and in the axillary region, you are blocking the terminal branches. So, uh, why do you want to give uh, supraclavicular block? Ma'am, I would like to give supraclavicular block because it would provide rapid, reliable onset of anesthesia with high success rate. And there is bundling of trunks in uh, the supra supraclavicular block region, which helps in providing excellent coverage of the upper extremity. Thus, it also gives cover for the tonic application, thus providing better to tonic tolerance to the patient. Yeah, that's right. And basically, supraclavicular block, you should know, is also known as the spinal of the upper extremity. Because over here, all rounds and divisions, they can be anesthetized from this location. All right. So, uh, what are the contraindications of a supraclavicular block? Ma'am, contraindications of supraclavicular block would be divided into two. There are absolute contraindications when uh, the patient refuses for the procedure, when the patient is allergic to local aesthetic agent, when there is infection over the site of nadal insertion, and relative contraindications would be ma'am when there is any bleeding disorder, sepsis, ipsilateral neuromuscular uh, the neuromuscular deficit, and if there is uh, any respiratory compromise in the patient. Okay, so can you give this block bilaterally? Sorry, ma'am. Can can you give a supraclavicular block bilaterally on both sides together? Uh, ma'am, it is not. It, it would be a relative contraindication. It is not advisable to give a bilateral not, supraclavicular yes. block, right? Okay. So, uh, what are your anesthesia concerns? Uh, Ma'am, my concerns would be divided into patient-related concern, surgery-related concern, and anesthesia-related concern. My patient-related concerns would be she is an elderly patient, she is a known hypertensive, and as she is postmenopausal, she might be osteoporotic. Ma'am, my surgery-related concerns are there are chances of neurovascular injury. And then as the surgery required tonic application, there are chances that it would cause skin necrosis, neurovascular injury, muscle injury, tonic pain and compartment syndrome. And now my anesthesia related concerns would be there are chances of neurovascular injury due to the needling during the block. And my positioning of the patient would be a concern because it would require axillary padding on the patient. Okay, so due to inadvertent intravascular injection, sorry, ma'am. Ha, nee, nee, bolo, beta, bolo. It would also cause local anesthetic systemic toxicity due to inadvertent intravascular injection of local anesthetic agent in excessive dose. There are also chances of phrenic nerve block, phrenic nerve block, and there are also chances of uh, pneumothorax due to the needle, and it can also cause Horner syndrome and other neuropathy. Okay, so one more, uh, better one more anesthesia, one more uh, thing that you must always keep in mind is that because these surgeries are done under tonic, 
so the timing of prophylactic antibiotics also should be kept in mind so these antibiotics they must be if they have to be given they must be given at least 5 to 10 minutes before tonic inflation is done to allow a good tissue penetration so this thing also should be kept in mind that you give it before okay that is also one of your concerns okay. then uh, okay so how would you proceed How will you proceed for anesthesia, Shritesh? I will prepare the OT. I'll check the... Sorry, ma'am. Haan, beta, bolo, bolo. How will you yes, proceed for anesthesia? Yes, ma'am. I will prepare the OT. I will check the central oxygen supply. I'll check the cylinder pressures, anesthesia machine and suction. I'll check the resuscitation equipment, emergency medication and anesthetic medication, including lipid emulsion. I'll prepare the difficult airway card, take the patient inside the OT, and I'll attach the ASA standard monitoring, which would be non-invasive blood pressure monitoring, ECG, and pulse oximetry. I will do the WHO checklist, and I'll record the baseline vitals of the patient, and then secure an IV cap. After counseling and explaining the whole procedure to the patient, I will give injection 1 mg midazolam and injection 50 mics fentanyl to the patient. And I will position the patient with the head turned away on the opposite side and epsilateral arm extended to the side of the patient. I will clean and drape the patient, uh, I will clean and drape the needle insertion side and I will use a compact linear probe of frequency 5 to 15 megahertz for the block. Now after applying ultra, uh, sterile ultrasound gel and sterile probe cover, the probe will be placed just above the midpoint of the sub, uh, clavicle in corridor direction in which the subclavian artery is visualized as an hypoechoic structure with distal trunk and proximal division seen later to the subclavian artery in honeycomb appearance. After injection of skin wheel, we will insert the needle in in-plane approach from lateral to medial direction and advance the needle towards the plexus. Then the final position of the needle should be within the plexus immediately above the first above the first wave and uh, lateral to the subclavian artery. It is also called as eight ball position. The distinct pop felt when there is uh, when the needle pierces the facial covering of the plexus. Then at the desired position, I'll pull the plunger back to check if there, if there is any intravascular uh, position of the needle. Then I'll inject 1 to 2 ml of local anesthetic agent and I'll see the spread of local anesthetic agent on the uh, USG screen. It should uh, cause expansion in the plexus. It, it should cause expansion in the plexus diameter with hypoechoic substance. The rest of the drug is given after adjusting the needle portion so as to cover the whole, uh, cover all the nerves of the plexus. Okay, so uh, what if ultrasound is not available to you? Then how will you give the block? Ma'am, if ultrasound is not available to me, I would use landmark guided nerve stimulator technique or I would use landmark guided paresthesia elicitation technique. Okay, so can you just tell me just the point of needle insertion in case you are using a landmark technique using paresthesia method? Okay, what will be your point of needle insertion? Ma'am, the point of needle insertion and in landmark technique, uh, the needle insertion uh, inserted at the site of margin of safety, which is about 2.5 centimeter lateral to the insertion of lateral border of stenocleidal mastoid on the clavicle. The needle insertion medial to this point will cause, ha will have higher chance of pneumothorax. The needle is inserted perpendicular to the skin and it is redirected parallel to the inner midline. Okay, so if you are using a nerve stimulator along yes, with this, so uh, what will what with what current will you start? What current will you give? Can you tell me what what will be your setting? Um, I'll give 0.8 milliampere of current. 0 okay. Milliampere of current. And at two hertz, okay, fine. Yes. So what will you see uh, as a response when you are giving this current? Ma'am, I'll see twitching in the um, uh, muscles supplied. Uh, the nerves which I'm stimulating, I'll see the twitching in that region. Flexion or extension of the yes, digits you will see. Yes. Now. If you are able to see that movement, then you will get the drug. Okay. So can you get the surgery done in any other, using any other approach to break a plexus block other than uh, Yes, ma'am. Uh, it can be done by intraclavicular plexus block or axillary plexus block. Mm -hmm. 
What about interscaling block? Can you use that? Ma'am, no, uh, I would not like to use interscaling block because it does not cover our area of interest and it is mostly recommended in shoulders only. Okay, because it does not uh, cover the C8 and T nerve, nerve roots also, right? Yes, ma'am. And it's only meant for, uh, for the shoulder. Okay. So, which additional nerve block do you, is often required with axillary block if you're getting the surgery done under axillary? So, what additional nerve block is often required with it? Um, as an axillary block, there is sparing of musculocutaneous and intercostobracal now. So I would have to give additional block of musculocutaneous and intercostobracal now. And I will supplement the block with that. Okay. So what are the techniques of uh, axillary block? With what techniques can you uh, give the axillary artery block? Uh, Ma'am, you have asked techniques of axillary nerve block. Yeah, yeah. Better. What are the injection mm -hmm. methods? How you can inject? Huh? Ma'am, axillary skin block can be given by single injection technique. It can be given by double injection technique. When mm -hmm. we give the local anesthetic drug superior inferior to the axillary artery, multiple injection technique, and then there is trans arterial technique. Okay. So, what are, um, uh, suppose, um, how can you supplement? Suppose there's an incomplete block. So, how can you supplement? incomplete blocks. If you want to get the surgery only done under a regional block, can you see that yes, the effect is not coming adequate. There's some areas are, uh, you know, there's patchy areas are left out there. How will you supplement that? Um, I, I could block the nerve on a medial musculocutaneous nerve, regen nerve, little cutaneous nerve of forearm, and medial cutaneous nerve of forearm. They will. Uh, Hello? Uh, hello? One. Uh, Shethish, oh, I, couldn't, I couldn't hear you. What were you saying? How will you supplement? Ma'am, I can supplement the block with uh, the block of nerves at anticubital fossa. I can block the ulnar nerve or median nerve, musculocutaneous nerve, median nerve, uh, little uh, cutaneous nerve of pura and middle cutaneous nerve of pura. Or intercostal brachial now also you block you yes, may need to get now basically you can you have various other so if there is any patchy effect or you need to supplement then you have these areas where you can give block right? so now basically see this um, uh, fracture distal radius surgery is done under a tourniquet right so yes, there are a lot of complications that are related to tourniquet so can you please uh, tell all the complications that can occur because of the tourniquet Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, there could be complication during the inflation, there could be complication during tonic application, and then there is complication uh, during the depression period. So during uh, inflation, it could cause hypertension because there is increase in blood volume due to exsanguination. There will be increased cardiac output and there will be increased pulmonary artery pressure. Ma'am, during tonic application, there are metabolic changes. There will be pain due to cellular acidosis which is only relieved by deflation. And then there is acidosis, which is caused by local tissue ischemia. And during deflation, it is the most crucial step. There is sudden drop in blood pressure due to sudden release of accumulated anaerobic metabolites uh, like thrombosine and substance P. Cardiac arrests have been reported in this stage. There, is, uh, there are chances of acidosis, hyperkalemia, myoglobinuria, myoglobinemia, and now it can also lead to kidney failure. This is also known as myonephrotic metabolic syndrome. And now there is also dropping the blood uh, in four body temperature due to uh, redistri volume redistribution. And because the hypothermic blood from the ischemic limb is going back into the circulation. Okay, so basically, uh, because of the tonic, other than the systemic, you have a lot of, uh, because of the pressure effect and the ischemia that it is causing, you have damage, there can be damage to neurovascular, muscular and uh, the skin damage. So it is uh, very important that the tonic cuff, 
that you use, first of all, it should overlap at least three inches, but it should not overlap more than six inches. Now, what happens is if your cuff is not overlap is overlapping less than three inches, then there is a chance that it may accidentally open up or it may not provide adequate pressure. Besides, if it is more than six inches, then it puts up too much of a pressure on the skin tissues. Then the cuff, it should be, uh, just make sure that the cuff is wider than half the limb's diameter and you place it at a point of uh, maximum circumference, okay? And uh, also ensure that you have, uh, that a soft padding has been put in place. No, though the technicians are putting the tourniquet and they are applying it, but because uh, medical legal uh, implications are there for anesthesiologists also, it's very important that you see it that it is being placed properly okay so uh, these things should be kept in mind all right so now uh, besides uh, regional anesthesia with brachial plexus block what are the other anesthetic options that you have ma'am in uh, beside regional anesthesia we can give regional plus general anesthesia we can give only general anesthesia or we can give uh, intravenous regional anesthesia as well Okay, so I will will also like to add uh, one more technique that is the volant procedure that is uh, W A L A N T that is wide awake local anesthetic no tourniquet. Now uh, for uh, technique for distal radius fracture. Now which this technique basically involves injecting lignocaine and epinephrine directly into the surgical site where epinephrine acts as a chemical tourniquet. Now, this kind of a procedure was, you know, is this is very popular in hand surgery. You will see the plastic surgeons are invariably infiltrating lignocaine with adrenaline and doing the surgery. But recently, it has also been used for distal radius fractures. And there have been a lot of case series which have been published ever since 2018. So you should just be aware that there is this kind of a technique also in which surgeons are performing the surgery. Okay. So, uh, you spoke about intravenous regional anesthesia. Can you tell me what is the advantage of intravenous regional anesthesia, Shritaj? Shritaj, what is the advantage of IVRA? Yes, ma'am. Ma uh, it is an easy procedure. There is no chance of failure. Ma'am, there is rapid onset of anesthesia within five minutes. It gives good muscle relaxation. And it can be also used in outpatient surgeries. And it provides bloodless field, right? Yes. Okay, so what is the disadvantage? What is the disadvantage of IVRA? Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, the disadvantage of intravenous visualization would be there is no post-op pain of post-op analgesia. There is nothing for pain relief. This process is limited to the procedure which are less than one hour in duration. Local anesthetic systemic toxicity, it can happen due to accidental deflation of the tourniquet. Ma'am, and then there will be a uh, tourniquet pain. And while using lignocaine, there are chances that it will co cause methemoglobinemia. Prilocaine better. Prilocaine. Methemoglobinemia occurs if prilocaine is used, not lignocaine. Okay. And ma'am, the tourniquet cannot be deflated before 30 minutes. See, another big disadvantage of IARA for uh, uh, doing these uh, uh, procedures which have uh, fracture like distal radius fracture is that it is very uncomfortable because for IARA you have to take a distal uh, vascular axis, isn't it? So it's very uncomfortable for the patient when you are uh, trying to apply uh, uh, injection in uh, the fractured hand and manipulating it. Okay, so that is there. So, um, all right. So, suppose um, uh, after 30 minutes of onset of anesthesia uh, in IVRA, your patient complains of discomfort at tourniquet site. So, what will you do? Ma'am, if the patient complains of discomfort, in this case, I would have to deflate the, I'll inflate the distal cuff and I'll deflate the proximal cuff in this case. And if I want to, if the procedure is done, and I want to remove the tourniquet. I'll do the cyclic deflation. Abhi, nahi, beta, you, you just answer to the point. When when uh, the patient is complete, see, it is very important. Dekho, bacha, in the exam, na, 
just listen here listen to the examiner do what question has been asked just stick to that otherwise don't you get into trouble okay so just why yes. answer karo jo puch raha hai all right so now you have told me that if there is discomfort you are going to inflate the distal cuff and you will uh, after that deflate the proximal cuff so it will help in the tolerating the tonic pain okay so besides this uh, can you use um, uh, some adjuvants with local anesthesia that may prolong the tonic tolerance and improve the post operative analgesia so sometimes using uh, pethidine or dexmedetomidine or clonidine primadol fentanyl these uh, drugs they have been used as adjuvants uh, for ivr okay so now suppose uh, shitish the surgical procedure uh, you said uh, that uh, you will wait for 30 minutes and uh, uh, you were talking something like that so i just want to ask you suppose the surgical procedure finishes in 15 minutes only and uh, even 30 minute um, okay and uh, you need to uh, now the surgeon says the surgery is over so what are you going to do ma'am i will wait for 30 minutes Yes. And then, yes. And then I will proceed for the cyclic depletion of the tourniquet. I will first uh, deflate the uh, tourniquet and then reinflate them again. And I'll wait for uh, I'll between this one minute I'll check if there is and there are any sign of local anesthetic systemic toxicity. And then I'll deflate the cuff again. If there are no signs of local anesthetic systemic toxicity, I'll deflate the cuff and reinflate them again. and i'll repeat this procedure to 3 to 4 time and then i'll uh, mm -hmm. and uh, i'll repeat this procedure to 3 to 4 times and then see if there are no signs of last then i'll deflate both the cuffs proximally the patient uh -huh. basically beta 3 to 4 times is not required you can do it just twice two times is good enough okay so basically it is tonic deflation should be done in a cyclical manner okay you deflate immediately reinflate watch for local anesthetic toxicity then again deflate and immediately reinflate now again watch for local anesthetic toxicity if it is not there then you can deflate it okay so two times is good enough so how will you recognize and manage local anesthetic systemic toxicity shitej mam uh, i'll i'll recognize it that the initial symptoms they include the uh, light headedness dizziness perioral numbness thumb numbness and ma'am further it progresses to cns symptoms like there is uh, visual disturbances there is difficulty in focusing tinnitus uh, muscle twitching generalized tonic clonic seizures can be there ma'am uh, it can cause arrhythmias any conduction blocks uh, then the patient uh, goes into respiratory depression and in the end the patient goes into cardiovascular collapse and ma'am the management of this it was given in it has given in asra 2020 guidelines uh, i would consider prompt airway management if the patient is having seizures uh, benzodiazepines are supposed to be given if the patient is having arrest acls guidelines are to be followed with modification i'll give smaller dose of epinephrine that would be 1 microgram per kg body weight and then there is lipid emulsion therapy which is supposed to be given immediately after airway management now if the patient has more than 70 kg i'll give a bolus dose of 100 ml over a period of 2 to 3 minutes and then i will continue the infusion of 250 uh, i'll continue the infusion of 250 ml in next 15 to 20 minutes and now if the patient is less than 70 kg body weight i would give a bolus dose of 1.5 ml per kg body weight over a period of 2 to 3 minutes and then i'll continue infusion of 0.25 ml per kg per minute for next okay. 15 to 20 minutes ha that's all right so okay shitish can you tell me what are the complications that you can see in a patient with coli fracture which you should keep in mind yes ma'am Ma'am, the complications seen in the seen in coli fracture could be malunion. There could be carpal tunnel syndrome. There could be rupture of external pollicis longus tendon. There could be stiffness of joint, and there could be sudden osteodystrophy. Besides that, you can also have media and uh, yeah, other uh, neuropathies and uh, uh, injuries, no neurovascular injury, okay, mm -hmm. and the boyfriend's disease also. 
okay so um can you just uh, tell me what is compartment syndrome quickly yes ma'am uh, ma'am in compartment syndrome when the soft tissue pressure in the close extremity compartment exceeds the capillary perfusion pressure it results in ischemic tissue damage uh, which is usually caused in compartment syndrome so beta um so in these fractures uh, remember that uh, uh, lower red distal radius fractures always remember a couple of important things first of all note and be aware of the tourniquet time then you should know that patient whoever has received nerve blocks you should inform that patient to protect their insensate limb and from external pressure and temperature extremes now this is very important okay then you should also inform the surgeon because you have given a regional block so in case there is a compartment syndrome it might just get missed because that patient is not going to be able to tell about the pain part so one has to look for it and then since you are giving a supraclavicular block delayed pneumothorax due to the block should always be kept in mind and this thing should be uh, i mean you should always inform the surgeon about this okay that they should be aware So now, can I request Dr. Anjali to please summarize uh, the presentation quickly? Ah uh, yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. To summarize, uh, here we had a 54-year-old postmenopausal hypertensive female with fracture of distal radius, which uh, for posted for open reduction and internal fixation. Uh, the several anesthesia techniques which we can use for this patient include regional anesthesia with nerve blocks, general anesthesia, or intravenous regional anesthesia. We used an ultrasound-guided approach to this uh, brachial plexus block. Ultrasound guided supraclavicular approach to brachial plexus block, wherein blockage was at the level of the distal trunk and proximal division level. The uh, goal of the block, um, our goal was to uh, spread local anesthetic around the brachial plexus, posterior and superficial to the artery. Out of the several techniques, there are landmark techniques with elicitation of paresthesia, peripheral nerve stimulator, and ultrasound guided technique. after positioning the patient in supine or semi recumbent position with head turned away from the side to be blocked and arm adducted in landmark technique the needle is inserted immediately posterior and lateral to the subclavian artery behind the midpoint of clavicle and the needle is directed cordially posteriorly and medially until paresthesia is elicited in a slight modification of this technique where we keep in mind the margin of safety which lies 2.5 cm lateral to the insertion of clavicular head of sternocleidomastoid sternocleidomastoid muscle the palpating finger is uh, placed at this point and the needle is inserted uh, from the cephalic direction first perpendicular to the skin and then uh, directed under the palpating finger parallel to the sagittal plane In the ultrasound guided approach the linear transducer probe is positioned just superior to the clavicle at its midpoint and the subclavian artery can be visualized as an anechoic round structure with the brachial plexus seen uh, superiorly and posterior to the artery as in a honeycomb appearance so here is a picture depicting the uh, uh, insertion uh, the landmark uh, needle insertion site for the landmark technique Uh, here we have a ultrasound guided image uh, showing the subclavian artery and the brachial plexus which can be seen as a honeycomb in a honeycomb pattern and the next uh, picture shows the uh, trajectory of the needle and the spread of the local anesthetic uh, supraclavicular block brachial plexus block should best be avoided if your patient is uncooperative or cannot tolerate any degree of respiratory compromise as ipsilateral phrenic nerve blockage occurs in 40 to 60% of the cases which is usually self limiting other complications of the block include horner syndrome pneumothorax neuropathy hematoma uh, or a local anesthetic systemic toxicity patient refusal is our absolute co uh, contraindication and other contraindications being local infection at insertion site and coagulation abnormalities the other block which can be used for this patient is an infraclavicular brachial plexus block wherein the blockage is at the level of the cords 
The anatomical landmarks of the infraclavicular fossa include the pectoralis major and minor muscles anteriorly, the ribs medially, the clavicle and coracoid process superiorly, and the humerus laterally. There are four techniques. The first is the classical approach for infraclavicular block, wherein the needle is inserted two centimeters below the midpoint of the inferior clavicular border, advanced laterally directed towards the axilla. The coracoid approach in which the needle is inserted two centimeters medial and two centimeters caudal to the coracoid process and directed posteriorly and perpendicular to the skin. In the vertical infraclavicular approach, the needle entry point is immediately below the clavicle at a point midway the sternal notch and the ventral apophysis of acromion. So the needle is advanced in a vertical direction to a maximum depth of four centimeters. In the ultrasound guided approach, the linear transducer probe is placed uh, just medial to the coracoid process below the clavicle and the axillary artery is visualized and local uh, anesthetic is injected posteriorly, uh, and in, posteriorly and deep to the artery. The advantages of the infraclavicular block being that uh, the, it is a very, um, the tunica application is well tolerated by the patient as it covers the area of application. Also bilateral blocks can be given to the patient and it is also conducive for catheter placement. This is a picture showing the classical approach, the needle insertion site for the classical approach, the needle insertion site for the coracoid approach, which is two centimeters needle and corded to the coracoid process and the ultrasound image showing the needle, the axillary artery and the, uh, and the local anesthetic. An axillary brachial plexus approach can also be used for this patient. The blockade in this approach occurs at the level of the terminal branches. Axillary artery is the most important landmark in this approach with median nerve being superior, ulnar nerve being inferior and radial nerve being posterior to the artery. Uh, there are single, uh, single injection, double injection, multiple injection and transarterial injection. The various techniques for this block, uh, vascular puncture, local anesthetic, systemic toxicity, hematoma and nerve injury are amongst the complications of axillary brachial plexus block. Any skin infection, axillary lymphadenopathy is a contraindication and it should preferably be avoided in patients with pre-existing neurological disease of the upper extremity. This is a picture uh, showing the anatomy of the axillary artery and the related nerves. Uh, intravenous regional anesthesia can also be used as an anesthesia technique for the patient. It was first described by August Bayer in 1808. Herein, we uh, inject a local anesthetic through an IV cannula, which is sited on the affected arm. Two tunicates are placed around the arm. Uh, first, the arm is exsanguinated using an smarch bandage. And then the proximal tunicate cuff is inflated pro approximately 150 millimeters of mercury above the systolic blood pressure. Uh, the onset of analgesia is quick within five minutes and complete analgesia is obtained within 10 minutes. Uh, most commonly used drugs are prilocaine 0.5% and lignocaine 0.5%. Bupivacaine is a uh, contraindication to IVRA. You should not be using bupivacaine. Indications for IVRA include a short operative procedure and pain therapy. The advantages are it's a simple and easy technique with rapid onset, low cost, and can be used for outpatient surgery. And there is a controllable extent of anesthesia. The complications can include compartment syndrome, phlebitis, and loss of a limb. Patient refusal is an absolute contraindication with other contraindications being allergy to local anesthetic, Raynaud's or peripheral vascular disease, crush injuries should be avoided in children less than 10 years, uncontrolled hypertension, obese patients, infection, inability to access peripheral veins and compound fractures. Now, uh, local anesthetic systemic toxicity is, can be encountered with the use of regional anesthesia. According to ASTRA 2020 guidelines, this is a, a small uh, flow chart depicting the management. Uh, first of all, uh, the uh, a person should call for help and uh, plus the uh, cardiopulmonary bypass team should be ready. The lipid emulsion should be available. In case of an event of seizure, adequate air, uh, uh, definitive airway should be ensured. Benzodiazepines are preferred and if only propofol is available, small dosages, for example, 20 milligram increments should be used. And lipid emulsion in patients over 20, uh, 70 uh, kilograms, uh, bolus of 100 
ml can be given over 2 to 3 minutes or 250 ml over 15 to 20 minutes if the patient remains unstable the bolus can be repeated in patients under uh, with weight under 70 kilograms the bolus can be given at a rate of 1.5 ml ml per kg body weight over 2 to 3 minutes followed by an infusion of 0.25 ml per kg per minute if the patient is unstable we can again repeat the boluses if there is presence of arrhythmia or hypotension, the ACLS protocol needs to be followed, but taking care that the dose of epinephrine used should be smaller. We should be starting with a dose of less than one microgram per kg and local anesthetics, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers and vasopressin should be avoided. If your patient is stable, we can continue the lipid emulsion for more than 15 minutes uh, once hemodynamic stability is achieved. The maximum dose which we can give is up to 12 ml per kg body weight. After stabilization, patient can be observed for two hours if there was a seizure or four to six hours after cardiovascular instability or as uh, appropriate by after, after the event of a cardiac arrest. Thank you so much. So with this, are, are, uh, are there any questions? We have finished with the presentation. Uh, no, ma'am, no questions. Uh, no, ma'am, no questions. Uh, no, ma'am, no questions. All right. So uh, thank you so much. So I hope uh, people, students, you have understood how to answer the questions and uh, what are the probable questions that could be asked to you from you uh, in the patient who presents with the police Okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for such wonderful discussion. I'm sure these events be from the discussion. So, what we do in our second uh, quiz before the break? Can we have the questions for the second quiz? Centrolene is given to treat A, neurolept malignant syndrome, B, malignant hypothermia, C, thyroid storm, or D, all of the above. Moving to the next question. A 56-year-old, 75-kg man is undergoing general anesthesia for a right colectomy. After the induction, the patient develops a junctional arrhythmia. Which inhalational anesthetic would most likely be associated with this arrhythmia? A, nitrous oxide, B, desflurane, C, isoflurane, or D, halothane? So we'll take our lunch break. We'll resume sharp at 1.30 to begin with our next session, which is a long uh, which is a long case presentation so do not waste time and be there on time see you guys
Welcome back to the land. So let's explain the session, which is a long case presentation on a very, very important topic. It's a patient of 60 years old, male, patient known age for, for a laparoscopy. And with us, we have a very eminent faculty as the external examiner. I would like to invite Dr. Bharti Vadwa, Ma'am is Director Professor at Molana Azad Medical College, New Delhi. And Ma'am has several achievements to her credit. She is a national coordinator for webinars in anesthesiology. She's a member specialist board of NBEMS. She's an associate editor of the Northern Supplement of IJ. She's the executive member of ICA, member of Delhi Hymn Society, organizing secretary of ICACON 2021, and is a member editorial board of GICA. We welcome you, ma'am. It's a privilege to have you as a faculty for today's discussion. Thank the you. The session will be moderated by Dr. Sujal, uh, Nath Sujali Chopo. Ma'am is Associate Professor at ABVMS and RML Hospital. Ma'am's area of keen interest are neuroanesthesia and pediatric anesthesia. Welcome, Welcome ma'am. The, the case will be presented by our final year postgraduate student, Dr. Sarvanan. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Nitin, for the kind words and the introduction. And congratulations to you. I'm meeting you the first time after the results have come out on your remarkable achievement, a very well-deserved one too. Uh, we Thank have you. a very interesting case today and I hope the students are now awake after the wonderful lunch that they've had. It's a tricky case, it comes very often. Invariably, you will find one such long case in your exams and we hope that today we shall be able to clear many gray areas. We shall begin with uh, Dr. Sarvanan's uh, case presentation, following which we shall have a Q&A session with me and then Dr. Uh, Sujali will wrap up the session by presenting and giving her a uh, wrap up on the particular case. So over to you Sarvanan, let's just uh, quickly begin with this. Uh, we shall time it in such a way that um, I'm able to hand over to Dr. Sujali by um, I think um, 2.35 will be fine, Sujali. That gives you uh, 20 minutes. Yes, will that yes, be okay for you? Yes, ma'am. Right. So I'm tying it, tying it, timing it like that. So give us an hour and five minutes. Over to you, Sarvanan. Sarvanan, please unmute yourself. Um, is my screen visible? Yeah, the screen is visible and we can hear you also now. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Suresh Kumar, 60-year-old male, a construction worker from Delhi, presented with chief complaints of swelling in the right groin region for three years. History of presenting illness. Patient was apparently already three years ago when he developed a swelling in the right groin. It was initially the size of a coin and has gradually progressed to size of a cricket ball, reaching the scrotum over the period of three years. The swelling becomes more prominent on standing, cuffing, sneezing, lifting heavy object and disappeared completely on lying down. The swelling is associated with heaviness in the right groin region for the two months, which was insidious in onset, mild in intensity. The heaviness or dragging sensation aggravated on lifting weight cuffing, standing or walking for long distance and was relieved by rest or sitting or lying down position. At workplace was present as he was a construction worker by occupation. No history of chronic cuff, difficulty in micturation or defecation. Patient is also known case of coronary artery disease and hypertension for the past 11 months on regular medication. He gives history of chest pain 11 months back. Following this, he was hospitalized and percutaneous coronary intervention was done with placement of one drug eluting stent. 
there was no history of similar complaints after that episode no complaints of chest pain palpitation syncope breathlessness on exertion or breathlessness on lying down or swelling in the legs he also didn't give history of any weakness in the limb increased or decreased frequency of maturation or facial edema at the time of previous hospitalization he was diagnosed with hypertension and is on medication regularly for the past 11 months no history of diabetes mellitus tuberculosis jaundice seizure disorder thyroid disease or covid-19 in the past he was vaccinated with two doses of covaxin no history of known allergy or any surgery in the past or significant treatment history other than these treatment history at present is on tablet enalapril 5 mg once daily tablet metoprolol 25 mg twice daily tablet aspirin 75 mg once daily tablet clopidogrel 75 mg once daily tablet atorvastatin 40 mg once daily personal history he is a construction worker by occupation he has a mixed diet was a smoker for the past 20 years who smoked half pack of cigarette per day he stopped one year ago he is a non alcoholic bowel and bladder habits are within normal limits socio economic status he belonged to lower middle class according to modified kupuswami scale family history his father died to some heart related ailment 5 years back no history of diabetes mellitus cerebrovascular accident or kidney disease running in the family ma'am shall i proceed to examination yeah just a few points here before you proceed haan ji ma'am first as you discussed previously also you should never say no history of you should say no history suggestive of because the patient will not say that i have diabetes very very rarely will the patient be you know so uh, well read or informed to be able to give you a diagnosis you always say history suggestive of and we can see till now that what he has been he has elicited a very good history from the patient a good job there and we can see that this patient had a cardiac event which was successfully managed by uh, a stenting and then he has been also uh, put on uh, medical management now let us see what are the sign uh, after the symptoms let us see what are the signs of the disease that we have in this patient please go ahead sir vinan uh, yes ma'am general physical examination after getting concerned the patient was examined patient was conscious cooperative well oriented to time place and person weight was about 60 kg height 168 cm with bmi of 21.3 kg per meter square no pallor ictus sinuses clubbing lymphadenopathy or edema he is afebrile by touch vitals pulse rate 68 per minute regular in rhythm good in volume normal character no pulse deficit no radio radial or radio femoral delay all peripheral pulses are palpable and no arterial wall abnormality blood pressure 124 by 72 mm of mercury in right upper arm measured in sitting position jvp was not raised respiratory rate 14 per minute it was regular and abdominal thoracic he is able to do normal household activities and able to climb two flight of stairs meds greater than 4 airway assessment no gross external facial deformity present no bilateral nares were equally patent no deviated nasal septum mouth oral hygiene good mouth opening of three fingers no loose or artificial or buck teeth modified malampati class 1 upper lip bite test class 1 airway assessment uh, neck movement normal and full range sternomental thyromental and hyomental distance within normal limits neck circumference 36 cm at the level of thyroid cartilage examination of the spine inspection no obvious deformity present no visible swelling scar sinus or pulsation present palpation a febrile to touch and there was no tenderness abdominal examination on inspection shape of the abdomen was scaphoid umbilicus central and normal in shape no visible scar or palpation pulsation on palpation a febrile to touch soft non tender no guarding or rigidity and no palpable organomegaly on percussion tympanic note present in all nine abdominal quadrants on auscultation bowel sounds heard local examination of the swelling on inspection a right inguinous scrotal pyriform shaped swelling measuring 10 cross 6 cm reaching up to the scrotum was present swelling appears smooth skin over the swelling is normal no visible scar or pulsation the swelling reduced completely on lying down 
cuff impulse was present and the penis was deviated to the left side on palpation it was not or not warm or not tender the shape was piriform size 11 cross 8 cross 4 cm it is soft in consistency expansile and cuffing and completely reduced and uh, both testes were felt separately and i cannot get above the swelling zeman test elicited impulse felt over the superficial ring on percussion the swelling had a dull note and on auscultation no peristalsis sound heard over the swelling systemic examination cardiovascular system examination on inspection chest wall was bilaterally symmetrical in shape no visible swelling scar or pulsation there was no precordial bulge on palpation inspectory findings were confirmed apex beat at the left fifth intercostal space half a centimeter medial to the midclavicular line no thrill parasternal heave on auscultation heart rate was found to be 68 per minute and was regular in rhythm first heart sound and second heart sound appeared normal and no murmur was heard respiratory system uh on inspection shape of the chest was normal bilateral chest movements uh, equal tell me if there is normal. any positive finding in respiratory system no ma'am respiratory system is with normal limits okay so rest central nervous system examination with the normal limits okay right actually mm -hmm. we are short of time sarvanan i think let's yeah come to the diagnosis now very good the diagnosis uh 60 year old male with a right inguinal hernia is hypertension post percutaneous coronary intervention 11 months back is posted for surgery uh, tap surgery ma'am total extra preperitoneal extra peritoneal surgery for hernia repair all right very good now what are the risk factors in this patient what are the red flags in this patient one you have already said coronary artery disease hypertension and post pci in your history and examination were you able to elicit something else which could be a risk factor in these patients ma'am he was a chronic smoker also but he stopped one year ago okay so and chronic smoking that sequela remains so we are worried about that although he has stopped a year back so that which is good anything else ma'am his age advancing age yes is one risk factor Yes, is also a risk factor. Very good. Now, uh, can you tell me what all investigations would you want in such a patient? Mm, yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, first I'll ask for a baseline hemogram mm -hmm. uh, to know the hemoglobin of the patient, so he's not anemic or not. I wanted to know. Then I will order so kidney. Is that the only reason why you want to know whether the patient is anemic or not? What is the cutoff mm -hmm. of hemoglobin that we generally take? Mem ten grams per deciliter. Is that not anemia for a young man like you? But we always take up at ten. It would be ten would be anemic for this patient also. But we take a patient at ten. Why do we keep a tap cut off of ten? Um, uh, below that uh, oxygen availability will be decreased. Below critical cut off will be less. So the stress of the surgery could not be met. so see the reason for taking 10 is the concept of optimal hematocrit blood we classically say that blood is a non newtonian fluid that means that as the uh, see normally what would happen the flow rate follows the law of physics but blood does not follow the law of physics so what happens here is that um, as we increase the hemoglobin content or we as the number of rbcs keep increase Saying we assume that the oxygen delivery to the tissues should also increase, right? But what happens when the number of RBCs increase disproportionately? The blood becomes more viscous and the flow becomes sluggish. So what is happening? Even though the number of RBCs in supposedly hemoglobin content and oxygen carrying capacity is increasing, but because the blood is becoming more viscous, the oxygen delivery to the tissues becomes hampered because of the low slow or slow flow. So. as you seen in poly as you seen in polycythemia so 10 is that hematocrit or hemoglobin level at which there is a perfect balance between the oxygen tissue delivery and the hemoglobin content so that is why we always take 10 even though it is anemic in a patient with cad you have to ensure that the patient is above dash gram percent of hemoglobin how much is that of course 10 is 
minimum of 8 gram per deciliter is required 8 gram is required and that is also your trigger for calculating allowable blood loss when you are taking up a patient for surgery okay right. so you'll ask for a complete hemogram what else and then i'll ask for a renal function test specifically uh creatinine serum creatinine i will ask okay why that why is that so ma'am i want to risk satisfy my patient and uh, i will be using rcri score and one of the component of it is uh, serum creatinine greater than 2 mg per deciliter when are you happy like when will you think that this patient is at low risk at what creatinine level on above what creatinine level will you get upset two or anything other, anything less than that ma'am two what do the other multivariate indices take creatinine value as um Mm, one point two mica index takes one point two serum creatinine cutoff. So anything above one point one is a red flag for us. Okay. okay. Right. Okay. Tell me now. You've said uh, hemoglobin, a uh, hemogram, uh, blood count. You've said KFT, uh, KFTs. What else? Mm, Ma'am, I would like to have a baseline twenty dCG. Yes. Anything Any else? Your biochemical profile, blood investigations. What do you uh, routinely ask for? Ma'am, routinely we have order a hemogram, kidney function test, liver function test, and coagulation profile in my institute. You don't ask for blood sugar? Ma'am, um, random blood sugar is one. Yes, that's so important. Yes, ma'am. Diabetes mellitus is again one of your components of RCRI. And why do you yes, want to ask for a liver function test? Liver function test is not a part of routine investigations at all. None of the uh, recommendations for preoperative advice ask for LFT as a mandatory. And why do you want to go for a uh, coagulation profile? Um, BTCT. I wanted to know because patient is on antiplatelet drugs, and uh, if patient plan for regional anesthesia, I want What to. The... No. no. Will will antiplatelet drugs do they really do do aspirin and clopidogrel really affect the uh, bleeding time? there is a lot of controversy regarding that and most literature now supports supports that the uh, in vitro testing is not affected so you may have a seemingly apparently normal bleeding time and a in vivo raised uh, bleeding profile coagulation uh, alteration with platelets so it is not recommended that you go for a btct okay so you should not look into that So basically, you are going to look at a. You will look at a hemo complete hemogram. You will look at a urine routine microscopy. You will look at a blood sugar, which is very important. You look at KFT specifically, serum creatinine, as a preoperative this thing. And for cardiac evaluation, you will go for as you wanted to, uh, as you very correctly said, a twelve lead ECG. Any other uh, investigations? Would you like any more cardiac investigations? No, no, ma'am. Okay, so we'll come to that later. Let's just speak a little bit more about your history. Now, I just want to say one thing in the history that you must always ask for, especially in our Indian scenario, is in the drug history you should ask about whether the patient is taking any herbal medication or not. Now, in a cardiac patient uh, who comes to non-cardiac surgery, it becomes very important that many. Uh, patients are taking herbal medicines which contain drugs like herbal medications like ginseng garlic ginkgo now all these they become important to us you, you, you know you you will come across so many of these whatsapp messages that have these many garlic uh, pods in a day and your blood gets cleared and all that now this becomes important for us because they can lead to contribute to increased bleeding risk in the perioperative period all these herbal medicines have this problem so if they are on these herbal medications one you should find out two they should be mandatorily stop discontinued at least two weeks before surge so that is one thing you need to look into now you talked about uh, is, uh, in your examination a very important very important part is assessment of functional capacity so you talk you said that the patient had meds more than uh, oh. four right So, what do you mean by met? Yes, ma'am. Met is metabolic equivalent of a task. 
and it is defined as uh, oxygen consumption by a 70 kg male 40 year old male at rest which is uh, 3.5 ml per kg per minute okay. so very good now correct answer now the if you look at the activities that the duke activity index does they are kind of arbitrary we, we call it a self assessment by the patient the patient is saying yes i can do it are there any other uh, better more objective methods by which you can assess the functional capacity of a patient yes ma'am we can do cardiopulmonary exercise testing in order to very objectify good. very good and then uh, stress uh, stress echo uh, stress ecg no 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 i'm just talking in your examination examination apart from your cardiopulmonary exercise testing a very for that you need a whole equipment machine and everything a and very six minute way. walk test yes very good six minute walk test you should never forget these are very important things that you must always answer in your viva these are very useful tests they are objective tests and they give a better assessment of your functional capacity now you might just say that when you talk about things like cardiopulmonary exercise testing you know and stress echo or stress ecg they have Uh, very significant concerns of precipitating an ischemic attack in a patient with a uh, CAD. So it's very important to remember whenever you are doing such testing, there should be continuous ECG monitoring while doing uh, cardiopulmonary testing as well as frequent blood pressure uh, monitoring whenever you are taking a patient for cardiopulmonary exercise test. Right. So this is a very important point that should be considered. now coming to the investigations you they have been answering very well good job uh, in investigations yes you said 12 lead ecg but that may not be enough you may need to have a more uh, a better evaluation because ecg sometimes does not give a complete picture it has only 60% sensitivity right so okay. an echocardiography becomes a very important uh, investigation in these patients and what can you tell me about stress ecg what was previously known as tmt would you like to go for this in this patient ma'am um, no ma'am i would not go for this why because my patient mets is greater than 4 and uh, his uh, risk index uh, for major adverse cardiac event is less than 1% mm -hmm. so according to guidelines uh, there is no need for further cardiac evaluation for my patient uh which 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 uh, guideline are you quoting ma'am acc aha 2014 guidelines okay so you see we understand that the guideline does say that uh, you are not supposed to go for uh, stress ecg uh, however it that also depends upon the type of surgery that you are going for always keep that in mind so here for this surgery yes you are you are very correct when you are saying that but the investigations have to be uh, titrated to two things the risk of surgery and the cardiac risk both okay so then we go to echocardiography what about echocardiography would you like to go for an echocardiography in this patient mm -hmm. He has his old echo report, so I think it's of uh, six months ago. He has taken. Okay. I so would you like will... to repeat it? No. Very good. So if there is no fresh changes, a uh, report within one year is acceptable. You only go for a fresh echocardiography. <laughs> Excuse me. In a patient who has <clears throat> either a dyspnea of unknown origin. a heart failure patient whose dyspnea gets worsened or a patient who was clinically stable who had no previously documented lv dysfunction <clears throat> with sorry with previously documented lv dysfunction of can you tell me the echocardiography report of this patient can you put that up and do you have it yes ma'am i have it right uh, it was taken on may 22 uh, 
and uh, he had normal chamber dimensions regional wall motion abnormality was present in the anterior wall mild mitral regurgitation he had ejection fraction of 40 to 45 percent grade one left ventricular diastolic dysfunction and no clots or vegetations were seen okay so what do you mean by ejection fraction <clears throat> mm, ma'am left ventricular uh, ejection fraction cardiac output cardiac output it's not cardiac output <clears throat> ma'am volume of blood ejected by the ventricle during systole stroke volume it is the stroke volume upon the end diastolic volume okay no it is very important all of you to understand that ejection fraction is a number which can be extremely misleading indicator of lv function now when i am saying that it is the fraction of stroke volume upon end diastolic volume now how that becomes very important if the patient has a low end diastolic volume which happens classically in hokum you know what is hokum hypertrophic obstructive no, cardiomyopathy in that patient what's going to happen because of the hypertrophy the end diastolic volume per se is low patient has a good contractility the stroke volume is good so we have a a not a falsely high ejection fraction does that ejection fraction give you an indicator of lv function it does not so one has to look at ejection fraction as a ratio where both the numerator and denominator can affect the value always remember this now this becomes extremely important in a patient with a valvular abnormality very often you will come across hyper of 40% and you're thinking okay 45% 40% patient it's a big mess patient is not responding well because what is happening in the mitral regurgitation the mitral regurgitation is a that's making the valves incompetent so what is happening here is that the heart is trying to push out the blood eject out the blood some is going out and the sum of the blood is falling back into the uh, am i audible yes ma'am now you are audible yes ma'am sorry we lost your connection in between when did you lose my connection i was just going on speaking ma'am you started to talk about mitral regurgitation happening so basically uh, we have to understand that in valvular lesions also because the blood then comes back there is a change change in the and diastolic volume and the stroke volume so you will have the, the fraction will not remain the same because the end diastolic volume becomes more and your stroke volume remains the same so what is happening the numerator is the same the denominator is more so the value is now falsely high am i audible i mean numerator is more denominator is less numerator is less denominator is more so what is going to happen you have a false no value so when the regurgitation becomes lesser the ef raises so i am just trying to make you understand that there are more factors there are two factors it is the numerator and denominator both that are affecting the ejection fraction you should and it is famous oh e 
is 45, my patient is going to fare well. If my ejection fraction is 25, my patient is not going to fare well. Now look at grade one diastolic dysfunction. What does that mean? Ma'am, the ventricles are not able to pump out all the blood. Um, so no. what is okay? Um, Your ejection fraction is giving you this systolic function, right? It is a, a indicator of the left ventricular systolic function. What does the diastolic function tell you? Ma'am, it is a ratio. It is also a ratio. It is uh, early by late diastole will be calculated. So it is very important to understand that the diastolic dysfunction usually precedes the development of a left ventricular systolic function. And it is an indicator of the, uh, uh, it's a very strong predictor of the um, left atrial function actually, because uh, of the left, it's like when you look at left ventricular, of the left ventricular uh, end diastolic volume, whereas diastolic function is a measure of the left end diastolic pressure. It's a surrogate for your left atrial volume. So it tells us two things. It tells us whether the patient will be able to tolerate the preload well or not. If a patient has a grade one diastolic or a grade two diastolic dysfunction, the patient will be having trouble in handling the preload. And it is also a predictor of development of atrial fibrillation in these patients. So just remember like grade diastolic dysfunction becomes very important for us. For the anesthesiologist, more than for the cardiologist because we are the ones who are handling the fluid shift. So this becomes a, an extremely, extremely important uh, factor for us to look into. All right? Are okay. you with me on that? Anjali. Okay. So what are the other types of We talk. You can tell me about. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, ma'am. Can you repeat? Sorry. Is my voice cracking? Ma'am, it's better now. It's better now. Okay, I will try to change my connection also. Anji, ma'am. Oh, my connection is showing very good strength, but I will still try to change the connection. Okay, ma'am. Ma'am, it's better now. It's better now? Anjali. Okay. okay, so uh, now my question was, what are the other types of preoperative cardiac investigations? Would you like to go for some any other preoperative cardiac investigations? Not in this patient, but in any other patient. Ma'am, we can ask for a stress CCG, stress echography if yes. needed. Yes. Then we can ask uh, the old angiogram report which my patient has. We can that yes. may be indicated. Yes, very good, very good. One should always ask for so that you come to know. Then recently, a few more in advanced testing has come out. One is cardiac MRI with you know the with the advent of COVID. Now more and more cardiologists are going for cardiac MRI, and they feel that it is a very good technique to assess wall motion abnormalities in ischemic patients. And they give you a specified location of the myocardial perfusion. Then similarly, nuclear cardiac, uh, cardiac imaging. That is also coming up in a big way. So these are two things. If you're asked in the exam, what are the recent changes? What are the recently uh, you know, preferred investigations? So the nuclear cardiac imaging and cardiac MRI are two investigations that are gaining a lot of popularity amongst cardiologists. In fact, a lot of patients post-COVID were diagnosed to have myocardial insult by cardiac MRI when stress, eco, and ECG were failing. Okay, tell me one thing. Would you like to go for a biomarker estimation in the preoperative period? Yes, we can ask for a cardiac uh, BNP level and anti-pro-BNP level also. Which yeah. one would you prefer? I'm anti-pro-BNP. Uh, anti Why so? Um, uh, actually, it, the level of anti-pro and BNP rises three to four times more than BNP level, even for a small infarct or a failure. So it is more sensitive when compared to BNP.
go for a nt pro brp pre operatively ma'am again your voice cracked i'm sorry so what are the patient can you hear me now ha uh, ma'am which is the patient profile in which you would like to go for a pre operative biomarker estimation i'm um, patient with history of congestive heart failure or we can ask patient with a recent mi or posted for very high risk surgery we can ask for biomarkers so you see no there are specific uh, indications for this routinely neither is a pro nt bnp or a troponin testing recommended however in high risk patients like patients who have mets less than 4 Uh, or with an RCI index of one, if you are going for a vascular surgery, or an RCRI index of more than two for a non-vascular surgery. Now these are the indications where you. This is the this is the patient profile in which you will go for a pre-operative biomarker estimation. In two thousand seventeen, a few more uh, indications were added, which are easier to remember, uh, which is that patient with an age more than equal to sixty-five years of age. RCRI more than equal to one, or age between forty-five to sixty-four years, but with significant cardiovascular disease. So it is recommended that in this profile of patient, that is age more than equal to sixty-five, RCRI one, or more age forty-five to sixty-four with significant cardiovascular disease. These are the patients in which you will go for a P as well as troponin. Before as well as forty to seventy two hours, forty eight to seventy two hours after the surgery. So this is very important to know, as a uh, can be asked very easily in your exam. These are important, very important points to know. Okay. Right. So how would you like to? What would your patient be in? Uh, would you like to do a risk stratification for your patient? Mm, yes, ma'am. What um, risk? Uh, what what be his RS RCRI index? Ma'am, my patient RCRI score is one. Yes, good. So okay. tell me, what are the other RC? Which are the other ways by which you can? Ma'am, um, again, sorry, I lost your connection. What is the full form of RCRI? Ma'am, um, revised cardiac risk index. Yes, very good. And what are the other risk indices that are commonly used? Ma'am, um, others we can use uh, American uh, College of Surgeons NSQIP scale, mm -hmm. a National Surgical Quality Improvement. plan then yes. uh, we have gupta's mica risk index okay so what is the advantage of one over the other ma'am uh, the other two are web based tools and it has more number of parameters compared to rcri they are more sensitive, they are more sensitive and they tend to be uh, you can stop your screen sharing now you can uh, you don't need to see anything but the advantage of this is that they are uh, more surgery specific and they are much uh, more sensitive tools okay so now we have to take up this patient for tap what will be your pre operative advice in this patient uh, yes ma'am first and my consent ma'am uh, first i will write uh, consent uh, written informed consent should be taken you will then take i will write consent in this patient Ma'am, I will inform the risk associated with the surgery. Also, risk of perioperative MI should be explained to the patient. So, And, what is uh, the risk involved in this surgery? Not perioperative MI and. Ma'am, there may be risk of uh, ventricular fibrillation. There may be arrhythmias, cardiac arrest, pulmonary edema, arrhythmias. congestive heart failure so we are looking at three very important things that you must understand perioperative mi perioperative chf and perioperative arrhythmias and we should be ready to take care of them very good so we have taken consent next am i read npo orders okay next then uh, i will add 
I'll tell the patient to continue his antihypertensive medications on day of surgery. So, what antihypertensive is the patient on? I'm currently he's on beta blocker. Then he is taking angiotensin converting enzyme. He's then he's also in allopril also. Um, then he is on antiplatelet drugs, clopidogrel, mm -hmm. which should be stopped five to seven days before surgery. I will tell him to stop. Then statins can be continued on the day of surgery with sips of water. Okay. Now you wanted to continue your ACE inhibitor. Yes, ma'am. So what can you tell me about the latest recommendations? Um, regarding ACE inhibitors and surgery. 2016 ACCHA guidelines, uh, it tells like it is reasonable to continue uh, AC ARB inhibitors on day of surgery unless we expect massive fluid shift or we expect uh, sudden episodes of hypotension in the surgery, it is not advisable. Very good, very good. And it has been now a lot of literature contributes that hypotension contrib by because of the uh, ACE inhibitors is usually very responsive to fluids. So it can be easily tackled. And the risk of the cardiac risk of withholding is much more. Very no. good. Right. So supposing the patient was not on beta blockers, <clears throat> would you like to start the beta blockers? Mm, yes, ma'am. I will start and target heart rate 60 to 80 beats per minute. However, I will start it at least one week before surgery. Not 60 to 80. What are you saying? 60 target to 70. Not it's 50 to 60 beats without significant hypotension. Okay, okay I'm sorry. Right? And when will you like to start? Um, at least one week before surgery, I would like to start. Uh, so there is a lot of controversy on that, but most literature says that two to seven days before, it should be not started acutely. It should be started at least 24 hours before elective surgery. And beta blockers are very useful drugs because they have anti ischemic, they have anti hypertensive, and they have anti dysrhythmic properties. So they should be continued and they should not be stopped. And Most more virtual and very, very confusing part is your dual antiplatelet drugs. There's a lot of, let us try to clarify the, you know, air regarding that. Now, we, what are the types of antiplatelet drugs that are available? Can you just tell me a briefly about those? Yes, ma'am. First, we have a COX-1 inhibitor, which will inhibit thromboxane A2, that is aspirin. Okay. Then we have P2 white well receptor inhibitor. Mm -hmm. which is uh, Ticlopidin, Clopidogrel, Prasugrel. Mm -hmm. Then we have uh, uh, GP2B3A inhibitor, which is Apsiximab, Eptifibatide and Tyrofiban. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we have uh, Platelet Protease uh, Activated Receptor Inhibitor. Mm -hmm. Nine. A simpler way to remember is whether by their mode of action. So we have irreversible blockers and platelet blockers and we have the reversible ones. So in the irreversible, we have your aspirin, your clopidogrel, your pasogrel and reversible becomes your canulil and your ticagrel. Now the, it is very important to know through their mode of action more than anything else. And what is available in your setup is also extremely important and why, why did you say that we need to omit them for five to seven days before surgery? Why not two to three days? Ma'am, uh, because lifespan of the platelet is five to seven days. So the drug will be acting till the platelet is alive. Right. So 80% will have recovered their normal function by the time because new platelets are being formed. Uh, so this works for all except for one drug. The five to seven rule works for all except for no. Any drug which is a longer duration of action? Prasugril. Right? So, and when do you need to stop Prasugril? Um, 7 to 10 days before. Yeah, so 10 days. 10 days is what we need. Okay. Now, any drug that you can, which has a shorter duration of action and that can be used, you know, uh, as a bridging therapy? 
So we can use Kangrel or hmm. it has very, very short duration of action. Which is Usually, how much? What is the duration of action? Ma'am, four to six hours. So it needs to be discontinued. Uh, yes, yes ma'am. Six hours prior surgery. At least six hours prior. Surgery. Yes, it needs to be discontinued six hours, and its duration of action is around time from last dose to offset of action is just sixty minutes. It's not six hours. So okay. you, you take a duration, right? So uh, if you need to do a bridging therapy, then your drug of choice becomes. Angry Lord. Angry Lord. Very good. So, when you are looking at stopping a dual antiplatelet, what all factors are you looking at? Ma'am, I will check whether my patient is more prone for bleeding or he is more prone for thrombosis. And I have to look whether it is a low risk surgery or high risk surgery. Then. Uh, How do you classify a surgery as a high risk or a low risk? Ma'am. Um, any surgery into vascular compartment or a major abdominal cavity will be termed as high risk surgery. And uh, low risk surgery will involve superficial lesions. Fixation of superficial lesions will be low risk surgery. So you look at another factor also when you are looking at stopping a DAPT. You very correctly said you look into the risk of bleeding, the risk of thromboembolism. You also look into very importantly. What is the urgency of the surgery? Okay, that becomes a very important factor too. Right? Anjani. Anna? So, can you define what is an urgent surgery? What is an emergency surgery? Is there any difference between an emergency surgery or an urgent surgery? Um, emergency surgery should be done within 24 hours. Within six hours, uh, urgent surgery is less than six hours, emergency is up to 24 hours. And time, time sensitive is this when we can allow delay of up to one six week weeks. to allow for evaluation, one to six weeks for evaluation. Right? Okay. So, this is also what we have to look into when we are looking at discontinuation of DAPTs. Now, supposing it's an uh, emergency surgery, right? And patient has had a stent, uh, say, uh, just two months back. Then, would you like to get with the surgery? Um, if it is an emergency surgery, I will discuss the risk benefit with the surgeon. And if it should be proceeded, I will proceed only taking care of uh, man. Will you stop your DAPT? Mm. No, ma'am. I will consider bridging therapy if the risk of thrombosis is more. What do you mean by bridging therapy? Ma'am, I will. Uh, Stop, withhold the antiplatelet at least five to seven days before surgery and before so three days. Emergency day. surgery. You're getting okay, emergency. I mean, I will proceed only. Okay, let I me will... make things easier for you. Let's talk about elective surgery first, then we'll talk. Now, supposing if it's a patient has had two months with the surgery. Sarvanan, can you hear me? Ma'am, now only I can hear you. Sorry again. Yeah, so I'm saying you have a patient who is posted for an elective surgery. Yes, ma'am. It's been two months since the drug eluting stent has been placed. Would you like to go ahead with the surgery? No, ma'am, I'll postpone the surgery for at least six months. Okay. If the patient, like in your patient, it's been, what, 11 months? Ah, ma'am. Can you go ahead with the for an elective surgery? Yes, ma'am. I can proceed with an surgery. Very good. Now, what would you like to do for your DAPTs? Would you ma like? I will hmm. stop the DAPT, DAPT before surgery. Both aspirin as well as. No, ma'am. Aspirin can be continued in the perioperative period. Yes. Uh, 
regardless of the timing of surgery, the guidelines recommend continuing at least aspirin throughout the perioperative period and ideally continuing DAPT unless the surgery demands discontinuation. So you can stop your clopid, but aspirin should be continued. And when can you resume your clopid? Ma'am, uh, after 24 hours, after a surgical hemostasis has been achieved, we can yes. restart clopidogrel. Yes. And it is important to remember that at that time you go for a loading dose, not the dose with which the patient was previously taking. Because there has been a break now, you have to give the loading dose, right? Okay. So, so, for how long should you delay an elective surgery? Um, after drug eluting sent, six months yes, at least. Yes. After six months. Minimum yes. of six so months. Have been now changed. It is important to remember that. Okay, right. So this is regarding your elective surgery. Now let us let us think of a situation where we are going for a uh, emergency surgery. Shall we talk about an emergency surgery now? Thank you. Right. Patient comes with say a strangulated hernia. The same patient comes with a strangulated hernia. Patient is on DOPT. What will you do? Ma'am, I will explain the risk, perioperative risk of bleeding. Hmm. Then uh, I will continue with the surgery only. And I'll assess the risk benefit with the surgeon if he wants but to proceed. Of course, we have no other option but to continue. This is an emergency surgery. It's a strangulated bowel. What will you do about your DAPTs? Ma'am, patient would have already taken the dose. So I will continue with the surgery. I will ask uh, to arrange platelets during the intra period if needed, then I will proceed with the surgery. Patient has taken his aspirin and clopid a day before. Today morning he has not taken anything. He is nil per oral. So he will, that becomes one day gap for you. Okay. Now supposing this was a patient who had a high risk of bleeding, then what will you do? It was some other mm -hmm. surgery. Patient comes with an emergency surgery with a very high risk of bleeding. Then what will you do? We can transfuse platelets before surgical incision. Very good. Anything else to do? Mm. A can very simple for thing is to give Ma'am? Trenexa. Ah, Trenexic acid. Trenexa. Is there any timing that's important? I'm um, sorry, ma'am. When will you prefer to give uh, platelets? Ma'am, before surgical incision, at least before. No, no, no. Before the surgical incision, or is it correlated with the time of intake of your drugs? Mm, sorry, ma'am. I don't know the answer not to time it with the surgical incision but with the time since the patient took the uh, your DAPTs. So if you are planning to give platelet transfusion that you make sure that at least 2 hours has elapsed after aspirin and 12 to 24 hours after clopid. Some literature says after 4 hours but there is universal agreement on this that their platelet transfusion is most effective when given after 12 hours mind otherwise you are just simply wasting your platelet uh, infusion right so we have a lot of clarity now about you know how we are going to be proceeding with your DAPTs and when will we be timing our surgery well done good job on your answers Sarvanan keep it up now tell me when now that you're all set to take up this patient for uh, surgery what will be your anesthetic goals what will you keep in mind when you're giving anesthesia we are assuming general goal. anesthesia. Thank you. My main goal is to maintain the myocardial oxygen supply and demand ratio. So right. I will avoid any tachycardia or bradycardia, hypotension or hypertension. I will maintain normothermia. I will maintain normocapnia. Then Excellent. So tell me what is your induction agent of choice? I will like to go with etomidate 0 0.2 to 0 0.6 mg per kilogram. Right. Very good. And what else will you take care during induction? 
Um, during induction, I will slowly give the drug and titrate it according to the patient. And? In, uh, laryngoscopy should be gentle, less than 15 seconds. And okay. I can attenuate the pressure response to laryngoscopy with the drug such as lignocaine, I can. What give. is the dose of lignocaine? Ma'am, 1.5 mg per kg, at least 90 seconds before intubation. Very good. And what else? You can use lignocaine. What else can you use? I can give uh, a small oil. Mm -hmm. Then other beta blockers like uh, labetalol, metoprolol. Magnesium sulfate also can are be not used. recommended. No, no, labetalol is not recommended. What are metoprolol, you saying? Metoprolol. Why, why do you want to give long acting for a something that's going to last an episode that's going to last few minutes you never give long acting you only give esmolol give tell me some other agents that um, generate the pressure response to laryngoscopy magnesium sulfate 40 milligram per kg can be okay used. okay and we can use induction agent like propofol 10 to 20 mg bolus at least 10 you to want to first use etomidate not use propofol and then you want to use propofol you can deepen the plane of anesthesia bioinhalational agents. Hanji. Right? You can use nitrates. You can use calcium channel blockers. Okay. okay. Right. So in maintenance of anesthesia, what would you prefer? An opioid-based anesthesia or an inhalational-based anesthesia? Would you prefer a TIVA or would you prefer inhalational-based? What would be your choice? I mean, in my institute, we use uh, inhalation induction of in, inhalational maintenance only. We will use mixture of oxygen, nitrous, and uh, sevoflurane for maintenance of anesthesia, topped up with opioids with bolus of opioids. If given the choice, what would you prefer, and why? Um, um, so, um, inhalation agents, ma'am. As such, there's no preference for uh, tiva or inhalation agent. Opioid is supposed to be most uh, hemodynamically stable. Opioid based okay. anesthesia is supposed to be most hemodynamically stable. But if your institute is giving inhalational agent, I'm sure they must be doing it with a reason. So you see that both have their pros and cons. Opioid based anesthesia has its con of being providing excellent hemodynamic stability. But with inhalational agents, we have something which is called ischemic preconditioning. Are you aware of what is ischemic preconditioning? Mm, yes, ma'am. What is that? Um, it is a process by which a part of myocardium can be rendered resistant to ischemia by a brief period of occlusion of the vessel. Yes, very good. The myocardium remains protected after a period after withdrawal even of the stimulus. This is called memory of preconditioning. So this is a wonderful uh, way to safeguard the patient who is a patient of coronary artery disease. And it's, there, have, there has been extensive work that has showed that volatile agents actually protect the heart from ischemic myocardial injury. So this will become a very important beneficial uh, benefit in our patients. Okay. So okay. now you've understood. Thank you. Why we prefer inhalational agents. Now, what all monitoring would you like to go for in the intraoperative period? And I will use standard ASA2 monitors, uh, ECG monitoring, blood pressure monitoring, pulse oximetry, temperature monitoring, and uh, end tidal carbon dioxide. What monitoring. would you look? What would? How would you use your ECG? I'm um, ECG, preferably five lead ECG will be used for this patient, and lead two and lead five should be monitored continuously in the period yes so you have to look at lead 5 becomes a very important uh, lead for us go for st segment analysis you should that is very important that you make sure that you have your st segment analysis is on and what are you looking for here what are you looking for in the ecg ma'am i will look for uh, perioperative rhythm disturbances i can look for new onset st elevation st depression okay very good. Now, supposing you do land up with, you know, a significant ST segment change, what are you going to do now? Um, um, first, I will see whether it is associated whether with any hemodynamic instability. Very good. 
then i will first type um, uh, i will titrate my fio2 so that i will target saturation greater than 95% then uh, if uh, your saturation there will be no change in saturation with an st segment your patient is not hypoxic saturation okay. is 98 99 your everything is fine but you have an st segment change a significant more than say 2 mm change okay ma'am so you very correctly said you will take care of your uh, hemodynamics you will make sure that any hypertension or tachycardia if there is present is corrected because that is probably causing the insult then rather than increasing the oxygen you will rather deepen the plane if you increase the oxygen fio2 you don't need it that is not the problem the problem is your hypertension and tachycardia you've got to make sure the depth is adequate so you will give either inhalational agents or opioids or beta blockers whatever you need and you will deepen the plane of anesthesia now you okay. deepen the plane of anesthesia your hypertension is also corrected the bp has come to normal the tachycardia is also settled but now your changes are persisting what will you do next ma'am then i will give good analgesics in the opioids i can give opioids what you given i'm saying we've already deepened you've given opioids no better than nothing no analgesic better than opioids the scheme is persisting what will you do you've read about uh, intraoperative stemis mm -hmm. so you will add something that increases the blood supply to the heart nitrates nitrates we can start the patient on nitrates okay you will add nitrates very good so this is how what can happen if you have any specific arrhythmia you will change you will take care of that arrhythmia as per the uh, standard treatment uh, modalities now tell me one thing uh, apart from the standard asa monitoring would you like some other monitoring ma'am my patient is of low risk category so i will continue only the patient was a major risk uh, major surgery with lot of fluid shifts and all That. i'll go for invasive arterial line monitoring okay. very good very good you can go for invasive arterial blood pressure cvp uh where all would you like to go for a pulmonary artery catheterization any specific indication for pulmonary artery catheterization mm, we can have it for a patient of a known case of congestive heart failure or yes, uh, and patients on when else will fail your cvp will not be a good guide in a patient with a cardiomyopathy so in those patients we go for a pulmonary artery catheterization very good excellent right so you can also go for a transesophageal echocardiography it's very helpful in high risk patients and it helps to detect ischemia and ventricular dysfunction and fluid status also can you come to know through te and you come to know of it very fast so it's a very good uh, intraoperative uh, monitoring when you have high risk patients with major surgery right so uh, you manage your case fine extubation anything you would like to take care of during extubation yes ma'am again i wanted to avoid uh, any tachycardia or hypertension during extubation right so we can again supplement with the short acting opioids during extubation and uh, i will have a smooth extubation so you know we are always worried about two things at the time of extubation we want a smooth extubation but we also want at the same time that the patient should wake up uh, awake with you know good reflexes and good spontaneous respiration so at that time it is a good idea that you can use short acting beta blockers like esmolol right so that will take care of the hemodynamics and also make give you an awake patient so that becomes a better choice and we don't have opioids like remifentanil if we had remifentanil then yes we could have used those but for us as of now a beta block like esmolol may be a better idea so what all post op advice will you have for your patient ma'am post op i will write uh, adequate analgesia should be maintained then uh, normothermia should be maintained even in the post operative period then uh, i will uh, if patient is a high risk i will also advise continuous ecg monitoring also in the post operative period if available it is not available it is 
mandatory to have continued ECG monitoring in the post-operative period for such a patient. Okay. And do you know the reason for that? Why I'm emphasizing on that? Ma'am, because perioperative MI is also very common. The, mo the co most common time when a patient will have MI is not in the interoperative period. It was generally in the post-operative period. Post period, in the first 48 hours. So this is a very critical time for you. And at this time, you must have a patient who's pain-free, well-oxygenated, warm patient uh, with who is undergoing continuous vigilant monitoring. Now, when you say pain-free, you know, with you said you yourself said good analgesia. I'm also saying good analgesia. It has the advantage that it will not cause hypertension and tachycardia, but it has the disadvantage that because of good analgesia, sometimes a patient, the MI can be, my post-op MI can be missed. So thus the need for a continuous ECG monitoring in these patients. Now, okay. can you tell me what is MINS? M-I-N-S, myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it is uh, defined as uh, signs of uh, myocardial ischemia associated uh, with uh, uh, rise in serum troponin levels in greater than 99th percentile. There should be rise and fall. And also there will be evidence of myocardial infarction like uh, ECG changes, Q waves in ECG, ST elevation or depression or uh, in echocardiography patient may have uh, uh, wall motion abnormal. So MILS is basically a very unusual situation where you will have troponin elevation, but the classic signs and symptoms or even the ECG findings suggestive of ischemia may not be present. Okay. So this is what is different from myocardial infarction in the post-operative period. Now, this is mostly, as I said, it's a silent injury. And it is very strongly associated with mortality. And the risk factor for this is not your hypertension and tachycardia. It is the intraoperative and postoperative hypotension, which is associated with MINS. Okay. So, again, we had, there is a lot of uh, controversy that should you be doing a post-operative troponin surveillance? Should you be doing routinely monitoring of troponin of patients who are cardiac patients who come for non-cardiac surgery? So, so I rot know. routinely not needed, but for high-risk patient, if the patient has any signs or symptoms of ischemia, we can order a troponin level. So. But again, as I said, we will not have signs and symptoms of ischemia in MINS. To rule out MINS, what the latest recommendation says is that post-operative troponin surveillance should be done when you have, and if the patient had an elevated NT pro BNP in the preoperative period, that means these are the patients who will need a troponin surveillance in the post-op. When your RCRA index is more than equal to one, age greater than 45 years with significant cardiac disease and age more than 65 years. So this is what the newer recommendations are coming up. They are yet to be validated. However, these are ones that we are, we have to keep an eye open uh, and be vigilant about these kind of complications that happen in the post-operative period. Supposing this patient uh, refused to go for a laparoscopic surgery and said that, no, I want an open surgery. Now, we can go for regional anesthesia in this patient or not? And how will we proceed? Yes, ma'am, we can proceed with regional anesthesia in this patient. And uh, I will stop again clopidogrel at least five to seven days before surgery and he will continue aspirin. Then I will go for combined spinal epidural ana anesthesia for this patient for giving central neuroaxial blockade. Why so? Um, uh, the, so that I can also cover the post-operative pain management also with the epidural top-ups. So I'm, I was very happy with your answer when you said CSC, but I was not so happy with your reason. Now that I would have been happier if you had said that with a CSC, I can give a smaller dose of the drug initially. I can titrate the level in a better manner. I, can be, I have the flexibility of then increasing the block if required and giving post-operative analgesia. 
because I do not want a hypotension in my patient. I don't, as you yourself said, you don't want either a hypotension or a bradycardia, hyper or tachycardia. So that gives you a lot of control, a lot of flexibility. So this is the okay. reason. And of course, post-operative pain relief is also um, a very, very big advantage. Now, supposing you did land up with a post-spinal hypotension, then what would be your vasopressor of choice in this patient who is a cardiac disease patient? Ma'am, I will use phenylephrine boluses for this patient. Why not anything else? Ma'am, phenylephrine is a vasoconstrictor. It will not increase the heart rate. So I will prefer phenylephrine. What are you routinely using in your hospital? Um, we have mephenteramine in my hospital. Very good. So do we. We are all using mephenteramine. What is the problem with mephenteramine? Mephenteramine also causes tachycardia. So I want to avoid. Does it? Does it cause tachycardia? Little, little. Little, little. <laughs> so yes, mephentamine can also be because we need vasoconstrictors. We basically don't want to use ephedrine. Uh, so we can use this too. Phenylephrine has its own share of problems. So as I promised uh, Sujali, uh, I have to hand over to her. So well done. Good job. Uh, you answered well. And I hope the students got some good learnings from there. Over to you, Sujali, for wrapping it up. We'll Thank take uh, questions uh, in, the, uh, in, in the end after Sujali's uh, talk is over. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be uh, talking in brief about the perioperative management of a patient with coronary artery disease for non-cardiac surgery. So ischemic heart disease or coronary artery disease is a condition characterized by inadequate supply of blood and oxygen to a portion of the myocardium. It is essentially a mismatch between the oxygen demand and supply at the level of the myocardium resulting in impaired function. It may present as a stable angina wherein the pa uh, patient has angina on exertion but uh, is relieved by rest or on med by medication. And they may also present as acute coronary syndrome which includes unstable angina, ST elevation MI or non-ST elevation MI or patients may present with sudden cardiac death. Now the incidence of perioperative MI is reported to be one to 17% in all types of surgery as in, and is an independent risk predict, predictor for cardiovascular death. Now patients experiencing MI in the perioperative period after a non-cardiac surgery have an in-hospital mortality of 15 to 25% and highest being in the first 30 days. Now the exact mechanism of perioperative MI is uncertain, but acute plaque disruption and myocardial oxygen de supply demand mismatch are the two important mechanisms contributing to perioperative MI. So when there is a plaque rupture, uh, there'll be platelet aggravation resulting in activation of coagulation cascade with subsequent generation of thrombin leading to partial or complete occlusion of coronary artery. So the factors uh, which may lead to imbalance in the supply demand may be uh, decreased oxygen supply, uh, which may be caused by decrease in the coronary blood flow, uh, as in tachycardia, hypotension, hypocapnia, uh, coronary artery spasm, or coronary artery blockage, or it may be due to decrease in the oxygen content of blood, as in anemia or hypoxia, or because of reduced oxygen availability to the tissues, uh, when there is a leftward shift of the oxygen dissociation curve. And there may be increased demand, oxygen demand in the perioperative period due to tachycardia, hypertension, increase in the ventricular wall tension, increased preload, increased afterload, increased myocardial contractility, or in patients with hypothermia. Now, the goals of preoperative evaluation in these patients will be to determine the extent of ischemic heart disease or any other uh, previous interventions the patient might have received like PCI or CABG and to decide on further testing and to treat the modifiable risk factors and to review the medical therapy the patient might be receiving and plan the management of cardiac illness during the perioperative period and, uh, and to plan our anesthetic technique. 
Now, preoperative evaluation, uh, we will focus on the history and physical examination of the current complaints the patient has come with, but the extent of the disease, whether the patient requires uh, emergency surgery or whether the surgery can be delayed, and evaluation of the pre-existing ischemic heart disease, the current condition of the disease, the severity, whether uh, what treatment the patient has received before, whether the patient has any stent or the patient has, has undergone CABG, the current medications the patient is receiving, uh, whether we need to modify the treatment or whether uh, patient needs to be optimized. And we need to evaluate the patient for any comorbid conditions, like if a patient has diabetes, if the patient has hypertension or any renal disease, whether they need to be optimized or whether, whether it, uh, any medication needs to be uh, modified. And we need to assess the functional capacity of the patient. This will help us uh, in stratifying the risk of the patient and, to, and help us in, in deciding whether the patient needs further workup. So this can be done by asking the patient about the daily uh, activity tolerance of the patient with uh, meds, or we can use uh, specific activity scales like Duke Activity Status Index. So if the patient can climb a fly, two flights of stairs or can walk on the level ground at four miles per hour, we consider the patient to have more than four meds. And this patient will have a good or um, good to moderate exercise tolerance and will be able to tolerate surgery and anesthesia. And the next is the risk stratification of these patients. Uh, there are various risk stratification uh, models. One is the revised cardiac risk index, which is commonly used. Uh, this uh, utilizes six independent risk predictors uh, to define the uh, risk of major adverse cardiac events during the perioperative period. So these are uh, coronary heart disease, congestive heart failure, cerebrovascular disease, stroke or transient ischemic attack, insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, patient with renal insufficiency with serum creatinine of more than two milligram per deciliter and patients undergoing high-risk surgery like supra-inguinal vascular, intraperitoneal or intrathoracic surgeries. So another risk stratification model is, the, is given by the American College of Surgeons, that is the NSQIP, MICA and Surgical Risk Calculator. They use 21 variables and provide a more comprehensive assessment of surgery specific risk of major adverse cardiac events and death. However, it is more complex and requires a web calculator and it has not been validated outside the study population. Uh, the risk stratification model given by uh, 2014 ACCHA guidelines is, they have categorized the patients into two groups, that is elevated risk and low risk. Patients with uh, more two or more than, more than two RCRIs are considered to have an elevated risk for major adverse cardiac uh, events of greater than 1% and with low risk, uh, patients' risk is less than 1% for MACE and uh, comprises of patients with less than two RCRIs. Now, what are the, our approach, what will be our approach to patients uh, regarding investigations in the perioperative period? So for 12 lead ECG, recommendation is that uh, patients who undergoing low risk surgical procedures need not uh, do a 12 lead ECG, but patients with known CAD or other structural heart disease and patients uh, who are asymptomatic, but clinical risk factors, presence of clinical risk factors will need a 12 lead ECG. Now, echocardiography, that is assessment of left ventricular function, will be required in patients who have dyspnea of unknown origin or heart failure with worsening dyspnea or left ventricular dysfunction who have not been assessed in the last one year. Uh, Preoperative exercise stress testing or pharmacological stress testing is not recommended for patients undergoing low risk surgery and for patients having functional capacity of more than four meds who are undergoing high risk surgery. Preoperative stress testing may be undertaken for patients with unknown functional capacity or functional capacity of less than four meds who are undergoing high risk surgery if it will change the perioperative management. Now, uh, this is the ACC, <clears throat> 2014 ACCHA guidelines for uh, preoperative uh, pre evaluation of patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery. So the first step is we have 
to decide whether the patient requires emergency surgery or not. If the patient requires emergency surgery, then uh, patient has to be assessed uh, for the risk and then we proceed for surgery. Next, in, if the patient does not require emergency surgery, then we have to assess whether the patient has any significant or unstable cardiac condition. If yes, then we have to evaluate and treat according to the existing practice guidelines and non-cardiac surgery may be delayed. If the patient has uh, no significant or unstable cardiac condition, then we estimate the perioperative risk of major adverse cardiac events in these patients. If the patient belongs to the low, low risk category, that is a risk of less than 1%, then no further testing is required and patient can proceed for surgery. If there is an elevated risk of the risk of more than one person, then we uh, assess the functional capacity of the patient. If the functional capacity of the patient is uh, more than four meds, then no further testing is required and the patient can proceed for surgery. But if the meds is unknown or less than four, then we have to decide whether the patient requires uh, will further testing affect our decision, surgical decision or the perioperative care. If, uh, if no, then we proceed for surgery according to the existing practice guidelines or we consider alternative strategies of management. And if the, if the further testing will modify our management, then we need to, uh, the patient may undergo pharmacologic stress testing. And if it is, normal or mildly abnormal, the patient can proceed for surgery, but if there is significant abnormality, we may consider the patient for coronary revascularization. Now, indications for coronary revascularization in the perioperative period will be according to the existing clinical practice guidelines in non-surgical setting. They are high risk coronary anatomy, example, left main disease or patients presenting with unstable angina, or myocardial infarction or life-threatening arrhythmias due to active ischemia. So uh, the perioperative concerns with patients who have undergone a coronary revascularization will be the consequences of delaying the desired surgical procedure and the risk of thrombosis and bleeding. Now, so the timing of elective non-cardiac surgery, this has been updated in the 2016, according to the 2016 ACC AHA guidelines. So uh, elective non-cardiac surgery should be delayed for 60 days following an episode of myocardial infarction without coronary revascularization and 14 days following balloon angioplasty, six weeks after coronary stent by fast grafting and at least 30 days following a bare metal stent and at least six months following a drug eluting stent implantation. Uh, the previous guidelines that is according to the 2014 guidelines were uh, four to six weeks for bare metal stents and at least uh, one year for drug eluting stents. Now, preoperative drug therapy in these patients. Uh, patients uh, who have uh, this type of patients will mostly be getting antiplatelets. So according to ACC AHA guidelines, uh, patients who are receiving low-dose aspirin, that is 75 to 100 milligrams, has to continue taking aspirin and they have to discontinue antiplatelets, that is P2, Y12 inhibitors, clopidogrel and ticagrelor at least five days and prasugrel at least seven days before surgery and clopidogrel should be restarted as soon as possible uh, after adequate surgical hemostasis, like maybe uh, preferably one day after the surgery with a loading dose of clopidogrel. Now, initiation or continuation of aspirin is not beneficial in patients undergoing elective non-cardiac, non-carotid surgery who have not had previous coronary stenting done unless the risk of ischemic events outweigh the risk of surgical bleeding. And there is no convincing evidence regarding the efficacy of bridging with either intravenous antiplatelet or anticoagulant therapy. So if the patient has to uh, go for a bridging therapy, if uh, the clinician wants a bridging therapy, then we can, uh, aspirin has to be continued. And uh, after the stoppage of uh, the oral antiplatelets, uh, patient 
can be considered for cangrelar infusion that is to be started at least two to three days can be started two to three days after stopping the oral antiplatelet uh, with an infusion of 0.75 mics per kg per minute and continued up to uh, one day or six hours prior to the surgery and it can be restarted after six hours of surgery after assessing the uh, risk of bleeding and if the patient is allowed orally, then we can go for a uh, loading dose of clopidogrel. Now, other therapy the patient will be receiving are beta blockers, uh, which will help in reducing the myocardial oxygen consumption, improve the coronary blood flow, and improve the supply demand ratio. So, the recommendations by ACC AHA are that beta blockers should be continued in patients who are taking them chronically. And they may be initiated in patients with elevated cardiac risk, such as ischemia during the preoperative stress testing or in patients with three or more RCRI risk factors. And if beta blocker is initiated, it should be started uh, long enough in advance and at least more than one day before surgery. Nitrates decrease the left ventricular preload, decrease the left ventricular afterload and improve coronary circulation and prevent or reverse coronary spasm. Prophylactic intravenous nitroglycerin is not effective in reducing myocardial ischemia in patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery. Patients already on nitrates for anginal therapy may continue using them. Now, calcium channel blockers reduce myocardial oxygen demand and also improve the coronary blood flow. So, ACHA gives no recommendations regarding calcium channel blockers, but according to the European Society of Cardiology, they may be uh, continued to reduce uh, continued in the perioperative period because they help in reducing the perioperative cardiovascular risk. Uh, perioperative statins uh, they help in lowering lipid lipids, stabilize the coronary plaque by decreasing lipid oxidation, inflammation matrix. Uh, metalloproteinase and cell death. They re ACHA recommend the continuation of statin therapy in patients currently taking statins, but uh, perioperative initiation of statins may be considered in patients undergoing elevated risk or vascular surgeries. Now, regarding AC inhibitors and ARBs, there's a continued controversy regarding withholding angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and ARB 24 hours prior to surgery because these agents may lead to intraoperative hypotension in patients being chronically treated with them. ACHA recommend continuation of AC inhibitors or ARBs perioperatively unless the surgical process involves major fluid shifts or significant blood loss. If AC inhibitors or ARBs are held before surgery, it is reasonable to restart them as, clinically, as soon as clinically feasible postoperatively. Now the goals of anesthetic management will be to prevent myocardial ischemia by avoiding factors that increase myocardial oxygen demand or decrease myocardial oxygen supply, and to monitor for ischemia and to treat them if it develops. For pre-medication, we can go for benzodiazepines because they will help to decrease anxiety-induced tachycardia and hypertension. And for the choice of anesthetic technique, there is no difference between general anesthesia and neuroaxial anesthesia techniques with respect to perioperative cardiac morbidity or mortality. Now, the current ACC HA guidelines recommend the choice of anesthetic technique be left to the discretion of the anesthesia care team. Now, for intraoperative monitoring, we will go for uh, ECG with uh, monitoring of lead 2 and lead V5 because they are more sensitive and also use of computerized ST segment analysis. And also BP, BP will be, uh, we can go for a non-invasive BP or invasive BP depending on the cardiac function of the uh, patient and also the uh, risk of surgery. And entitled carbon dioxide, SpO2, temperature monitoring, and urine output, pulmonary artery catheter is not recommended routinely. And uh, TE may be used in patients who are at high risk for developing myocardial ischemia and who are undergoing major non-cardiac surgery. Now, the goal during the intraoperative period will be to minimize hypotension and sympathetic stimulation during induction and tracheal intubation. 
the induction agent of choice is etomidate because of its better hemodynamic profile. And we should give induction agents slowly in small incremental doses to prevent uh, hypotension. And ketamine should be avoided as it causes sympathetic stimulation. And muscle relaxant will be cardiostable muscle relaxants like vicuronium, cis atracurium, or opuronium. And pancuronium should be avoided because of its vagolytic effect. And during laryngoscopy and tracheal intubation, laryngoscopy should be gentle, lasting for less than 15 seconds. And we may uh, use agents like opioids, lignocaine, and beta blockers to attenuate the stress response associated with laryngoscopy and tracheal intubation. For maintenance, uh, there is studies have found no difference in MI rates in patients receiving volatile anesthetics and those receiving total intravenous anesthesia. Uh, as he, CHA recommend the use of either of these agents with the choice being determined by factors other than the prevention of perioperative MI. And use of nitrous oxide is not associated with increased risk of cardiovascular mortality or morbidity. Now, during the intraoperative period, we have to maintain hemodynamic stability, avoid hyperventilation, prevent hypothermia, uh, provide good analgesia and depth of anesthesia, and Normal volumia should be maintained with IV fluids and tra blood transfusion where indicated. During reversal and extubation, uh, we can use uh, medications like lidocaine and beta blockers to reduce the sympathetic stimulation uh, associated with extubation. Now, concerns with regional anesthesia will be uh, aspirin and other non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs appear to represent no added risks. Uh, for development of spinal hematoma in patients having epidural or spinal anesthesia. Clopidogrel may be reinstituted 24 hours post-operatively and resume six hours after catheter removal. Hypotension resulting from sympathetic blockage should be controlled and promptly treated. Now, post-operative management of this patient is very crucial as most of uh, perioperative MI occur early after surgery, that is zero to four days, and 90% occur within seven days. And a continuous uh, ECG monitoring and BP monitoring is required in these patients. Serial 12 lead ECG and troponin measurements are useful in patients at high risk of developing ischemia. Uh, these patients should be given supplemental oxygen and uh, maintain hemoglobin levels, and blood, uh, blood transmission should be done where indicated. Analgesia should be adequate uh, and provided with IV uh, agents like paracetamol or NCs or opiates, or we can go for a uh, regional box or epidural analgesia. And we should maintain normal thermia because hypothermia and shivering triples the incidence of adverse myocardial outcomes in high risk patients. And so, if, if there is a high risk uh, suspicion of perioperative MI, uh, we can diagnose this. First is we need a high index of suspicion for at risk patients. Then uh, if the patient has any clinical signs and symptoms of ischemia, then we can go for a 12 lead ECG, wherein we, uh, we will find STT segment changes or new left bundle branch block and measurement of biomarkers of cardiac injury, especially the cardiac specific protein will help us identify patients uh, with perioperative MI and management of perioperative MI, we should provide supplemental oxygen to these patients, analgesia with opioids like fentanyl or morphine and nitrates, beta blockers and aspirin. And if there is, as after assessing the risk of bleeding, uh, we can go for uh, P2 vital inhibitors or glycoprotein 2 b 3 a inhibitors and also unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin if indicated and if the as a weighing the risk of uh, peri weighing the risk of uh, death or uh, bleeding we have to uh, consider the patient for pci or cavg intervention procedures so these are my references thank you Thank you, Dr. Sujali. Very comprehensive presentation. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat box. 
the first question is how to manage intraoperative MI in this patient. I think we have already discussed it both during the case presentation as well as in Dr. Sujali's presentation. And uh, we have also, I think Dr. Sujali has covered the guidelines about beta blockers preoperatively. Dr. Sujali, maybe if you could put up that slide once, I think that should be good enough. I can't see any other questions. Um, these are the only two questions that we have. Yeah. So either nobody was listening or we were really good. <laughs> I'll go for the second one. Now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have always been very charming. <laughs> right. So should we wrap up or should we wait? I'll leave that to the organizers. No, we can wrap up. I think in case we have any questions, we can just get on us. Any of us can sort of yeah. call. Yeah, they, please, uh, <laughs> the students are most free to call. You can you know share my uh, email ID with them and they can mail me their queries. I'll be more than happy to answer anything. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Well done. Well done. Good job. Thank you, ma'am. It was a pleasure hearing you after so long and a wonderful case discussion, very informative, and I'm sure everyone would have loved it. I hope so. A topic <laughs> that we all are very scared of, but you just simplified it and you just went on right to the basics of it so that uh, it was easy to understand for all the postgraduates. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Moving on to the next session, I would like to introduce the chairperson for this session, Dr. Lalita Chaudhary. Ma'am is director professor at ABVMS and Dr. RML Hospital, and Ma'am's area of special interest are critical care and pediatric anesthesia. We welcome you, Ma'am, and I hand over the proceedings of this session to you, Ma'am. And can you uh, unmute yourself and? Uh, You can unmute and switch on your camera.
Ma'am, you're still on the mute. Start my video, huh? Yeah, now it's working. Yeah, we can hear you, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Okay. Okay. We can see you, we can hear you, ma'am. We can go ahead. You can introduce the speaker, ma'am, and then we can have the. Yeah. The first speaker on temperature monitoring is Dr. Ashok Kumar Nishal, is a professor in the Department of Anesthesia in Atal Bihari Vajpayee Institute of Medical Science and Arabian Hospital. His area of interest is trauma and resuscitation. Dr. Ashok Kumar. Hello, I'm Dr. Ashok Nishal. This lecture is about temperature monitoring. As you all know, temperature is a vital sign that is tightly regulated for normal physiological functions. It is not homogeneous. The deep thoracic, abdominal, and sinus, sinus temperature is called the core temperature. And normal body temperature is around 36.5 to 37.3. And core temperature is best indicator of the thermal status. The rest is the peripheral or skin temperature that is around two to four degrees cooler than the core temperature and it varies markedly as a function of environmental exposure. Now coming to the thermoregulation, as you have seen the normal range is around 36 to 38 degrees centigrade, but we can see the hyperthermia and hypothermia during our operative procedures. A hyperthermia from 38 to 48 degrees, 40 degrees is commonly seen during fever and exercise, but it can go up to 40 to 40, four degrees centigrade and may result into heat stroke with multiple organ failure and brain lesions. Hypothermia, which is very common during surgery, is mild between 32 to 35 degrees, 28 to 32 is called as moderate hypothermia and between 24 to 28 is deep hypothermia and can result into cardiac defibrillation, cardiac fibrillation. Hence, thermoregulation is very much needed for various enzymatic functions as well as for the normal chemical reactions that are controlled with temperature. So why we need this temperature monitoring? As I already said, hypothermia is quite common under anesthesia. Most of the time it is hypothermia that is 90% of the time and only rarely we see hypothermia under anesthesia. This core temperature monitoring facilitates early detection as well as quantification of the hypothermia as well as hyperthermia. Hyperthermia, especially the malignant hyperthermia. Hypothermia, even of milder degrees from 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade, has adverse outcomes. It can result into morbid cardiac outcomes with dysrhythmias, increased peripheral vascular resistance, myocardial infarction, and angina. There are more chances of surgical wound infection, poor wound healing, and left to right shift of the oxygen dissociation curve with decreased drug metabolism. There is reversible coagulopathy because of the platelet dysfunction and increased surgical blood loss because of increased protein catabolism results from the stress response. There can be altered mentation, impaired renal functions, prolonged post anesthesia recovery that all results into the increased duration of hospitalization. Coming to briefly malignant hyperthermia. It's a life-threatening clinical syndrome that is characterized by the hypermetabolism involving the skeletal muscles. It is seen in susceptible individuals and can be triggered by anesthetic agents, mainly volatile agents and NDMR that is suctionized choline. Hence, it is very important to be vigilant during this perioperative period for the hyperthermia that requires the poor temperature monitoring. In these conditions, the core temperature may increase 1 to 2 degrees centigrade every 5 minutes. And severe hypothermia are seen in which core temperature goes beyond 44 degrees. Hence, it is a life-threatening situation. It is characterized by hypermetabolism. There is heat production with metabolic respiratory acidosis, activation of sympathetic nervous system, along with hyperkalemia, lately DIC, myoglobinuria, and multi-organ dysfunction or failure. 
To treat this, the active warming should be removed and dentrolin at dose of 2.5 mg per kg every 5 minutes up to maximum 10 mg per kg is used initially and it can be followed by the maintenance dose for next one to two days. As per the outcomes resource, research consortium guidelines, we must monitor temperature in all patients undergoing general anesthesia for more than 30 minutes of duration. Temperature should ideally be monitored continuously. However, at 15 minute intervals, interval, it is sufficient to see the temperature. Poor temperature should be monitored even during neuroaxial anesthesia as hypothermia is as likely and as severe as seen in the general anesthesia patients. The intraoperative core temperature should usually be maintained around 36 degrees centigrade unless hypothermia is specifically indicated. As per the NICE guidelines, that is National Institute for Clinical Excellence, one should manage inadvertent perioperative hypothermia in adults. And this management involves three phases of perioperative period. First is preoperative period that begins one hour before induction of anesthesia, then is the entire intraoperative period, and subsequently last one is the postoperative period that goes 24 hours into the post anesthesia care unit. As per the uh, recommendations of the NICE, one must assess the patients who are at risk for developing perioperative hypothermia before transfer of the patient to the operating room. Anesthesia shall only be induced once the core temperature is reached around 36 degrees centigrade. One must also ensure warming of the IV fluid as well as the blood products to around 37 degrees centigrade. And use of forced air warming must be used to prevent and treat perioperative hypothermia. Coming to thermoregulation, thermoregulation is a mechanism by which the hypothalamus regulates the body temperature at a stable level in a very narrow interthreshold range. Even infants, they regulate their body temperature remarkably well, but it is less robust in the neonates and elderly, where thermodynamic system is failing or getting aged. General anesthesia lowers this threshold by two to three degrees centigrade. This threshold is the temperature, core temperature, at which response is triggered like vasoconstriction and saving, which are beneficial under kind times of hypothermia. This impairment of lower threshold, it causes go to peripheral distribution of the body heat and is the primary cause of hypothermia in most of the patients along with the environmental exposure. Similarly, neuroaxial anesthesia also impairs both central as well as peripheral chemothermal uh, thermoregulatory control and is associated equally for with the substantial hypothermia. Coming to the physiology of thermoregulation, there are three parts of thermoregulation, afferent input, central control and effector response. This afferent input is conveyed by the A delta fibers for the cold signals, by unmyelinated C fibers for the warm signals and through spinothalamic tracts. Then is the central control and processing that is mainly uh, processed in hypothalamus and to some extent in the spinal cord and brainstem. The control of autonomic response is around 80% from the core temperature and control of behavioral response is only around 20% from the skin input. The effector response is in, uh, in the form of visodilatation or sweating and either vasoconstriction or and severity. This is again the same afferent input, then central regulation, followed by the effector response. Effector response is initially cutaneous visoconstriction, then is the non-severing thermogenesis, followed by severing. And in cases of the uh, increased threshold, it can be vasodilatation and sweating. This is again the same. The various inputs from the skin deep tissue, spinal cord and brain reaching the anterior hypothalamus and thereby affecting the interthreshold range. In case that threshold is elevated beyond 0.2 degrees centigrade, the process of vasodilatation and sweating they starts. And if the threshold is decreased by 0.2 degrees centigrade of normal, initially vasoconstriction followed by non severing thermogenesis, and lately severing comes into play. This is again the same thermoregulation under general anesthesia. We can see the interthreshold range is tightly regulated around 0.2 degrees centigrade near 37 degrees centigrade under normal conditions. The same interthreshold range is widened under anesthesia. 
we can see almost two to four degree centigrade change in the interthreshold range under anesthesia. Under general anesthesia, the behavioral regulations they play no role as the patients are generally anesthetized, unconscious, and mainly paralyzed. Hence, the thermoregulation relies on the autonomic defenses and external temperature management. The interthreshold range, which is normally 0.2 to 0.3 degrees centigrade, has in, is increases up to 10 to 20 folds from 0.3 to around 2 to 4 degrees centigrade. Temperatures within this range do not trigger the thermoregulatory defenses, and hence patient becomes poikilothermic. Mirazolam is slightly impairs thermoregulatory control. The painful stimulation can slightly increase vasoconstriction threshold. Therefore, regional or local anesthesia decreases vasoconstriction threshold. Isoflurane and halothane, they impair thermoregulatory vasoconstriction, especially in infants and children. Propohol and volatile anesthetics, they inhibit non-sibling thermogenesis. Infants are at higher risk of hypothermia because of their large surface area to body mass ratio. Overall, sweating is the best preserved thermoregulatory defense during general anesthesia. Its threshold is only slightly increased while the gain and maximum intensity remains normal. In contrast, vasoconstriction and shivering thresholds are markedly reduced and efficacy of these responses is diminished even after they are being activated. Coming to the temperature measure, a combination of core and mean skin temperature gives accurate estimate of the body heat content. There are various methods like mercury in glass, thermometer. Those are very slow and cumbersome and not recommended nowadays. Electronic thermometers use thermistors or thermocouples. They are suitably accurate, inexpensive, and most dependable modality and majorly used in our anesthesia practice. There are infrared monitors that detect the heat given off by radiation and can measure temperature from tympanic membrane and forehead skin. Very commonly, we have seen these during the corona times. They are slightly less reliable, but handy to use. There are various techniques for temperature monitoring. The technique that are based on the expansion of a material as its temperature increases, then techniques which are based on the change in electrical properties with temperature, then techniques which are based on the optical properties of a material. As I already said, mercury in glass is no more in use and they are cumbersome also. Electronic thermometers are quite, quite commonly used in our anesthesia practice. Infrared monitors are handy, though they are not that much reliable. Then there are thermotropic liquid crystals, which are incorporated, incorporated in disposable seats, are also available, but are less accurate. Coming to the electrical techniques, electrical techniques are based on thermometers and are subdivided into resistance thermometer, thermistor, and thermocouples. Resistance thermometers that operate on the principle that the electrical resistance of metals increases with temperature. These devices use a platinum wire as the temperature sensitive register. The platinum wire is incorporated in a Wheatstone bridge circuit, which accurately measures very small change in resistance. Then the thermistors, these are the semiconductors and display opposite behavior with regards to electrical resistance. In thermistor, when they are heated, the electrical resistance in decreases. Thermistors are being in solid state device, display fast response to changes in temperature. That is, a very little heat is needed to increase their temperature. Most of the temperature probes we are using in anesthesia are thermistor based. For example, pulmonary artery catheter or the esophageal probes. The poor probe, probe placement is the most common cause for the inaccurate reading or physical damage that results into high resistance can also result in inaccurate results, readings. Thermocouples are the conductors that generate a voltage in response to a temperature gradient. These are various thermometers based on the mercury, infrared, and electrical modes of technique. Then coming to various monitoring sites, none of the guidelines specify which technique is best or which site is best to monitor temperature. Hence, the site and device is mainly decided by clinician, the type of surgery, or the accessibility of monitoring sites. The various sites which are used for temperature monitoring are the core sites, that is pulmonary artery, digital esophagus probes, or tympanic membrane nasopharynx. They are reliable, 
even during extreme thermal changes, they are less affected by visometer or therm thermoregulatory mechanisms. The various intermediate sites are oral, rectal, or bladder temperature probes. They are not too, uh, that much reliable during the rapid thermal perturbations. Then most common one is the skin surface where we can monitor the temperature, though its reliability is lower than the core one, but it gives a reasonable reflection of the core temperature provided adequate adjustment for the core to skin gradient are made. This is a tympanic membrane temperature probe. Nasopharyngeal temperature probes are commonly used during general anesthesia and this tympanic membrane temperature monitoring is commonly seen in under regional anesthesia. Coming to various heat loss mechanisms under anesthesia when the patient is lying on the operating table, heat loss can be through convection, radiation, evaporation and conduction. Most common method for heat loss is convection along with radiation. Conduction and evaporation, they contribute very less. Coming to intraoperative hypothermia, the risk of intraoperative hypothermia increases with prolonged surgery, extremes of age, extensive burns, lower preoperative temperature under severe trauma, and major intraoperative fluid shift. The hypothermia under general anesthesia occurs from a combination of anesthetic induced impaired reg thermoregulation, vasodilatation, inhibition of vasoconstriction, reduced metabolic rate by 20 to 30 percent, exposure to cold environment, one of the important factors, the OT temperature remaining cold, use of cleaning and irrigating fluids, cold intravenous fluids, and then heat transfer or loss from the body. As I already said, radiation and convection, they contribute most to the perioperative heat loss and hence hypothermia. There are high risk group which are prone for the hypothermia, especially hypothyroid patients, patients of myothenia gravis, neonates, preterm kids, and elderly who are undergoing major surgeries where the thermoregulatory responses failed. Hypothermia under general anesthesia has three phases. First is initial rapid decrease, second is slow linear reduction, and third one is the plateau phase. Coming to the three phases of hypothermia, the initial first hour is the phase one, whereby temperature, core temperature decreases from 0.5 to 1.5 degrees centigrade, and mainly because of the redistribution of heat from the core to the periphery. Phase two that starts after one hour and lasts for two to four hours is the linear phase of fall in the core temperature. And this is because the heat loss, it exceeds the metabolic heat production. Then after three to four hours occurs the phase three, that is the plateau phase when heat loss is equal to the metabolic heat production, though it is not a thermal steady state. Hypothermia under neurexial anesthesia is like general anesthesia. It is equally common and equally severe. It is because of the impaired behavior as well as autonomic thermoregulation. Here the core temperature initially decreases to point from 0.5 to 1. 0 degrees centigrade. Under neurexial blocks, the thermal inputs are blocked from the anesthetic regions, and this reduces vasoconstriction and severing threshold by 0 0.6 degrees centigrade above the level of the block. Reduction in these thresholds is proportional to the number of spinal segments blocked, means the more the number of segments blocked, there is more reduction in the uh, compensatory threshold of vasoconstriction and severing. Hypothermia during neuroxial block may be as severe as general anesthesia. And it is augmented by use of analgesics and sedative supplements that also impair the thermoregulation. Decrease may not plateau since now block inhibits the peripheral vasoconstriction. Hence, under regional anesthesia, patient often do not recognize being hypothermic. They may sever, sever without feeling cold. Now coming to prevention of redistribution hypothermia, for this we can initially start with preoperative warming. As per the NICE guidelines that recommends preoperative warming of the patients to a temperature around 36 degrees centigrade in a comfortably warm environment. For this 
स्किन सरफेस वार्मिंग फॉर अप टू थर्टी मिनट मस्ट बी स्टार्टेड बिफोर इंडक्शन ऑफ एनेस्थीजिया टू प्रिवेंट द रीडिस्ट्रीब्यूशन हाइपोथर्मिया टू वॉर्म द पेशेंट एट लीस्ट फॉर एन आवर बिफोर इंडक्शन ऑफ एनेस्थीजिया वन कैन यूज फोर्स्ट एयर वार्मिंग दैट विल हेल्प इन लेस फॉल इन दो टेम्परेचर एंड डिक्रीज इन टू ऑपरेटिव हाइपोथर्मिया द एफिकेसी ऑफ प्री वार्मिंग इन चिल्ड्रन by increasing the ambient temperature in the OT room by up to 26 degree centigrade for around 30 to 40 minutes has been found very effective and safe coming to the intraoperative management we can use airway heating and humidification by use of hme and other methods but it is not that reliable and that effective because heat loss is around only 10% from the respiratory tract warming in warming intravenous fluids is important especially in condition where large quantity of cold fluids can result into the significant heat loss and hypothermia the guidelines say even one unit of refrigerated blood or 1 liter of crystalloid at room temperature can reduce the mean body temperature by 0.25 degrees centigrade though low flow rates for iv infusion up to less than 35 ml per minute the warming may not be required especially in adults fluid warming is the only method that produces direct core warming and is recommended for all intraoperative infusions exceeding 500 ml in adults as per the who guidelines keeping patient warm is more important than warming blood warming of blood is recommended when we are using large volume of transfusion say in adults more than 50 ml per kg per hour or in children 15 ml per kg per hour also especially it is important during exchange transfusion in infants and patients with clinically significant cold agglutinins then there are various few warming devices most commonly used one is the warming cabinets which are cheap simple convenient and safe they can even store large volumes especially in conditions where massive transfusion is required like burns and trauma then there are dry warming system counter current heat exchangers water bath convective air systems and insulators these are two sizes of fluid warming cabinets which are commonly used in our anesthesia practice coming to the operating room temperature operating room temperature is the most critical factor that determines cutaneous losses through radiation convection and even evaporation room temperature should be maintained at around 23 degrees centigrade for adults and 26 degrees centigrade for infants respectively to maintain normal thermia as per the revised nabs guidelines for air conditioning operation theater temperature must be maintained around 21 plus minus 3 degree centigrade with relative humidity of 40% to 60% respectively and overall relative humidity of 55% and for these appropriate display of these factors must be used a minimum of 25 air exchanges per hour with minimum of four changes having fresh air component is required and air flow must be unidirectional and downwards onto the ot table coming to the cutaneous warming cutaneous warming in operation theater can be achieved by passive insulation and or active warming for passive insulation there are cotton blankets surgical tapes plastic sheets reflective composites space blankets and sleeping bags that can be used this insulation is provided by the layer of steel layer which is strapped beneath the device a single layer of this insulation reduces heat loss by approximately 30% and any additional extra layer doesn't further reduce heat loss and is not that effective coming to active warming for active warming there are various devices that include circulating water mattress or garments forced air warmers resistive heating devices negative pressure water warming system and radiant heaters beside these technologies intraoperative warming also depends on the patient age the type of surgery duration of surgery disease state of the patient and use of anesthetics forced air warmers are the most commonly tested recommended and used devices for intraoperative warming this is a type of forced air warming from the bear hugger and these are the water blankets we use in our operation theaters coming to post operative warming therapy again the forced air blankets and radiant heaters are most commonly used warming devices in post anesthesia care unit coming to some of the entities which are deleterious 
One is the post anesthesia severing. It is seen in up to 40% of the patients receiving anesthesia for surgery. The incidence is higher in young patients with patients with low core temperature preoperatively, and it results into results into increased oxygen consumption, raised intraocular pressure and intracranial pressure, and cardiac dysfunction. It shall be managed with increasing the normal ambient temperature and use of skin surface warming from the uh, forced air warmers or radiant heaters must be used. Various drugs are used also for control of shivering. Most commonly used are pethidine, clonidine, dexmethotomidine, and tramadol. Pethidine and dexmethotomidine are quite effective. Pethidine reduces shivering threshold twice as much as vasoconstriction threshold. Now, hyperthermia and fever. Hyperthermia is more dangerous and serious as compared to similar degree of hypothermia. It indicates core temperature exceeded the normal values. It causes discomfort in an increase in metabolic demand and cardiovascular stress. Passive hyperthermia results from excessive patient heating without adequate monitoring of core temperature. It is commonly seen in infants and children as sweating and anesthesia is less effective in these. It shall be treated by discontinuing the active warming and removing excessive insulation. Fever indicates regulated increase in core temperature targeted by the thermoregulatory system and it develops when the endogenous pyrogens, they elevate the set point of the thermoregulatory system. Fever is relatively rare under general anesthesia since volatile anesthetic opioids, they inhibit expression of fever. Perioperative fever can be due to infection, mismatched blood transfusions, blood in fourth ventricle, and allergic reactions. Some of the, some degree of fever can be seen after surgery because of tissue trauma. Fever is treated by removing underlying cause, use of antibiotics, antipyretics, and finally by cautious active cooling if it is severe. Coming to some special scenarios, hypothermia is deleterious, but it has potential benefits also during. For example, in myocardial infarction, organ transplant, cardiopulmonary bypass, spinal injuries, intestinal ischemia, and neonatal hypoxic ischemia. Coming to cardiopulmonary bypass, during bypass, it needs a systematic approach for hypothermia as well as rewarming. Generally, multiple sites of temperature monitoring are used, including myocardial temperature monitoring. Cardiopulmonary bypass initiates with mild hypothermia initially going into moderate that is 26 to 32 degrees and up to deep hypothermia that is 20 to 25 degrees centigrade. The lower the temperature, the longer the time for cooling as well as rewarming. Rewarming shall begin 10 to 15 minutes before release of the aortic cross clamp. The gradient between heat exchanger and nasopharynx during rewarming is maintained at 2 to 3 degrees centigrade. Coming to deep hypothermic circulatory arrest. Deep hypothermic circulatory arrest facilitates meticulous and complex cerebral and cardiac procedures under cardiopulmonary bypass, including aortic arch surgeries and aneurysm surgeries. These surgeries are generally performed at deep hypothermia of 20 to 25 degrees centigrade while stopping blood circulation and brain function up to an hour. Despite such low temperatures, there are chances of neurological ischemia. Therefore, adjuvants for neuroprotection must always be used in the form of pharmacotherapy as well as high schooling of the head. Dewarming should precisely be controlled because basically we are trying to protect the brain. The rest of the body can idly can deal fairly well with these heat and cold periods, but the brain is most adversely affected by temperature, especially overheating. Thank you. Now we can have Thank you, Dr. Ashok, for a detailed discussion on the temperature thermoregulation and temperature monitoring. I think uh, he has dis uh, discussed everything in detail. Any questions from the audience? No, ma'am. I think we can proceed with another next. Dr. Sanjeev Sharma, Professor in the Department of Anesthesia in Atal Bihari Vajpayee Institute of Medical Science and Dr. RML Hospital. His area of interest is airway and ultrasound in anesthesia. 
a topic to our presentation in inhalational agent. Inhalation agent is a chemical compound possessing general anesthetic property that can be delivered via inhalation into the body via the lungs and are distributed with the blood into the different tissue. The main target of inhalation anesthetics is the brain. Inhalation anesthetics act either by amplifying inhibitory function or decreasing excitation at the nerve ending in the brain. The demonstration of the anesthetic property of the diethyl ether by William Smorton in 1846 was one of the most significant discoveries in medical science. Thereafter, many other anesthetic agents were introduced into the clinical practice. Unfortunately, some of these anesthetics were explosive or toxic and have since been discontinued for clinical use. In 1950, the first fluoridated agent was tested in the clinical trial. However, the drug was withdrawn in 1974 with toxic effect was observed. In 1957, halothane, a halogenated hydrocarbon, was tested in clinical practice and successfully applied for surgical anesthesia. Isofluorine was synthesized in 1965. However, it was introduced into widespread clinical use in 1983 due to very difficulty in chemical synthesis. Sevofluorine and desfluorine was developed in the late 1960s and tested, tested in clinical practice much later. SIVO was not immediately introduced because of its fluorine releases and its reaction with absorbed carbon dioxide. Now coming to the ideal anesthetic agent has some properties, which mm -hmm. means physical, pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetics. First we will discuss physical properties. The, an ideal anesthetic agent should be non-inflammable, non-explosive, stable in light, liquid and vaporizable at room temperatures, stable at room temperature with long shelf life, stable with soda, lime, environmental friendly, cheap and easy to manufacture. And it should be pleasant to inhalation, so non irritant low blood gas solubility that is faster in onset, high oil and water solubility that is high potency, minimal effect on other systems, no biotransformation and should be non-toxic to OT personnel. It should have a predictable dose response seen at discretion. It should have an analgesic, antimatic and muscle relaxation property. Should have a minimum respiratory depression and minimum cardiovascular effect. There should be no increase in cerebral blood flow and intracranial pressure. Do not impair renal or hepatic function and this should have no effect on the smooth muscle of uterus and do not trigger malignant hyperthermia. In addition, anesthetic agents are classified as gaseous and liquid volatile liquids. All anesthetic agents are among, uh, in addition, agents are among the most rapidly acting drugs. Nitro oxide and xenome are true gases and other agents are the vapor of anesthetic liquid. But for simplicity, all the, all of them are referred to as a gases because they are in the gaseous phase when administered into the lungs. These agents are non-ionized, ionized and have low molecular weights. This allowed them to diffuse rapidly without the need for facilitated diffusion or active transport from blood stream to tissue. The other advantage of gases is that they can be delivered to the bloodstream via a unique route available in all the patient, the lung. Speed, gaseous state and the lung as a route of administration combined to form the major beneficial feature of the inhalation agent. Now we will consider some physical and chemical properties of inhalation of the agents. Was coming to the uh, the permanent gases, the, the, the so-called permanent gases such as oxygen and nitrogen exist only as a gas at ambient temperature. Gases such as nitrogen oxide, nitrous oxide can be compressed into liquid under high pressure at ambient temperature. Most potent volatile anesthetics are the liquid at ambient temperature and pressure. I will describe the vapor pressure and boiling point. If the system in which the volatile liquid resides in a closed container, molecule or the substance will equilibrate between the liquid and the gas phase. At equilibrium, the pressure exerted by the molecule collision of the gas against the container wall is called the vapor pressure. Vapor pressure determines how readily an inhalation anesthetic agent will evaporate in the anesthesia machine vaporizer. The boiling point of the liquid is the temperature at which the vapor pressure exceeds atmospheric pressure in an open container. This uh, this tabular shows that the web boiling point of vapor pressure of the inhalational agent. As you can see that 
Desperate vapor pressure is three to four times that of a contemporary inhalational anesthetic, and its boiling point is 22.8%, which is near room temperature. The bottle is designed, the bottle of the desflurane is designed to allow transfer of desflurane from the bottle to the vaporizer without exposure to the atmosphere. Desflurane cannot be administered using a standard vaporizer that is the variable bypass, but by a, by a vaporizer that add agent directly to the that agent that directly to the bloodstream. Each coefficient is a ratio of the concentration of the anesthetic gases in each of the two phases at the equilibrium. Equilibrium is defined as the equal partial pressure in the two phases. The blood gas partial coefficient of isoflurane is 2.1.4 uh, and brain blood partition coefficient is 2.2. At equilibrium, the volume of the blood contained 1.4 fold the quantity of isoflurane as the same volume of the alveolar gas, whereas the volume of the blood brain tissue contained 2.2 fold the quantity of the isoflurane as in the volume of the blood. For instance, the blood gas partial coefficient of nitrous oxide is 0.47. In other words, at equilibrium, the 1 ml of blood contains 0.47 as much nitrogen, nitrous oxide as does 1 ml of alveolar gas, even though the partial pressure are the same. Nitrous oxide is much less soluble in blood than in halogen, than halothane, which has a blood gas partial coefficient of 2.4. Thus, almost 5 times more halogen than nitrous oxide must be dissolved to raise the partial pressure of the blood. So this is a table where I show the parts, uh, blood gas partial coefficient. Nitrous is the least and the halogen has the highest blood gas partial coefficient. Now coming to the now coming to the concentrating effect, concentration effect. The higher the concentration of an inhaled anesthetic, the faster the alveolar concentration approaches the inhalational concentration. This is referred to as a concentration effect and it is clinically significant only in cases where gases are administered in a high concentration and having a relatively low blood gas solubility coefficient, for example, nitrous oxide. This has been termed the concentration effect, which is readily the result of two phenomena, the concentrating effect and the augmentation inflow effect. Now, this is a diagram that shows the concentration effect. Suppose the capacity of the patient lung is 4 liter. As the patient inhaled 2 liter of nitrous oxide and 2 liter of oxygen, such that each has a 50% concentration in the mixture. We all know that the gas flow along the concentration gradient, gas flow along the concentration gradient that they maintain equilibrium. Since nitrous oxide diffuse very rapidly, since the nitrous oxide diffuse very rapidly than other gases, half of the volume, that is 1 liter of the one liter of it diffuse into the blood, leaving only one ml, uh, one, ml, uh, one liter in the alveoli. Initial, initially, for two liter of nitrous and two liter of oxygen of the alveoli has been now reduced to one liter of nitrous oxide and two liter of oxygen. So the new concentration of the nitrous oxide in the alveoli is one third, that is thirty three percent. This is the first part of concentration effect and it is termed concentrating effect. As the, as the alveoli is deficient in 1 liter volume, this creates a sub-atmospheric pressure in the alveoli and the patient further inhaled 1 liter of mix, 1 liter of mixed gases, which contain 250, uh, 500 ml of nitrogen and 500 ml of oxygen. Now the Volume of the gas in the alveoli is 4 liter, 2.5 liter of oxygen and 1.5 liter of nitrous oxide. Now the concentration of nitrous oxide in the alveoli is approximately 37.5%. This is the second part of concentration effect and it is termed as augmentation, augmented gas inflow or the ventilation effect. In comparison to this, if we use a mixture of 10% nitrous oxide and rest is 90% oxygen, the rise in the alveolar concentration, the rise in the alveolar concentration is obviously very low, that is 
around 5.3 percent by concentrated effect and 5.5 percent by the augmented inflow effect which is around five times or uh, and 6.8 times less as compared to 50 50 mixture so given five times as much inhalational agent has led to 6.2 times greater alveolar concentration so the higher the fi the greater the effect thus nitrocyte typically given in concentration of 50 to 0 to, to achieve a higher concentrating effect now coming to the second gas effect second gas effect is not a different concept than the concentrating effect it is a special case of concentration effect and applied to the administration of a potent anesthetic with a nitrous oxide along with the concentration of potent agent in the alveoli via its uptake there is a further concentration via the uptake of nitrous oxide a process called the second gas effect though it has a low solubility in blood although one liter per minute of nitrous oxide enters the blood in the first few minutes if another potent anesthetic second gas is given at the same time it also will be delivered to the blood at the rate of one liter per minute higher than the minute ventilation and induction will be faster so this can uh, this can also explain by the same on diagram we will use the same diagram to explain the second gas effect by adding isoflurane so that the inhalation mixture is now one percent isoflurane 49 percent oxygen and 50 percent nitrous oxide four liters inhaled by the patient that is 40 m isoflurane and rest of the thing nitrous and oxygen we will use this so the, now the concentration effect is as, as the half of the nitrous oxide diffuse quickly in the alveoli the alveolar volume will reduce and a new alveolar concentration of isoflurane will be 1.33 percent and this is a concentrating effect a fresh uh, flow of oxygen nitrous and isoflurane is given then then again there will be concentrating effect and the due to the sub atmospheric pressure created in the alveoli further, further and the further of the mixture gas is inhaled so the new alveolar concentration of the isoflurane gradient is approximately 5.5 percent so this is a second gas effect nitrous oxide increases the alveolar concentration of the second glass like halothane and isoflurane etc Now coming to the minimum alveolar concentration, Eager and his colleague define the concept of minimum alveolar concentration of an inhalation anesthetic is the alveolar concentration that prevent movement in 50% of patient is response to a standard noxious stimulus at one atmospheric pressure at 37 degrees centigrade. For human, the noxious stimulus is a surgical incision on the abdomen. While in animal, it is usually produced by clamping on the tail or passing electric current to the subcutaneous electrode. Minimum alveolar concentration is a mirror, it mirror bar, brain partial pressure after a period of equilibrium. Best estimation of an incisive potency of the relational agent. It allows comparison between agent and provide a standard for experimental evaluation. Doses of anesthetics in MAC are, MAC are, added, are addict, addict, addictive. MAC is a constant with a variety of noxious stimulus. Individual varieties, uh, variability is very small. So this is a, a developed diagram that shows the agent and the MAC of different inhalational agent. Now coming to the factor affecting MAC, they may be physical, pharmacological, and pathological, but to the physiological factors. Factors such as species, sex, hypothyroid, hyper, hyperthyroid, or duration of anesthesia do not affect MAC. However, the age of the patient does influence the minimum alveolar concentration. MAC peak at the age of six months of age and then decrease by approximately 6% per decade, regardless of the volatile anesthetics. Now coming to the physiological uh, derangement, severe physiological derangement such as anemia, hypercarbia, hypoxia has been shown to decrease MAC. Temperature is also a consideration that can influence the MAC of a volatile anesthetic. MAC decreases with decreasing body temperature by approximately 4 to 5 percent and increases by increasing the temperature. Exception to this is the nitrous oxide it max does not change with decreasing temperature 
a special population to consider those who are pregnant. Although the underlying cause is unclear, it has been found that MAC requirement are decreased during pregnancy by, by as much as 30%. The increased potency of volatile anxiety for this population also extended into early postpartum period. Many pharmacologic agent altered MAC commonly used classes of drugs in anesthesia such as sedative, hypnotic, intravenous drug that potential is GABA, local anesthetic, opiate, all decreases MAC. These include medications such as barbiturate, benzodiazepine, propofol. Ketamine, lithium, element decreases the MAC. Stubulants such as cocaine effetine increases MAC. Substances such as alcohol and amphetamine depend on the chronicity of the use. Chronic alcohol use and acute amphetamine use increases the MAC requirement, while the inverse decreases MAC requirement. <coughs> Coming to the pathological factors, patients presenting with depressed level of consciousness due to trauma or the cerebral vascular insult lead to decrease in the anesthetic requirement. Hypoxia below 30 mm of mercury, acute metabolic acidosis and acute hemorrhage hypertension also produce decrease in MAC. Certain electron abilities such as hypernatremia associated with decrease in MAC while hyponatremia associated with decrease in MAC. Now coming to the clinical implication of MAC. Both minimal alveolar concentration and lipid solubility vary among different volatile anesthetics. The most commonly used anesthetic follow the order of nitrocyte, nesplorin, SIBO, isoflurane, halocene from highest to lower MAC. This order follows a Mayer's overton rule and has a direct correlation with oil gas partition coffin. It also used to study the side effect of inhalation agent at equipotent doses. When combined inhalation agent is given, the MAC is roughly added together. It also used to tool to measure anesthetic potency, small for the potent anesthetic halothane and a larger for the less potent anesthetic nitrous oxide. Beside immobility, MAC can be used clinically to assess unconsciousness, amnesia, eye opening and autonomic response. Using the concept of MAC awake, MAC amnesia, MAC bar, MAC awake is defined as the anesthetic consideration needed to suppress the voluntary response to verbal command. It is generally one third of the MAC for inhalation and anesthetic. The MAC for endotracheal intubation is defined as an entire concentration of inhalation and anesthetic agent at which 50% of the patient can be intubated smoothly. The concept of MAC bar estimated of the MAC of volatile anesthetic that block autonomic response to surgical incision in 50% of the patient. MAC bar is Catamol by measuring the level of catamol in the venous blood and has been calculated to be roughly 1.5 MAC. Now coming to the limitation of MAC. One of the major limitations is that there is no that it is not applicable when administrating total and intravenous anesthesia. Furthermore, furthermore, in clinical practice, it is common to administer balanced anesthesia, including the use of muscle relaxant, intravenous anesthesia opioid. While these drugs tend to decrease MAC, but not but may not equally affect MAC awake and MAC amnesia. Therefore, MAC cannot be used as a sole measure of anesthetic effects. Now we will discuss individual anesthetic agents versus nitrous oxide. It is a laughing gas, only inorganic anesthetic gas in clinical use. It is a colorless, odorless, non-explosive, non-inflammable nitrous oxide, but nitrous oxide is capable of supporting combustion. Nitrous oxide is a gas at room temperature and ambient pressure. It can be kept as a liquid under pressure because its critical temperature lies above room temperature, that is 36.5 degrees centigrade. Nitrous oxide is a relatively inexpensive anesthetic gas. Now we'll discuss effect on the different organs in cardiovascular. Nitrous oxide has a tendency to stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. Arterial blood pressure, cardiac output, heart rate are unchanged or slightly elevated because of its stimulation of catecholamines. Construction, constriction of pulmonary vasculature smooth muscle increases pulmonary vascular resistance, which result in the elevation of right ventricular and diastolic pressure. 
but nitrous oxide increases endogenous because nitrous oxide increases endogenous catecholamine level it may be associated with a high incidence of epinephrine induced arrhythmia on respiratory system nitrous oxide increases respiratory rate and decreases tidal volume as a result of central nervous system stimulation and activation of pulmonary stretch receptors the net effect is minimal gain in mineral ventilation and resting arterial co2 it increases cerebral blood flow and cerebral blood volume and also mildly elevate intracranial pressure it also increases cerebral oxygen consumption on neuromuscular effect in contrast to other inhalational agent nitrous oxide does not provide significant muscle relaxation it decreases renal blood flow and increases renal vascular resistance leading to decreased gfr and urine output it blood flow also uh, hepatic blood flow also falls but to a lesser extent than other agents it causes post operative nausea or vomiting by stimulation of chemocentral trigger zone and vomiting center in the brain nitrous oxide during emergence almost all of the nitrous oxide is eliminated by exhalation a small amount diffuses through skin via transpiration limited to less than 0.01% through that undergo reductive metabolism in the gastrointestinal tract by anaerobic bacteria advantages are it is odorless and adjuvant at the beginning of the inhalation so it is used as adjuvant at the beginning of the inhalation in the pediatric population prior to the administration of volatile anesthetic anesthetic property allows the reduction of halogen agent and limit the cardio respiratory effect in critical ill patient it is also commonly used for analgesia and sedation for dental procedure it provides the enhancement of pain sensitivity induced by noxious input and by acute phenylalanine and morphine tolerance the disadvantage is the interaction of nitrous oxide with beta b12 beta and b12 play a critical role in methylation reaction methyl meth methylation reaction and dna synthesis it, it inactivate it inactivate enzyme methionine synthesis which required both beta 12 and folate as a cofactor mainly the disadvantage by many the in healthy surgical patient megaloblasty changes in the bone marrow are rare and reported only after a long period of exposure more than 12 hours to nitrous oxide however in severe ill patient or those with a risk factor there is shorter interval like 2 to 6 hour or repeated exposure period of nitrous oxide exposed may lead to significant subacute pathology the risk factor that increases susceptibility to nitrous oxide toxicity include pernicious anemia gastrointestinal absorption syndrome extreme of ages alcoholism malnutrition a strict vegetarian diet or inborn deficiency in cobalamin or tetrahydrofolate metabolism megaloblastic bone marrow changes can be induced after a short period of two to so in these patient during recovery from anesthesia when nitrous oxide discontinued large concentration of nitrous oxide diffuses back into the alveoli from the blood this is due to the low blood solubility of nitrous oxide and result in dilution of inspired oxygen concentration and hypoxia and dilution of inspired carbon dioxide concentration and subsequent decrease in arterial carbon dioxide concentration leading to reduce in respiratory drive that is the this is because of this is known as diffusion hypoxia the risk persists only for the only for the initial 3 to 5 minute of discontinued nitrous oxide therefore it is appropriate to initiate recovery with 100% oxygen inhalation to prevent diffusion hypoxia but long exposure to the nitrous oxide can result in bone marrow depression and even neurological deficiencies because of possible low tetragenic effect nitrous oxide is often avoided in patient who are pregnant nitrous oxide may also alter the immunogenic response to infection by affecting chemotaxic and motility of new polymorph leukocytes nitrous oxide is contraindicated in air embolism pneumothorax acute intracranial prostrucion intracranial layer closed cavities because nitrous oxide is 35 times more soluble than nitrogen in blood 
Thus, it has a tendency to diffuse into the air containing cavities more rapidly than nitrogen is absorbed into the bloodstream. Attempt to replace nitrous oxide with other gases lead to the discovery of xenon. Xenon has been suggested as an ideal inhalational agent. It is a stable, non bio transferable, non toxic, non non flammable non irritant and have a low blood gas partial coefficient it the norm is a chemical element with the symbol xc and atomic number 54 it is a colorless heavy odorless noble gas that occur in the atmosphere in a trace amount the norm is a high affinity nmda receptor antagonist the norm inhibit uh, nicotinic acetylcholine alpha 4 beta 2 receptor which contribute to a spinal mediated analgesia. Comp uh, compared with the volatile anesthetic and propofol, anesthetic emergence is faster with xenon. It shortened time to extubation, associated with a better neurological outcome. Xenon was due to a faster emergence and with a better early post-operative cognitive recovery and the most and a, a more stable intraoperative Hemodynamic response. It is a sympathetic stimulator and better maintains systolic, diastolic, and mean arterial pressure and reduces heart rate. The disadvantages are because of high density and viscosity, the air resistance is greater as compared to other inhalational agents. Xenon is the only inhalational agent that causes a decrease in respiratory rate, and it is also associated with the high incident of post operative nausea, vomiting, and high cost. Now there is a comparison of xenon with nitrous oxide. As you can see, the diffusion of oxia is not there with xenon, but with uh, nitrous oxide. And there is a uh, gas expansion is also there with nitrous and not with the xenon. Now coming to the diethyl ether. It is prepared originally by the sweet oil of vitriol. It is introduced in profession by Morton on October 16, 1846, and the classical stage in pain anesthesia is described using ether. Now coming to physical uh, physical property, it is a colorless pungent violet liquid, or volatile liquid. Blood gas solubility is 12, MAC is 2 to 3. It is relatively inert, stored in a cool, dark place, unaltered in the body, 80 to 90 percent by the lungs and 50% metabolized in the liver. It is infl inflammable in air and, ex and explode in oxygen, in the presence of oxygen. <laughs> Effect on the organs are increases the heart rate first and later the heart rate become normal. Blood pressure increases after first uh, the first year and there is a vasomotor center paralyzing deeper plane. It also increases sympathetic activity because of the secretion of non adrenaline. On the cardiac output, lighter plane increases the cardiac output, but deeper plane, it decreases the cardiac output. Arrhythmia is rare with the ether and is safer to arrhythmia with arrhythmia. On respiratory system, respiration increases, respiratory increase increases first and then later on decreases. Since it is irritant, ether vapor irritant and increased secretion, it can cause laryngospasm, but it dilates bronchial vas muscular, but dilates bronchial musculature. It depresses, it increases cerebral blood flow and increases cerebral blood CSF pressure. On sympathetic nervous system, increases catecholine level, increases heart rate, it increases protection of glycogen, so glycogen, so increases blood pressure. It dilates gut and inhibition of and inhibit the movement of gut and the dilatation of pupil. On uh, alimentary system, post open nausea vomit is more than 50%. There is stimulation of salivary gland and gastric ectony. Advantages are it related non-toxic, safe and potent, cheap, can be used without sophisticated apparatus, excellent relaxation, maintain BB and no tendency to arrhythmia. Because, but because of disadvantage, it has not been used now. Because of increased secretion, induction and recovery is slow, and mainly it is inflammable, explode and spark flame, and can cause large laryngospans. So, better agents are available. So, it is not used now.
Now coming to the halothane. Halothane is a halogenated alkenes. Synthesized in 1951, it is non-flammable, non-explosion, non-explosive nature. Thymol is a preservative and stored in amber color water to retard spontaneous oxidative decomposition. MAC is 0.7%. It is the most potent inhalational agent. It has a low blood gas coefficient of 2.5. So an induction of NSA is really rapid. Pleasant order. It is used as an inducing agent for predatory population, but CO frain is better. An effect of different organs. A dose dependent reduction of arterial blood pressure occurs, which is due to direct myocardial depression. Two MAC of halothane result in 50% decrease in blood pressure and cardiac output. Although halothane is a coronary artery vasodilator, it also decreases coronary blood flow due to the drop in systemic arterial pressure. Adequate my but but adequate myocardial provision is usually maintains as oxygen demand also drops. Normally hypotension inhibit normally hypotension inhibit better receptor in in the aortic arch and corrupted bifurcation, causing a decrease in vagal stimulation and compensatory rise in heart rate. However, halothin blunt this reflex. And there is slowing of uh, SA node conduction may result in injection of rhythm or bradycardia. In infant, halothane decreases cardiac output by combining of disease, by combination of decreased heart rate and depressed myocardial contractibility. However, halothane interferes with slow calcium channel conduction. This leads to halogen causing sensitization of heart to the rhythmogenic effect of epinephrine. So that a dose of epinephrine above 1.5 mics per kg should be avoided. On respiratory system, halothane typically causes rapid and shallow breathing. The increased respiratory rate is not enough to counter the decreased tidal volume. So alveolar ventilation drops and resting partial pressure of CO2 is elevated. Halothane attenuate arterial airway reflexes and relax smooth bronchial smooth muscle by inhibiting intracellular calcium metamobilization. Mm -hmm. Halothane is a potent bronchodilator and is often and often refers asthma induced bronchospasm. In fact, halothane is the best bronchodilator among the currently available volatile anesthetics. Halothane also depresses clearance of mucosa from the respiratory tract, promoting post operative hypoxia and atelectasis. On the cerebral circulation, halothane Lower cerebral vascular resistance increases cerebral blood flow. Autoregulation is blunted. Concomitant rise in intracellular pressure can be prevented by establish hyper, establishing hyperventilation prior to the administration of halothane. Cerebral activity decrease leading to electro EEG slowing and modus reduction is oxygen requirement. Halothane potentiate neuro non depolarizing muscle neuromuscular blocking agent and it is also a trigger agent for malignant hyperthermia. It reduces renal blood flow, to GFR and renal output. It relaxes, it relaxes uterine muscle, may cause port pattern hemorrhage. Decreases blood flow proportion to the depression of the cardiac output. Two major type of hepatotoxic associated with halothane administration, type 1 hepatotoxin type hepatotoxicity. First we will discuss type 1 hepatotoxicity. It is a benign self limited relative common and is marked by mild transient increase in serum transaminase and glutathione as transferase concentration. Hepatotoxicity is not characterized by jaundice or clinical evident hepatocellular disease. Result from It results from the reductive myotransformation of halothane rather than the normal oxidative pathway. It does not occur following administration of other volatile anesthetic because they are metabolized to a lesser degree and by different pathway than halogen. Coming to the type 2 hepatotoxin, and also, it is also called halothane hepatitis. It is associated with massive central lobular liver necrosis that lead to fulminant liver failure. The fatality rate is around 50% and it is characterized by fever, jaundice, grossly elevated serum transaminase level. Hepatotoxicity appear to be immune-mediated, immune halothane oxidized, oxidized, metabolized, producing trifluoroacetyl metabolite to an intermediate compound. These metabolites bind 
liver protein and it is genetically and genetically predispositable antibodies are formed to this metabolite protein complex these antibodies in turn mediate mediate uh, mediate subsequent type 2 toxicity volatiles and acetyls other than halogen also have the potential to cause type 2 hypersensitive type 2 hypertoxicity the risk factor for hepatic hepatitis are multiple exposures prior history of post and acetyl liver fever or failure fever or jaundice obesity female sex middle age genetic predisposition enzyme inductions inducers high est and bilirubin level pre existing liver disease itself is not a risk factor for health and hepatitis contraindication helothin should not be used in unexplained liver dysfunction following previous exposure it should not be used in intracranial mass patient because of possibility of intracranial hypertension hypovolemic patient and patient with severe cardiac disease may not tolerate halothin induced negative anotropic effect and and sensitization of heart to catabolic limits the usefulness of halothin when ex, when exogenous f, um, epinephrine and mister or in a patient with few chromocytoma now coming to the enfluorine it is isomer of isoflurane mag is 1.68 it is sweet and sweet order and generally do not sensitize the heart to the catecholamines now coming to the systemic effect the administration of allopurine has been known to decrease systemic vascular resistance this effect causes decreased blood pressure it also causes concentration dependent decrease in heart rate and increased left atrial pressure on respiratory system it is a Inhalation agent has been shown to have protein, potent bronchodilator property. Along with the bronchodilator, inhalation necessarily decreases airway responsiveness and reduces histamine-induced bronchospasm. In, in, in on the neurology, it increases cerebral blood flow in comparison to the halothin. Seizure occurs at a deeper level and contraindicated in epileptic patient. Side effect is hepatotoxic and it is also neurotox uh, nephrotoxic because of flor fluoride. Now coming to the isoflurane. Isoflurane is an isomer of influrane. It is non-flammable, col colorless, volatile liquid, stable, no preservatives is required. It has a rapid induction. It is pungent smelling. So can produce cough, breath holding. It has a low blood gas partial consumption of 1.4, so rapid induction and recovery. On the effect on the organ, on the cardiovascular, it causes minimum cardiac depression. Cardiac output is maintained by rise in heart rate due to partial pres preservation of carotid baroreceptors. Mild beta adrenogenic stimulation that lead to decreased systemic vascular resistance causes decreased arterial blood pressure. It increases coronary, it dilate coronary artery lead to coronary steel syndrome on respiratory system. It, it is a respiratory depressant. Tachypnea is less pronounced as compared to other volatile anesthetics agent. The neck defect is a pronounced fall in, pronounced fall in minute ventilation. Due to, due to its tendency to irritate upper airway reflexes, idophrenia is considered as a, as a bronchodilator but not as a potent as halothane. Coming to the cerebral circulation, at concentration greater than 1 mag, isoflurane increases cerebral blood flow and intracranial pressure. These effects are reversed by hyperventilation. Isoflurane reduces cerebral metabolic oxygen requirement and at mag of 2, it produces an electrical silent EEG. EEG suppress provides some degree of brain protection during episode of cerebral ischemia. Isoflurane relaxes skeleton muscle. It also decreases cerebral blood flow, GFR, and urine output. Advantages are it has rapid induction and recovery, little risk of hepatic or renal toxicity, cerebrovascular stability is there, muscle relaxation is there, epinephrine can be administered safely in a dose of up to 4.5 max per kg. But disadvantages are pungent smell, coronary vascular lead to coronary artery syndrome. Now coming to the desflurane, it has a structure similar to that of isoflurane, pungent smell, expensive, 
expensive agent blood pressure coefficient is 0.25 the low solubility of desflurane in blood and blood tissue cause a very rapid wash in and wash out of anesthetic anesthesia therefore the alveolar concentration of the desflurane approach is inspired concentration much more rapid than the other volatile agent giving the anesthesiologist tighter control over anesthetic anesthesia level the recovery time is approximately 50% less than that of isoflurane it is eliminated by lung primary only and 0.025% in metabolized in the liver the vapor pressure of desflurane is at 20 degree temperature is 681 mm of mercury this problem necessitated the development of a special heated electronic precise vaporizer tech 6 a high vapor pressure and so a high vapor pressure and ultra short duration of action and moderate potency are the most characteristic feature of desflurane now coming to the systemic effect on the cardiovascular it has a similar effect it has similar effect to isoflurane in increase the heart rate and decreases both mean arterial pressure and systemic vascular resistance while maintaining cardiac output unlike isoflurane desflurane does not cause coronary steel syndrome on respiratory system it causes decrease in tidal volume and increase in respiratory rate since it is a pungent and and uh, irritated airway during induction uh, during induction uh, during desflurane induction can be caused by salivation breach cough and laryngeal spasm these problem make desflurane less than ideal suited for inhalation induction on the cerebral vascular effect it dilate the cerebral vascular leading to cerebral blood flow and increase intracranial pressure countering the decrease in cerebral vascular resistance is a marked decline in the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen that tend to cause cerebral vascular constriction and moderate any increase in cerebral blood flow it also has a skeletal muscle relaxant in a dose dependent memory and isoflurane there is no evidence of any nephrotoxic and hepatic function is also preserved counter indications of cerebral desflurane is mainly it should not be used severe severe hypovolemia patient having a history of malignant hyperthermia and intracranial hypertension regarding drug interaction epinephrine can be administered safely in a dose up to 4.5 mg per kg as a desflurane does not sense the myocardium to the arrhythmogenic effect of epinephrine desflurane emergence but desflurane emergence has been associated with delirium in some pediatric population now coming to the sevoflurane it is non flammable pleasant smelling nor irritant stable cost is about 10 times more than the isoflurane mac varies from 1.4 to 3.3% it has a low blood gas partial coefficient of 0.65 so it is a rapid fall in aerobic concern and as a concern upon discontinuation and a more rapid emergence compared with isoflurane on the systemic effect sevoflurane mildly depressed myocardial contractility Cystic vascular resistance and arterial blood pressure declines slightly less than that with isoflurane or desflurane. There is no evidence that sevoflurane is associated with coronary steel syndrome, but it may prolong the QT interval on the respiratory system with no irritant and very less respiratory depression. Cerebrovascular same as isoflurane effect on uh, on the neuromuscular effect. Sevoflurane has the same neuromuscular effect. Uh, they produce sevoflurane produce adequate muscle relaxation for intubation of child following a inhalational induction advantages of sevoflurane are since it is non pungenting and rapid increase in alveolar anesthetic concentration makes sevoflurane as an excellent choice for smooth and rapid inhalation induction in pediatric and adult population rapid induction and recovery In fact, inhalation induction with four to eight percent sevoflurane in fifty percent mixture of nitric oxide oxygen can be achieved in approximately one to three minutes. It does not synthesize the myocardium to the catecholamine as much as halothen, and do not result in carbon monoxide and do not result in carbon monoxide production with the dry soda lime. Disadvantages is are it is less potent than the similar halogenated agents. Oh. interact with carbon dioxide absorption in the presence of soda lime and more with the sodium lime compound a is produced which is toxic to brain liver and kidney about 5% of 
is metabolized and there is elevation serum for a level that lead to concern about the risk of renal toxicity. Post-operative analgesia may be more common in children than seen in halogen. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Sanjeev, for nice uh, and detailed representation on inhalation anesthetic agents. Any question from the audience? No, ma'am, there are no questions. Okay, we can wrap now. Yeah. Thank you, Nitin. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentations. Thank you, ma'am, for being there. Thank you. वैसे रोल लेके आता है We'll take two minutes break and we'll shortly resume after the two minutes break. Welcome back. We'll begin with our last session for the day. Yeah, now I now I joined. Yeah. Welcome, sir. Thank you. So for this session, I would like to invite Dr. R. P. Gedu. So is Professor in Anesthesia and Head of the Department Pain Medicine at D.Y. Patil Medical College, Navid, Mumbai. So his area of keen interest are difficult airway, cancer pain, acute pain service, cancer and anesthesia. So he has several achievements to his credit. 
partner and paper setter for MTA, HGT, and PDCCAs, has been an editor of 9 and 28 chapters, has been a faculty for various international conferences and uh, countries. So has more than 400 lectures in national and international conferences and has been selected as a specialist in anesthesiology by NBE and is selected as a conven convener for pain medicine fellowship by NBE. We welcome you, sir. It's a pleasure to have you. you as a chairperson for this session. Over Thank to you, you sir, for the proceedings of this. Yeah. Now, I think uh, there's a very nice speaker, Dr. Rakesh Garg, who's going to speak on to the vaporizers. Both, I think, old and new vaporizers. I'm sure that it will be very useful for all the PG students who are going to be appearing for MD, DA, DNB, etc. So, Rakesh Garg normally doesn't need any introduction, but recently has been elected as a uh, editor for the Indian Journal of Anasya, which is the most proud moment for him also. So, Rakesh, you can join. Start. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for the kind words and uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor MD Kaur, Madam, and the whole team of RML for this kind invite for uh, this uh, <coughs> academic extension of APEC 2023. So I take you through uh, vaporizers, which is one of the uh, very important aspect uh, when we talk about the clinical aspect or when we talk about the uh, exam point of view, because uh, we should be aware of the vaporizers as a whole, though we may not be using the older vaporizers, but to understand the basic principles, it is very, very essential that we should understand them appropriately so that the interpretation or the limitations of the older vaporizers or the improvement which is required in these vaporizers can be added on to the subsequent one. So this is important. Silence, silence, please. So vaporizer is an instrument designed to facilitate the change of a liquid anesthetic into its vapor. And the other important aspect is when this change into liquid anesthetic into a vapor uh, and the controlled amount of this vapor should be added to the flow of gases. And this is what is required uh, when you talk about the uh, vaporizers part When you talk about uh, the delivery of a particular liquid anesthetic is then to a patient system so that we know a control amount going on. And this is the basic, you can say, a basic overview function of the vaporizer. Now, just to summarize it once again, the function of vaporizers is to produce vaporization of a vaporizer, mix vapor with the fresh gas flow, and control the mixture despite the variables. So there would be change in the various gas flows, and there will be change in the dial settings. So a vaporizer should be such that they can control those mixtures and the delivery of the uh, anesthetic agents remains constant uh, during the anesthetic management. And that's the basic purpose of any vaporizer to deliver safe and accurate concentrations of inhalation anesthetic agent to the patient. And that is the reason that uh, the vaporizers has been modified and they have been advanced into the recent one, which ensures the safe and accurate delivery which was not present in the older versions. If we divide the uh, vaporizers, they come uh, into uh, various types. Uh, primarily, they can be, or very broadly, they can be divided into plenum, drawer, or inhaler type of vaporizer. So as you go along with, I will just take you through, uh, through these type of uh, three vaporizers. When we take a so, uh, vaporizer as plenum vaporizer, in this, the fresh gas flow is pushed into the vaporizer and it has a high resistance. When we say drawer, here the gas is pulled into the vaporizer by the patient's own efforts, the respiratory efforts, and they usually are Goldman resistance. And if you use uh, the, the older versions like Goldman and EMOs, they were drawer type of vaporizers. When we talk about the inhaler vaporizers, uh, it's basically a drawer vaporizer in which the carrier gas is air, and that's what they're called as inhaler vaporizers. Now, uh, how do we divide this uh, vaporizers into various classification? Uh, these classification are not very well described uh, into the literature as the vaporizers has progressed from one uh, no, uh, category to the other category. They have been a recent, uh, or they have been a uh, no, recent updation of uh, these vaporizers. So what I have done is, uh, this is not my classification, but I have tried to put it into the classification 
based on the journey of vaporizer. So this is what I have tried to uh, do it for you, for the residents so that they can understand the older and the newer vaporizers. And when we say the oldest classification of vaporizers, basically uh, the oldest classification because we are using the older vaporizers, which has uh, less safety margin and they have many other issues. And that's why they were uh, classified on the basis of these five parameters. So when you, in the exam, when anybody asks you a vaporizer, you should try to describe those vaporizers based on these five things. That what is the method of regulating output concentration? What is the method of vaporization? What is the method of location or what is the uh, vaporizer located? Whether it is compensated or not, whether it is specific to a particular agent or multiple agent. But as the vaporizers progresses, there were some changes in the in the uh, classification, and then uh, those classification was primarily uh, based on not on the location because uh, most of these vaporizers were uh, in circuit, and then they were based on resistance, the plenum and the low resistance, and that's why they come up. But if you see the recent vaporizers, the new classification of vaporizers primarily. It is based on three basic principles or three basic categories you can classify them. Methods of regulating output concentration, that is variable bypass in electronic uh, ways, like majority of uh, prices now are based on the electronic version. And this decides that how much is the gas coming out of it. Method of vaporization, flow over or injection. So this is what, where the anesthetic agent, the liquid agent is being delivered into the gas and that has been delivered to the patient, whether it is in the form of a flow over, means the patients, the, the gases flow over, over the liquid anesthetic agents and it picks up. The other version of method of vaporization injection in which a known quantity of a liquid agent is thrown into the gas mixture and then it converts into vaporizer and is being delivered to the patient. And third is the temperature compensation, whether we talk about the mechanical, supplied heat or computerized. So these are the uh, the three basic mechanisms which decides that how the output of a vaporizer will be taken care of. Because as we know, as the uh, liquid is changed into vapor, it will take up the heat and it becomes cooler. If it becomes cooler, the chances of changing from liquid to uh, vapor, uh, vapors will come down and the delivery will go down. That's why we have to maintain a temperature because we want an accurate and sustained delivery which we have targeted on our vaporizers. And that's why uh, these compensatory mechanisms has to be there, uh, which can be mechanical, supplied heat, or computerized. So these are the three classification, but just for the postgraduates, uh, there is nothing called the uh, three classification. This is what I have done a couple of years back uh, when I was uh, you know, looking for the classification, and I have put it on the base of the evolution of classification of vaporizers. Now let's come to the older vaporizers. I, I am sure that the next session after me will be taking you to the newer vaporizers, but let's see what old vaporizers we were using and what specific uh, or uh, the requirement or how do we use them. Uh, I'm sure uh, Dr. Gedu must have used all those uh, older versions of uh, vaporizers and he will be the best person to add on to his practical experience. But what I have seen from the museums and heard from my teachers these are the various methods that are available. The earlier methods used to be the open drop method in which uh, the inhalation anesthesia by vaporization of a liquid anesthetic agent was uh, by using a, a specific bottle was dropped on a gauze mask covering the mouth and nose. And these devices where this was being done was on the Schimmelbus mask, uh, which was subsequently had more modifications like Yonkor or Bellamy Gardner bottle, which we used to put the drops on these. And then these drops were counted and accordingly, depending on the depth of anesthesia, these were being used. Subsequently, there were semi-open methods in which a frame was added uh, to keep the ether in an enclosed area, permitted some degree of uh, rebreathing. And there were uh, these semi-open type of uh, vaporizers, so-called vaporizers were Augustan inhaler, Junkers, chloroform operators, or flax scan. Now, these were the initial vaporizers that were being used earlier. So first one, if you can see this picture first left of a corner is the Schimmelbus mask. Uh, then comes the Yonkers mask and then comes the uh, Bellany Garden wire mask, the dropper. And if you see in between, uh, uh, this, this was a dropper in which this was attached to a bottle and the number of drops that needs to be dropped onto this mask, which was covered with a gauze piece, uh, will decide that 
how much should be the depth of fantasy? I'll, I'll uh, take you through those uh, uh, models also. So these are the various mass which were subsequently uh, you know, modified into various aspects. But if you see, uh, the most common was uh, about the Shimalmos and Yonkers, which was the most commonest uh, mask used in the earlier days. But uh, they were modified uh, as per the requirement of the patient's delivery of safe uh, anesthetic agents, uh, the early anesthetic agents that were being used for it. Now, the semi-open method has a uh, covered area where they would have a, a closed uh, uh, wired mask wherein the gauze piece was attached, like in this uh, Augustan mask with Schumann was framed, wherein they were covered with uh, some amount of gauze, a particular number of layers of the gauzes, and then uh, the, the uh, anesthetic agent which was to be delivered was using in a drop-wise controlled manner using equipments like flex scan. And this flex scan will deliver the number of drops of a particular anesthetic agent into the patient, onto this mask, and that will be delivered to the patients with breathing of first. But subsequently, uh, if you see the, uh, the earlier mask was uh, uh, too uh, basic, the control was uh, very manual and delivery was uh, very uncontrolled. So it was not uh, no, uh, fair enough to have a very safe and controlled uh, delivery of these anesthetic agents. And that's why there was an evolution of vaporizers and the first uh, um, no, you know, structured way which came up is the Morton ether Sinella, uh, which uh, you all are aware of uh, was demonstrated also. Now, how to use this mask for the uh, delivery of anesthetic agents? So it will be important from uh, understanding point of view. Let me see the open ether method and you see this a similar bus mask is the bottle with a dropper. And if you want to use uh, this, this uh, if you see this is covered with some amount of gauze and it used to be when you are using ether, it has to be 16 layers. If you are using chloroform, it has to be 12 layers of this gauze mask. And then you drop them and you drop the, uh, uh, the uh, whatever ether uh, as per the drops. And during inspiration, the air will pass through this uh, gauze, which is on the mask, and this will convert into the uh, vaporized form. And then it will be delivered to the patients. And this is the uh, bottle that uh, gives an, the delivery of the calculated number of drops. And this is one of the bottles called Bellamy Garden Dropper Bottle, amber colored, controlled on pouring capacity of 90 ml of ether. Now, based on the uh, depth of anesthesia that you require, you need to give the number of drops appropriately. So to start with in the ether, uh, it is to be the first minute, we start with 12 drops, it will give 1%. In second minute, 25 drops, 30 percent, and this is how you increase the number of drops so that you can attain the desired uh, depth of anesthesia. For ethyl chloride, the uh, first minute 30 drops, and then you increase to 60 and 90 drops for these patients, so that uh, uh, you can have the depth of anesthesia, which is primarily based on the number of drops using your dedicated bottle that you deliver to the mask. During the maintenance, because as I mentioned earlier. Uh, when the liquid agent is changed into the vaporization, it will take up, up some heat and the surrounding structure, that is the gauze piece, will get cooled up. It will get a heat loss and uh, there will be change in the room temperature at the level of the mass. And that's why uh, with time, it will be the delivery of the uh, anesthetic agents will be much less. And that's why uh, sometimes you need to have some heated up or some gas pieces needs to be changed up so that uh, they can they can have uh, delivery of the gases uh, which uh, continues uh, to the patients. Also, we need to understand that uh, whenever the composition of the gases uh, of the agents, like when we want to use a 10% ether, there will be a proportionate decrease in the percentage of oxygen also around the mass. And we should be careful because the patient is breathing room air. And that's why there will be a proportionate decrease in the oxygen concentration and that you need to remember. The advantage is a very special it's simple equipment. You don't require any electricity or any specialized operators for this type of patients. And hence, it was easy, low dead space, low distance, wide margin of sound is relatively cheap and can be done at any places. But yes, it has many disadvantages. That's why we require to have better agents, significant rebreathing, hypoxic mixture, as I just mentioned, poor control, inability to assist or control ventilation if the patient becomes too deep, no conservation of heat or humidity, difficult airway management pollution of the operating room and hazardous, especially with flame. And then what comes up with the in-system vaporizers. In-system means the vaporizer is into the breathing system. So there are two ways that gas goes to the vaporizer that will be the push through or the drawer. And hence, based on this, uh, uh, the, the type of vaporizers were taken up. Drawer means uh, 
it uh, in, in the our system it provides an SCR without the supply of compressed gases and the main carrier gas in these patients is the atmospheric air which is taken up by the patients on respiratory efforts and then the agent is added to it which is inhaled by the patient by a non rebreathing valve so this is what a drawer system is and this is how it looks like of a drawer vaporizer wherein patients try to breathe in and the inspiratory air which is going down they will pick up some of the anesthetic gases and that will be delivered to the patient for required amount of the anesthetic gas the components of a drawer circuit uh, this is one of the very basic and very useful uh, equipment that was used for a very long time uh, which requires an oxford inflating valves for ventilating the patients a uh, vaporizer uh, which can be combined with the other also and then the breathing circuit which goes to the patient and the patient can be ventilated using this mask and the valves and this may also be connected to the oxygen so this is one of the uh, one of the uh, very uh, i think uh, combination which has been used over very long period and uh, the use of emos uh, is still happening in some parts of the world uh, because this is one of the very sturdy and good type of vaporizer so this emo vaporizer uh, you need to see it once while well, request that um, you just go to your museums or any big uh, back city uh, hospital you must be able to see this emo vaporizers it has certain parts into it so there is an uh, area where the uh, outlet will be there there will be a part of inlet which can be connected to which patient inhales the air there will be a dial where you can see the percentage of uh, the volatile agent that is being set you need to fill from this aspect uh, the volatile agent and you can see the level here and there will be certain um, uh, safety features also the indicators will be there uh, in this uh, which will indicate the level of the ether which are there you need to remember the full form it's a pestin mackintosh oxford vaporizer and uh, this is usually used in combination with an uh, bellows uh, which i just mentioned and the assembly i showed so i mentioned initially i showed you the classification uh, which i have tried to made it for you and this classification if you try to use it for emo it is concentration calibrated flow over with wick in system temperature compensation agent specific so in exam this will be a very important aspect that if you are asked with any vaporizer you need to define based on the classification that i just showed you and based on this you need to at least specify that what is the functionality of this uh, vaporizer and this is how you need to speak it and this is how this vaporizer actually works so this will itself indicates the various functional aspects of the vaporizer now when we say this uh, this type of vaporizers uh, uh, if you see the demography of these uh, of uh, demography of these uh, type of vaporizers they they are around uh, uh, 6 kg to 12 kg they are little heavy they can have 40 ml of ethers they have inlet for air and they are uh, they can take up ether chloroform trilin and halothane they can be used for multiple agents now uh, if you see the uh, markings here uh, the level indicator uh, it will start moving once the 150 ml of ether has been put it up and it can take up 300 ml of the anesthetic agents into it is and these are marked with inlet and outlet and you can see the control lever um you can you need to change these control levers as per depending upon what whatever the agents you are using it now you need to understand that uh, it has one of the safety feature which is a temperature indicator if you see this picture this temperature indicator is there which has a black and red bands uh, in this so as i mentioned earlier that uh, because any volatile agent is dependent upon the heat consumption for changing from liquid to vapor format so if the temperature is more than 32 degrees celsius a red uh, red band you can see here is visible uh, you can see it from outside and this means the temperature is above the working range probably the delivery of the gases volatile agent will be much more and you should be cautious uh, when you are using them uh, it usually has an uh, reservoir outside this uh, equipment uh, which contains uh, almost uh, uh, 1.25 liters of water and this is like a heat reservoir it is like a heat sink basically and this tries to you know uh, maintain the temperature of, of these patients thermo compensation happens in this because i mentioned earlier with change in temperature the output can change so it has certain thermo compensatory mechanism at the outlet of the vaporizing chamber metal bellows liquid ether so this is connected to a plunger which i just showed you this is the plunger 
and this is connected to this um, equipment which provides a little amount of thermal compensation at a range of 15 to 29 degrees Celsius. And obviously the water jacket serves as a heat reservoir. And uh, you need to understand the uh, working of this chamber uh, as just show you the classification for it. So whenever the fresh gas, the air goes inside this, it will be distributed through the bypass channel or the direct uh, mixing chamber. So when it goes bypass, some amount will go directly. Some will go into the vaporizing chamber. And you can see there is a thermocompensate area which I was just talking about. So this is a touch section of the EMO. And here it, it will pick up uh, the amount of gases as required as you have done on the dial settings. So based on this, uh, uh, this uh, gas, carrier gas, will pick up the volatile agent. And then this will make up, mix up with the bypass air and this goes to the outlet. So this is how the flow of the gas with the vaporizing agents, vaporizer uh, with the anesthetic agents will go and you can control uh, these things. Now there are certain things uh, which we always talk about the uh, vaporizer is the evaluation. How do we know that this uh, the vaporizer is uh, delivering whatever have you mentioned on the, um, the uh, dial setting for these patients. So when we say the calibration of EMO is accurate for intermittent gas flow. So if you have extremes of gas, flow, say for example, say either one liter or say 20 liters, uh, the output may not be as safe as you have set on the dial. It will be highest concentration deliver 60% and that's why uh, these percentages may change. Splashing duration, uh, it, it can splash during transit. There is an option to, if you keep it in the on position, it can splash and if you start then using the vaporizer, it will deliver a very high concentration and you should be very cautious not to put this vaporizer once it is on and you have shifted from one place to other and that's why you should be a little cautious. Now these are the bellows uh, which were used with it. There are six bellows you can see. Uh, each can take up 150 ml uh, of uh, the uh, air so you can deliver about 900 ml when you're ventilating. You do not need to deliver 900 ml but uh, there is a special technique of using it. It has two unidirectional walls you can see and you can see this magnet here which is sometimes used uh, uh, for uh, for the patient with uh, uh, spontaneous versus manual ventilation. So this is how the assembly is being used for ventilating. You can see this is the vaporizer, this is the bellows, and this is being connected to a surgery to the patient. Surgery is ongoing and he is ventilating the patient. So this is how the surgery was done using this type of vaporizers. Now, uh, when the spontaneous ventilation is required, uh, uh, as I just mentioned, there should not be no magnet. Uh, the wall should be active if you want to. Uh, put the patient on uh, assisted ventilation or controlled ventilation, a magnet needs to be put over here. In a pediatric space, uh, in, in a pediatric population, uh, uh, you need to add on some oxygen because it has a lot of dead space, so it may not be good for uh, uh, the pediatric patient and you should avoid using magnet as mentioned for the balance. Now, there's an additional thing that was being added by the Indian uh, uh, researcher, which is uh, Brigadier Rama Rao. Uh, which has attached to the inlet of EMO, uh, which can give more oxygen. I mentioned earlier that the inlet just have the air, but when you want to give a patient more oxygen, this type of adapter, which was added to the inlet, provided more amount of oxygen to the patient, and hence the safety was probably increased. Now, I think uh, I will just wait for uh, just uh, 10 seconds. Uh, you just think of this vaporizer and just put on your chat at which is this vaporizer. Rakesh, you are disconnected. So I'm back. I'm just giving them uh, just 10 seconds to think of the answer. Sir. So this uh, vaporizer was Oxford Miniature Vaporizer. This Oxford Miniature Vaporizer uh, uh, is, if you, I just come go back to the initial classification that I showed you. So this is a thermally buffered vaporizer. And if you need to classify the specificity of this vaporizer, it should be concentration calibrated, flow over with wick, temperature compensation by supplied heat, low resistance, can operate as plenum vaporizer, and you can use halothane, trialene, and methoxyfluorine. Uh, and this you can see on the dial setting for these vaporizers. And this is a very uh, versatile vaporizer and it was used to a large extent. And it has a water jacket around it, and it can have uh, approximately 
1060 grams of uh, full water jacket and this is what i was mentioning about the uh, heat sink or uh, you can say uh, thermal composition can happen uh, via this uh, the water jacket which is uh, present here the initially one night it was having a small uh, volume for the you know, volatile agent but the newer versions which were uh, you know, subsequently made for omb they can accommodate more and that you can use even for a uh, um, you know, bigger surgeries the if you see if you remember there was an arrow which is mentioned here you can see here so this is the arrow this will uh, specify that the gas goes from this side to this side and this is the patient and so this will confirm that this is going to the right direction. You can use it for various agents, halothane, isoforin, chloroform, methoxyfluorine. And they, they are, if you see this dial, this dial is for different agents. So whatever agents you are using it, you need to change the dial, put the other dial for all these agents uh, because they were different uh, calibrations and you can use uh, this for uh, various cases. The thermal compensation uh, was uh, using a reservoir of glycol uh, within this uh, structure. Uh, which acts like an uh, heat sink for this, which is glycol with water, 25% glycol with water. And this can, uh, this was designed basically for a flow rate of 3 to 8 liters uh, or a draw rate of 4 to 10. And if you go beyond these flows, the output may not be as safe as your dial setting. So this was calibrated at these flow rates for its more accuracy. It has a special filler for filling the anesthetic gases into it. Uh, it has a safety mechanism, a light pressure air relief. So when you put it, it will have air relief, and then it opens up the filler, and then you can go ahead and put up uh, your your anesthetic agents into it. Now it can be uh, combined combined with EMO. I showed you a figure earlier, and this performance is uh, can be even used not only for spontaneous but also for uh, intermittent pressure, uh, positive pressure ventilation, and hence it was used in combination. So do not use this in a circle system because they can produce very high concentration and uh, it only holds a small volume, so it needs to be filled up. But subsequently, as mentioned, uh, a bigger vaporizer, OMB vaporizer was also coming, which can be used for major surgical procedures. Then subsequently, the another uh, old vaporizers, uh, which was not into a practice too long as compared to the OMVs uh, and EMO I mentioned, uh, Bryce Smith induction unit. So this uh, facilitates selection of the ether and acidia along with the halothane, and this is how they were being used. So this is a combination unit. And this was connected to the outlet of EMO, which I showed earlier. Um, they, they can be used in combination with it, and it delivers halothane uh, 2 to 4% for 3 to 5 minutes. So any guess for this vaporizer? Another 10 seconds for you. So this one is a Goldman vaporizer. Again, uh, just remember classification. I think uh, you will be getting these slides. Uh, you can just remember this classification. This is concentration calibrated, flow without weak, no temperature compensation, multiple agent halothane trialing in and out of systems. And this uh, Goldman vaporizer, you can see the, uh, the previous one were having a metallic sheet, but here is a, is a glass bowl which is there, and there's a capacity of 20 cc, and this can be attached uh, to the uh, circuit with bypass and vaporizing chamber and the gases goes into this and they pick up some volatile agent and goes out. And on the on the top you can see there's a dial setting uh, which you can uh, turn on as per your requirement. Subsequently, if you want to increase the concentration because uh, it can maximum deliver 2.21 percentage of the anesthetic agents. So there was an addition of wick into it and it was called as young modification. And if you want uh, for the higher concentration, you can use it in series. Uh, to such the Goldman vaporizers and it's called false modification. And these uh, Goldman vaporizers were subsequently uh, you know, made into three different type of uh, specifications as Mark 1, Mark 2 and Mark 3, which has uh, advantages over it uh, based on the a little bit of uh, different mechanisms. The self locks uh, in the off position was the feature of Mark 1 and it can deliver up to 3% for these agents. Now, depending upon the flow of the gases that you're delivering to these patients, the flow, the output will change based on whatever agency you're using. So this type of uh, chart system was very useful for uh, these type of vaporizers. The raw Gotham vaporizer is a modification of Goldman vaporizers and uh, in which they have tried to make the uh, glass bottle a little bigger one and with a wick. And subsequently, we got an ether bottle which was used on the boils machine for very long. And this uh, boils bottle you need to classify as concentration calibrated, flow or bubble through, no temperature compensation, 
multiple agent can be used and out of system and you must have seen these type of bottles in a older version of uh, boils machine i have seen it a couple of times and this is what was being used if you see this uh, uh, this type of plunger which was there this was being used for uh, changing the concentration because this goes in and out and the gas flow which was going into it if you push the plunger in majority of air will go through the volatile agent thus increasing the concentration of the volatile agent they have uh, they, these boil bottles were separate for ether and trilene and uh, the volume was little different for these type of bottles similarly for the halothane bottles also now when we using boils bottle the issue was that the output would be affected by temperature of liquid the plunger level the control level position level of liquid eccentricity of food and agitation of vaporizer in fact agitation was used sometimes uh, at the induction to increase the concentration delivery of these patients but they were not very meaningful calibrated and hence becomes an issue they have certain uh, specific unique features uh, they have grease sometimes this can be a source of fire at in these patients also and that's why you got very very uh, needs to be you know keep them very clean uh, they require some amount of uh, replace packing the gland nut which was needs to be kept clearly for these patients so i'll just uh, leave you at this uh, new apparatus because uh, they were not in clinical use but yes like uh, the copper kettle bottle was being used you need to remember this classification measured flow bubble through out of system temperature compensated multiple agent and these type of vaporizers again uh, it's like a measured gas because the gas delivery which was been to these patients were being divided between the bypass channel and the uh, vaporizing chamber and then the, uh, the desired amount of uh, gases needs to be uh, you no know, calculated and then the output was as per the calculation that you have done for these patients uh they were acceptable over wide range of flows but uh, the temperature compensation was not good and hence delivery decreases with times and now what we come say i think this will be the next uh, half an hour or so you will be going through the procedure now vaporizers where because i mentioned in the beginning that the vaporizers were not very controlled so we need uh, vaporizers which can deliver precise concentration of the anesthetic agents and that's why the newer vaporizers which came to the market like tech series which was common one and uh, regular vapor nine and series are the precision vaporizers and i show that these new vaporizers be taken subsequent to my session by the subsequent speaker where they have certain safety mechanisms which were uh, not thought of and uh, incorporated for this limitations where not only the precise amount of uh, delivery of gases was there but also the concerns like the uh, tilting of these vaporizers or the backflow effect on these vaporizers which affect the concentration or the temperature compensation part was taken care in new vaporizers and the recent one that have been used uh, uh, you are aware of the desperate vaporizers and the cassette alanine cassette vaporizers which have uh, controlled by electronic gadgetry and uh, and the latest including the injection type of vaporizers so they are very well controlled electronically and computer uh, softwares and gives a very precise delivery with a good amount of safety margins so thank you so much and uh, over to you sir <clears throat> okay i think i'm not sure whether there is any question anybody going but i think it was very well covered by you but there are few things i just want to add can i add it rakesh yes sir absolutely sir See, there are few things that, you, for example, uh, as far as the mask is concerned, you said shimmel bush and all those things. Mm -hmm. But I must specify one more thing: that why the shimmel bush was originally designed only for the chloroform, because if you see the shimmel bush, it was being made as a wire frame into four pieces, so that when you pour on one or two side only, remaining was the air, so the less chance of hypoxia. While when the other mask came, Yonkers. there was a wire mesh above so even if you drop one drop it spreads uniformly was ether needed to be spread very nicely and ether never caused hypoxia that's the reason that was designed and one more thing that was not been told that was called hox mask which was basically designed for the pediatric which had it was a round shaped and there was a oxygen nipple behind so that the children do, don't get hypoxic so that was the one which was designed uh as far as the other things are concerned i think everything was covered well well if you see the emo emo originally was designed in such a way that it was 6 plus kg 6 and 1/2 kg 
they say if you go the historical way it has been said that this was basically designed for the war victims so that whenever it is being used so what happens for example if there is a war and i am there as an anesthetist i go there to if somebody is injured his leg is injured or something like that or a patient is very bad and i have to do some whatever debridement suturing over there only or uh, whatever it is <coughs> in that condition what i will do is they used to tell the people that we, yeah yeah we can, this? Like, we can continue i think somebody said hello yeah, i think that was accidentally done sir you can you can continue sir please and so that time what they do they used to basically air drop it with the parachute that's the reason it was made very heavy so that whenever i drop it it will drop exactly at the war site so it was made like that Six and a half kg. This is an important information, sir. Yeah. Another thing in Oxford, in uh, miniature vaporizer, there is also something to be added. In the good old days, the temperature compensation that was used in such a way that there was no water jacket around. Basically, there was a calcium chloride crystals which was kept on the sides of the vaporizer. If this is the vaporizer, these are the calcium chloride crystals that were kept side. So that whenever the patient is inhaling and expiring the air, that is the time the moisture from your expired air or from the temperature surrounding up the vaporizer drops down. So that water goes slowly into the calcium chloride crystal, and this calcium chloride crystal basically gets converted to CaCO3, and that chemical reaction induces the heat, and that heat was supplied to the vaporizer earlier. That is OMB vaporizer. And as far as what you said correctly, that is OMV and EMO, they were used together, and that was the one which was called as a EMO system. So not, I mean, EMO vaporizer is separate, and EMO system includes breathing circuit as well as OMV and EMO. So these are then one more uh, thing that was you know, we used to have. I have used maximum. There was something like a KM bottle or side bottle. This was very popularly used. I must have given more than five, five, six thousand anesthesia with that. It was again a vaporizer, which was a plastic one, which was a squarish bottle, plastic shape. Uh, I'm not sure whether you can be able to see that. It was the very best vaporizer that we have ever used. You can see this. I'm not sure whether you'll be able to appreciate this vaporizer. This one. This was in plastic shape, and there were a cap, steel cap on which there were multiple holes, so that the air can go through that. And this was used; it was just attached at the head end of the patient with a hook. And we used to give anesthesia to the level that so much is so. I mean, sometimes really, I think what we used to do was something uh, too much daring. Like we used to take the patient to the almost third, fourth stage. You feel fully dilated, something like that. And respiration is also not good. And that's the time I used to go out and have a cup of tea and then come back. Patient comes back into the third stage. So it was the best anesthetic I ever saw. In fact, so many camps wherever we have gone, we used to use the KM bottle. KM bottle was even less than your uh, plastic bottle weight. It was such a small bottle. KM bottle because of KM it was called, but otherwise we used to call it as a side bottle. This was one of the best one that was used in those days. Anything more you want me to add? Hey, thank you so much. I think uh, this is uh, coming from the uh, your personal experiences, and this is the treasure that we are getting from you. Thank you so much. Sir. Hey, Shimal Bush mask and all those things. I must have given more than. Five six thousand anesthesia with the Shimal Bush mask, but these are the things which we used to learn very nicely. I, I know. I think uh, I, I would request uh, you, and I will request the organizers also that uh, if you can uh, show the uh, youngsters like us uh, the use of these masks on a simulated patient sometime, uh, because uh, we have never seen those putting of these masks. We have seen always them in museum. So I would request uh, you have used so many. 
So if you can just come up sometime and have a video recording of uh, exactly how using them on a simulated uh, uh, yes. scenarios. I, think that I don't mind. I don't mind. Even in the summer season when you drop a ether, so the number of gauze pieces that are being kept was deciding according to the season. So if it is summer, we used to keep it 8 to 10 gauze pieces so that more of the liquid can be sustained there. Where if it is the winter, it was only 4 to 6 gauze pieces because the vaporization doesn't take place that rapidly when it is winter. So that was also being done over there. I think we'll have your experience and uh, Shweta is smiling, uh, thinking of something new, new generation. I don't know whether yeah, she is smiling. I don't know what's, why she is smiling, so I'm not sure. Is it your... No, no, sir, uh, sir we, have, we have just listened to the stories. We have never actually seen all this. So, I mean, from our seniors, Zamla Madam and all also used to tell us these stories. We have actually okay. listened to your lecture, sir, in Tata and, and grown up on that. So, uh, it's it's a privilege to be actually speaking in the two... In the I can tell you one thing. Whenever I come to Delhi, I will I don't mind. I'll come and give a lecture on these older vaporizers also because I've used it all. Wow. Wow. I don't mind. As far as Goldman is concerned, I must say one thing. Goldman was very well used. But in Mumbai, there was one incident that had happened way back in 1970s where a third MBBS student in JJ Hospital was getting operated and uh, that Goldman vaporizer was kept on the boils machine at that uh, common outlet, gas outlet. And when it was being given, suddenly there was something mishap happened and that Goldman fell down. And when it fell down, entire halothane entered into the patient's lungs straight. So much so that patient suddenly had a cardiac arrest and thereafter they tried to revive. He was revived, but I think after 48 hours or so, that fellow passed away. This is also Goldman Goldman's example. I still remember that. This was there in 1970-72. I think, Rakesh, you can continue with the next one now. Sir, I think next one is uh, with Madam. She will be talking about the modern vaporizers. Unmute, sir, please. I said she is definitely younger, so she will talk of the latest vaporizers. I am the older person, so I can talk on the older vaporizers. And you are in between, so you could talk in between those things. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Start. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Shweta Mamre, Associate Professor, LTMMC Sci in Mumbai, and my topic for today is Modern Vaporizers. So, once a very famous professor asked her favorite student, what's more hypnotizing than an anesthesia vaporizer? And the student replied, studying about the anesthesia vaporizer itself, Professor. <laughs> so, let's hope this dull topic of vaporizers, I can make it interesting for you today. We have already listened to an amazing lecture about the history of our vaporizers from Dr. Dull. But these historical vaporizers are like the hospital coffee that any random person makes in the OT every morning. Someday it is oversweet, someday not so hot, someday not so strong. But as anesthetists, we love precision, we love accuracy, we love the, exactly the right kind of temperature in our coffee. So, now most of the hospitals are having these fancy cafes. So, just like we love precision with our coffee, a hot coffee, just similar to that, we have now moved towards precision in our modern vaporizers also. So, these vaporizers are now called precision vaporizers. And we classify these modern vaporizers on these six points. Vaporization method, regulation of output, temperature compensation, agent specificity, plenum and location where the vaporizer is inside the circuit or out of the circuit. Let's discuss the first method, the vaporization method. How does the vaporization occur? 
all our modern vaporizers are either classified as flow over vaporizers or as injection type let's understand what is flow over vaporizer flow over just as the name suggests it ha it means that the fresh gas flow just flows over the vaporizing agent picks up the vapor and exits the vaporizer so here we have a control dial a splitting valve fresh gas that splits into the bypass pathway that does not contain any vapor and some fresh gas flow flows through the vaporizing chamber picks up the vapor and exits from the vaporizer output now can we increase the concentration of the vapor that is coming out of the vaporizer outlet yes by putting wicks inside the vaporization chamber how do they work the liquid agent seeps into the wicks by capillary action increases the surface area of absorption of the vapor and thus increases the vapor output at the outlet of the vaporizer injection type of vaporizers injection types means they are definitely not flow over means the fresh gas flow will not go through the vaporizer or the vaporizing chamber then how will it pick up the vapor it is by injecting the vapor into the fresh gas flow or injecting the volatile liquid into the fresh gas flow second is regulation of output here vaporizers are classified as variable bypass measured flow or electronic let's look at variable bypass the name itself means variable bypass means a varying amount of gas will flow through the bypass chamber so what does it depend on when the control dial is at zero position the splitting valve remains tightly closed and all the fresh gas flow flows through the bypass pathway when it is turned to position 1 some amount of fresh gas will go through the vaporizing chamber and pick up some vapor on the way when it is turned to full on position here the control dial setting is 5 the splitting valve completely opens and majority of fresh gas flow enters into the bypass chamber uh, enters into the vaporizing chamber and the vapor output increases so vapor output is variable and that variability depends on the position of the control dial hence it is called as concentration calibrated vaporizer both the things mean the same uh hold this thought of splitting valve for a moment and we'll revisit it in some time third temperature compensation automatic thermo compensation supplied heat electron thermo compensation now why do we need temperature compensation do we actually heat up a vaporizing agent no we cannot do that that can be really dangerous then why do we need thermo compensation see what happens is the molecules of the liquid are tightly bound together by cohesive forces on the surface of the liquid these cohesive forces are less and the surface molecules draw kinetic energy from within the liquid and vaporize this is how the process of vaporization occurs but when energy is drawn from something that thing will cool down hence when kinetic energy is drawn then the liquid cools down the temperature decreases and when kinetic energy is lost obviously the surface molecules cannot be so mobile anymore and vapor vapor output concentration decreases hence you need to supply heat to the anesthetic agent so that the process of vaporization is consistent and you get a consistent vapor output now how do you supply heat either by directly supplying heat electrically or by a bimetallic strip now what is the uh, uh, thing about bimetallic strip bimetallic the name suggests that there are two metals now look here these are two metals the red one and the green one the green one expands more at high temperature contracts more at uh, lower temperatures say we bind these two metals what would happen then because now they are bound together the green metal will bend the red metal at higher and lower temperatures they cannot now contract and expand separately this bending of the metals with different heating coefficients is used in vaporizing chamber how the metallic strip is placed at the inlet of the vaporizing chamber causing some amount of resistance when the temperature is optimum the strip remains straight when the temperature drops because of cooling of the 
liquid agent. The strip will bend in the opposite direction, increase the inlet of the vaporizing chamber and more fresh gas flow will now enter into the vaporizing chamber and pick up more gas, more vapor and thus the vaporizer output concentration it remains consistent. One more technique of supplying heat is all our modern vaporizers are made up of metallic jackets. These metallic jackets will absorb the heat from the surrounding and keep supplying it to the liquid inside. But since this cannot go on indefinitely, we need the bimetallic strip or electrical heating to maintain a consistent vapor output. Plenum vaporizer. Plenum vaporizer or drawer vapor. Uh, vapor vaporizers essentially all our modern vaporizers are plenum vaporizers drawer vaporizers are the historical vaporizers how do we remember them by a mnemonic of geo goldman emo and omb they are drawer vaporizers let's understand what they mean plenum vaporizers means a positive pressure is generated at the inlet of the vaporizer which pushes the carrier gas into the vaporizer and thus the vapor is delivered to the patient Drawer on the other hand means a sub-atmospheric negative inspiratory pressure is generated at the outlet of the vaporizer and the patient himself draws fresh gas through the vaporizing chamber and does um, and this is how the drawer vaporizers work. Now location of the vaporizers. All our modern vaporizers are vaporizer out of the circuit. If we try and understand this diagram, this is the patient, the inspiratory limb, the inspiratory valve, expiratory limb, expiratory valve, reservoir bag, pressure relief valve, your uh, CO2 absorber, and then your flow meter, your uh, vaporizer out of the circuit. So what happens is, from the flow meter, pure fresh gas enters into the vaporizing chamber, picks up the vapor, and joins the circle system. That is vaporizer out of the circuit. What happens in vaporizer inside the circuit? In vaporizer inside the circuit, the patient exhales gases. The exhaled gas will always have CO2 along with some amount of anesthetic agent. The CO2 will be absorbed in the CO2 absorber, but the inhaled anesthetics will not be absorbed. The uh, these vapor molecules then travel and enter into the vaporizing chamber. So, in vaporizer out of the circuit, only pure fresh gas enters the vapor vaporizer. But in this case, even the exhaled vapor molecules will enter into the chamber and this will increase the vaporizer output concentration inaccurately. Now, what are the factors affecting the vaporizer output? The fresh gas flow rate. So what happens at extremes of flow means very low metabolic flows or very high flows. What happens is the flows, the vaporizer output concentration is not reliable. It is not accurate. Why? At very low flows, stops, low, stagnant, static flows, there is not enough turbulence in the vaporizer for it to pick up the vapor molecules. At, on the other hand, then you'll feel that at very high flows, a lot of vapor will be picked up. But very high flows, say 15 liters per minute, the gases just brush past the vaporizing chamber and hence are unable to get saturated with the vapor. So at extremes of flow, the tech vaporizers are inaccurate. Temperature compensation, we have already known. Carrier gas compensation. Now, all vaporizers are calibrated at 100% oxygen. When you use nitrous oxide and air, because their solubility, the density, viscosity varies, hence that also affects the vaporizer output, although it is clinically not very significant. Now coming to a very important point, intermittent back pressure. So when does intermittent back pressure affect the vaporizer output? Either when you manually compress the reservoir back in IPPV or when you use the oxygen flush. What happens is a back pressure is generated which comes to the vaporizer output that can either lead to the pumping effect or pressurizing effect. Let's see what is pumping effect. This is our vaporizer and the reservoir bag. Now you compress the bag at the beginning of inspiration. What happens is back pressure is transmitted to the outlet of the vaporizer. That will compress the gases into the vaporizing chamber. The vaporizing chamber 
compressed gases will pick up a lot of vapor molecules and now this is vapor loaded gas what happens when you release the pressure at the end of uh, uh, at the time of expiration the gases which are compressed in the vaporizing chamber will flow in both the directions towards the outlet and also towards the inlet of the vaporizer because the inlet of the vaporizer has comparatively less resistance now and they will cross over into the bypass channel so the bypass channel which is supposed to be free of any vapor molecules now has vapor molecules which have crossed over from the vaporizing channel and have now entered into the bypass channel so vapor molecules from bypass channel the compressed gas from the vaporizing chamber all lead to a higher concentration at the vaporizer outlet this effect is called as pumping effect so when does how do you prevent a pumping effect by a long inlet tube long inlet tube means the vapor molecules will not be able to cross into the bypass channel by increasing the resistance of the vaporizing chamber so that the gases cannot compress themselves into the vaporizing chamber and lastly by using a closed one way valve at the outlet of the vaporizer so that the back pressure will not be transmitted to the interiors of the vaporizer pumping effect the reasons are everything is low low level of agent in the vaporizing chamber low carrier gas low dial setting so when there are low flows pumping effect can occur pressurizing effect not very clinically significant but this occurs at very high flows so what happens is there are same number of vapor molecules for and more number of carrier gas molecules because of the high flow so that leads to dilution of the vapor or decrease in vapor concentration so back pressure leads to pumping effect and back pressure also leads to pressurizing effect in which case does the output increase in which case does the output decrease confusing isn't it let's look at a metaphor for this which is very applicable to all of you very soon you'll be studying for your exams if you take pressure of your exams your output will decrease pressurizing effect output decreases if you pump yourself with positive thoughts your output will increase pumping effect output increases so now let's start with our modern vaporizers the first modern vaporizer was tech 1 was introduced by cyprene company called as flutech 1 was for halothane but was very short lived then came tech 2 3 4 5 and up till tech 7 and there were for modifications done in all these vaporizers to make it more user friendly more safe or to give more precise output let's understand the functioning of tech 5 a model tech vaporizer so let's first label the parts this is the inlet eight is the outlet two is the ippb assembly three are the helical wicks four is the wick, liquid agent six is the bimetallic strip fifth is the concentration dial so what happens when you turn on the concentration dial some gas goes into the vaporizing chamber and some goes into the bypass pathway let's trace the bypass pathway the gases flow they go across the metallic strip and then go towards the outlet of the vaporizer now look at the gases which are going into the vaporizing chamber they will go across the ippb assembly they will then go towards the helical wicks if you see the wicks are more saturated with vapor below which are in contact with the vaporizing agent and they are less saturated above so as they go through the helical wicks the gases become saturated with vapor and finally they pick up the vapor which is overlying the vaporizing agent and then come out of the outlet of the vaporizing chamber thus at the outlet we get fresh gas flow which is saturated with vapor now let's compare tech 2 3 4 and 5 vaporizers okay there are small minor modifications which are done all are concentration calibrated variable bypass vaporizers the modification done in tech 4 is that it has a control dial uh, the control dial has a release button at the left so you needed two hands one to release the button and the other to turn the control dial in tech 5 they gave the control dial at the back which made single handed operation possible in every all of them mode of vaporization is flow over with wicks but from fiber wicks we have now come to spiral metallic wicks spiral so that there is more time for absorption metallic so 
so that uh, heat is retained within the vaporizer. Why metallic strip is there in all these tech vaporizers? Only in tech 2, it was inside the vaporizing chamber, but in rest, all of them, it is outside the vaporizing chamber. In tech 5, the diagram that I showed you, it is at the base of the uh, bypass pathway. All are prone to back pressure effects. Tipping to 180 degrees. Tipping means when the vaporizer gets tilted, some uh, quantity of vapor can enter into the bypass chamber, which is not desirable. This is avoided in Tech 5 vaporizer because of the IPPV assembly. Also, there are safety interlock systems and filling systems which have come up with Tech, uh, tech 4 onwards, and we will study them in detail sooner. Now, so we have Tech 2, 3, 4, 5, and Tech 7, which are practically there for our vaporizers from halothane, isofluorine, sevofluorine. But desfluorine cannot be poured into any of these vaporizers. And there is a Tech 6, which is a specialized vaporizer for desfluorine, into which all these other agents cannot be poured into. Why does desfluorine need a separate vaporizer? This is a very important exam question. So, each point is important. Desfluorine is highly volatile. Boiling point is 22.8 degrees. This is this can be our operation theater temperature. So it can boil at room temperature and there can be an uncontrollable vapor output. Again, because it is highly volatile, it also has high saturated vapor pressure. How much is it? Desfluorine MAC is 6. So saturated vapor pressure is also 6, 6, 6. It is very close to what? Your atmospheric pressure, 760 millimeters of mercury. So at such high SVP, you require very high fresh gas flows to dilute it. High MAC, 6% as compared to your isofluorine, which is 1%. It is rapidly vaporized. There is loss of latent heat of vaporization and excessive cooling. These properties are there only with desfluorine. Hence, a separate vaporizer had to be constructed to vaporize desfluorine. Why do we need to heat up desfluorine? We all know, right? When you plug in a desfluorine vaporizer, it takes time to heat up. It is not operational as soon as you um, uh, plug it in. And it has an uh, and it needs electricity to uh, make it operational. Why does that? Its boiling point is 22.8 degrees. Still, it is heated to 39 degrees. Why is it so? And what happens when such a volatile agent is heated up? At 22 degrees, the pressure we said was 666. What will happen when it is heated up to 39 degrees? The pressure becomes furthermore. It becomes two atmospheric pressures, almost 1,500 millimeters of mercury. So why are we doing this? Why do we need to heat up an already volatile agent? Heard about latent heat of vaporization? Yes. So as we know, the kinetic energy keeps getting lost as the vapor molecules keep on escaping. So faster the vaporization in a volatile liquid, the temperature of the liquid will also cool faster and hence a consistent vapor output will not be maintained. So kinetic energy drawn from the liquid causes it to vaporize. There is heat loss, temperature falls and vapor output falls. So he electrically this vaporizer needs to be heated up and heating is essential to maintain consistent vapor output. Now let's understand the working of desfluorine vaporizer. So it is a dual circuit gas and vapor blender. Again, it is, is it a flow or vaporizer? Does the gas flow through the vaporizing agent? It cannot. So dual circuit means the orange circuit is that of the fresh gas flow. The blue circuit is of desfluorine. They, they meet here directly at the vaporizer outlet. So what happens is fresh gas flow comes and meets R1 resistor. This R1 resistor then gives information to differential pressure transducer. You plug in the vaporizer and uh, the differential pressure transducer gives information to control electronics. Once you plug in the vaporizer, the light, green light keeps blinking. This is the time that the sump heats up to 39 degrees and the desfluorine liquid is then vaporized at two atmospheric pressures into the, ga into the gas chamber. Until then, the sump shutoff valve is tightly closed. Only when the temperature reaches 39 degrees and desfluorine pressure reaches two atmospheric pressure will the sum shutoff valve 
open and the green light will become operational. Then, this control electronics gives information to pressure regulating valve. Pressure regu from the pressure regulating valve, a small amount of desflurane, depending on the differential uh, information coming from differential pressure transducer and control electronics, will be released into the blue limb, which will then also be controlled by the concentration control valve. And this desflurane will go and meet the fresh gas flow at the vaporizer outlet. So, uh, can we classify quickly? Saturated vapor pressure. The regulation of output is injection type. Temperature compensation is supplied heat. Agent specific, specific plenum and vaporizer out of the circuit. Remember this variable bypass vaporizer and I had told you to remember the splitting ball. Why is it important now? The splitting ball gives rise to something called a splitting ratio, which is equal to BC upon VC. Means gas flowing through the bypass chamber to the gas flowing through the vaporizing chamber. Now, this splitting ratio is different for different agents and hence every vaporizer uh, series like a tech 5 series will have a different vaporizer which is calibrated for a different inhalational anesthetics you cannot pour isofluorine sevoflurane halothane into the same tech 5 vaporizer because the splitting ratio depends on the dial setting as well as the saturated vapor pressure. And we all know that the saturated vapor pressure of all inhalational anesthetics is different. Let's see. Say you desire an anesthetic concentration of 1%, then halothane with a saturated vapor pressure of 243 will have a splitting ratio of 46 is to 1. Means 46 parts of the gas is going through the uh, bypass chamber and only one per part is going through the vaporizing chamber. In N fluorine, 29 parts of this uh, 29 parts of gas is going through the bypass chamber and one part is going through the vaporizing chamber. So, what would happen if I fill halothane in N fluorine vaporizer? Now, the set concentration on the dial will be one percent, but since halothane I have filled into N fluorine vaporizer the delivered concentration will be 1.6 percent because the vaporizer has been calibrated with a splitting ratio of 29 is to 1 for n fluorine as against 46 is to 1 as it should have been calibrated for a halothane so all inhalations different spp different splitting ratio and hence every agent needs a separate vaporizer in order to prevent this incorrect filling of agent into a particular vaporizer, we have screw fill systems in the older uh, tech vaporizers and from tech 4 onwards, we have the agent specific filling devices or Fraser Sweatman pin safety system called the key fill system. This was like a key. It had, slot, it had specific slots at both the ends, the bottle slot as well as the uh, uh, filler tube which goes into the vaporizer so that the incorrect filling of agent into the vaporizer will not occur. If you see, isofluorine has a slot above and the halothane has a slot on the left side. So you could not fill halothane into the vaporizer inlet of isofluorine. So this was like, only you have the keys to your house. If a stranger comes, his key is not going to fit into the lock of your house and hence a stranger cannot enter your house. Let's look at filling of tech 5 vaporizer and first label them. This is the filling port, the locking lever, the filler tube, the chamber lock and the side glass. How do they work? First you depress the locking lever. The filler tube block is then put into the filling port. The bottle is raised up, chamber lock is opened and then you see the liquid agent filling in the side glass. But this was a six step filling process and it was so cumbersome. So we came up with these filling blocks wherein the filling block is attached to the um, uh, vaporizer uh, to the uh, inhalational anesthetic bottle and it is directly inverted and filled into the vaporizer. So we came up with G Healthcare Easy Fill and Dragger Fill Systems where we got away with the filler tube and the six step filling system. But again, this was also like a key. What if you lose the key? If you lose the key, 
you would be stranded on the staircase and you wouldn't be able to enter your own house and i'm sure all of you residents dreads dread the day that such a thing occurs in the ot where you lose the filler tube or the block lost key means no entry so pharmaceutical companies said no problem we'll fit the key to the bottle itself mm -hmm. so came the quick fill system for sevoflurane and the safety fill system for desflurane if you can see both of this have a crim metal seal so that there is no leakage of the liquid anesthetic while filling it <clears throat> now we wanted more safety we wanted only one vaporizer to switch on at a time we did not want accidental switching on of the other vaporizer mixing of the vapors and such hazards so we came with uh, came with selector tech interlock system and trigger interlock system how does select interlock system work if you look this is a cross section of the control dial there is a pin when you turn on the control dial of one vaporizer the pin will move backwards and it will push the two horizontal rod rods on either side that will prevent your other vapor adjacent vaporizer from switching on this was this is very similar to that bully which uh, we once had in school who used to elbow us so that we couldn't move so the vaporizer which is switched on will push with his elbows or the horizontal rods the other vaporizer uh, rods and thus will not allow the other vaporizer to move protection offered is it can vaporizer can be turned on only when it is attached to the back bar and lock only when the vaporizer is turned on fresh gas can flow through it and only one vaporizer can be turned on at any time remember this slide of factors affecting vaporizer output so at low flows it was a big problem to deliver accurate uh, concentrations now so we came up with aladdin cassette vaporizers where all this was sensed and altered electronically every 200 millisecond it was a closed loop system where information was continuously given to the cassette in order to deliver accurate concentrations even at low flows now let's look at this what happens is when you move towards more smart devices more accuracy then you also become dependent on the other charging devices on the operating systems which come with the device like can you charge an iphone with a android c type charger no you have to buy its own charger you need its own operating system just like that aladdin cassettes were so sophisticated that aladdin cassettes will work with only specific anesthesia machines like sfidu and asis because the aladdin cassette with the vaporizing chamber is detachable but it's the information the brain of the vaporizer or the cpu of the vaporizer is inside the anesthesia machine let's look at the parts this is the agent chamber eject handle liquid level in uh, indicator key filling system and this is the filler wheel which helps to lock the key filling system it is not the concentration dial let's look at this the internal structure there are three important points here the magnets the magnets are there which cannot be seen externally but these magnets help the machine to recognize which vaporizer you have fitted in wicks and lamellae there are multiple metal wicks and lamellae through which the gases uh, are uh, through which the vapor is absorbed there is a spring loaded inlet valve and outlet valve through which the gases uh, through which the vapor a uh, vapor uh, containing gas enters into the machine so slot, this is how the slot in the machine looks like and this is the rare part of the cassette which has spring loaded inlet and outlet valve so if there is no concentration dial how do we set how much of inhalational anesthetic should go in on the screen monitor just as you set the ventilator parameters you can also send the end tidal anesthetic concentration internal structure looks very complicated don't worry it is just like your basic flow over uh, vaporizer with a bypass chamber and a vaporizing chamber with a vaporizing chamber inlet and vaporizing chamber outlet all these ornaments are basically multiple inflow and outflow valves pressure sensors and also if the pressure suddenly rises inside the vaporizer inadvertently then it will, the gas the vapor will be released to the scavenging system and will not be delivered to the patient so a very good precision vaporizer 
So safety features of Aladdin vaporizer. I thought of putting Aladdin's picture here where the genie is pressing his toes. Toes, T O E S. Tilting is allowable. Overfilling protection. Electronic ratio control every 200 millisecond of delivery and safety relief valve to release the gas uh, vapor to the atmosphere or to the uh, scavenging system if there is any inadvertent pressure rise. So it is a flow over with big type of vaporizer. It is a variable bypass just like our tech vaporizers. It is electronic. It is agent specific plenum and vaporizer out of the circuit. It also has vaporizer filling devices, quick fill, key fill, injection vaporizers. Now, they enable rapid titration of anesthetic depth with highly conservative low gas flows in a very short time, as short as one minute. Minimize the wastage of the anesthetic agent, prevent theater pollution, and it can again be used only in high-end anesthesia workstations like Macket Flow I and Dreger Zeus. But why do we need injection vaporizers? Let's do some simple calculations. How do we achieve 2% end tidal anesthetic concentration of sevoflurane? Volume in ml of sevoflurane upon total capacity of reservoir into 100 should be 2%. This total capacity of reservoir is basically your FRC and the circuit volume. Let's assume it is 6 liters. So with a fresh gas flow of 6 liters per minute, we can achieve 120 ml of sevo vapor in one minute. So 120 ml of sevoflurane is required to meet an end tidal anesthetic concentration of 2%. How do we achieve 2% end tidal anesthetic concentrations in very low flows? Means 180 ml per minute. Here, the how much of how much should be a dial concentration for that? So volume of sevoflurane we already know it is 120. The total fresh gas flow will be 300. That will give us the concentration dial of reading of 40%. Is there a concentration dial of sevoflurane having 40%? No. Maximum is how much? 8%. Then how do we achieve this 40% concentration so as to achieve an end tidal concentration of 2% at very low flows? That is where injection vaporizers come into play. So Mackey flow I machine with the Mackey vaporizer. How does it function? Okay. This also has a drive gas, just like your ventilator bellows have drive gas. The drive gas enters, pressurizes the vaporizer liquid container. This uh, vaporizing liquid then at uh, the pressure is injected into the vaporizing chamber with a good evaporative surface that converts it into vapor. Fresh gas enters, picks up the vapor and exits. All this is controlled by control electronics and continuously sensed by the uh, CPU and the temperature sensor. <coughs> Just like that, DIVA. Until now, uh, diva, the word DIVA gave us an image of something like this, but in anesthesia, DIVA means direct injection of volatile agent. So there is a Drager Z's machine where Drager DIVA vaporizers are used, which are also injection vaporizers. Again, there is a liquid anesthetic agent with a liquid volatile gate, an anesthetic dosing chamber, a dosing valve and vaporizing chamber and a flow sensor. So a, there is a feedback control unit which receives information from fresh gas flow, the end uh, target expired agent concentration, the fresh gas inspired agent concentration and it gives information to the dosing valve which decides how much amount of liquid anesthetic is to be injected into the heating chamber or the vaporizing chamber to deliver the set anesthetic vapor concentration. So this is a closed loop feedback system. Again, it is an injection, injection method, measured flow, electronic, agent specific, plenum and vaporizer out of the circuit. Now, anesthesia has moved up out of the operation theatres. It is in ICU. It is also in various uh, radiological suites that we are giving anesthesia. But all these places, unfortunately, we are forced to give intravenous anesthesia, which, which is quite unreliable. And there are there is waxing and waning of the anesthetic depth. And hence, our patients are in deep distress. Is it practical then to shift our anesthesia machine into the ICU to give anesthesia for these short procedures? No, neither is it practical nor economical. Hence, we have something called as anaconda. What is not because it looks like the anaconda snake, but the full form is anesthetic conserving device. 
So what if I told you that we can have an HME filter with an NS, uh, anesthetic vaporizer incorporated into it, Anaconda is just that. So between an endotracheal tube, this device is fit, which is an HME filter and with the anesthetic vaporizer incorporated into it. And on the other side is the Y piece of the ventilator circuit. There is also a volatile anesthetic line, which injects the volatile anesthetic into it. And it comes with a specialized syringe pump, which is provided by the company. So how does the interior look like? Yeah, it looks like this. So this is the anesthetic line. This is the uh, evaporator rod of the vaporizer, the patient end. Then there is a ventilator end. And in between, there's a very important thing. There is an activated carbon layer. So what happens? So sevoflurane comes, it is injected inside and it goes to the patient's lung along with the oxygen and air coming from the ventilator. Now when the patient exhales, these vapor molecules are absorbed on the activated carbon layer and are then available along with the heat and the moisture for the next breath of the patient. So it is anesthesia conserving device. So right from that ether sponge, which was so unreliable, so unpredictable, the vaporizer output of it, we have now moved to out of operation room anesthesia, where we are able to, uh, to uh, deliver precise um, anesthetic concentrations and a good depth of anesthesia and, and with complete safety. So if, if, uh, boli if anesthesia was, um, or medicine was a Bollywood film, then we would have been the perfectionist or the Amir Khan of medicine. Thank you, everyone. It has been great. This is my second year where I'm delivering a lecture at EPEC. I want to thank um, the EPEC organizers and uh, HOD Madam for giving me this opportunity. It's been a pleasure preparing for this lecture. I hope you also had a good time listening to my lecture. Thank you so much. So, um, hello, am I audible? Yes, yes, sir, you're audible. Yeah. So, well, Shweta, it was a very fun, but very nicely fun. covering all the latest one. Also, I'm very happy, very impressed. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Ha, but I must say something on my own experience because when I was facing my MD anesthesia exam, yes, sir. Because you speak about uh, pumping effect and all, yes, I must say this, Rakesh, you should hear properly. Rakesh, yes, unmute. Yeah, the yeah. Thing is, yes, that that time I got a short note to be written for eight marks, and that you know what it was called, hill and low effect. Yes. I was wondering what is Hillel low effect. In fact, I asked the other people also. None of them could say what is Hillel low effect. Thereafter, when I came out and I asked my HOD, she said, Are Dr. Gidu, you don't know, you know better than me. Hillel low effect is the other name for the pumping effect. So sometimes you must remember this word also that it is called Hillel low effect one. And secondly, there is another name for pressure and effect. Can you tell me, Shweta, now what is pressure and effect, other name? Sir, I, I am uh, forgetting that now. Sorry. Well, that was called Cole's effect. Cole's effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cole's effect. Yes, sir. Yeah. And now I must tell you something that uh, that points. There are a few points which were missing. That is, in case of Tech Two vaporizer and Tech Three vaporizer, which we have used a lot, Blue Tech Two and Three. Yes, in the Tech Two vaporizer, basically halogen content thymol yeah. as a preservative. So this yes. thymol coating used to start. Inside the vaporizer, that is the reason the output, whatever you are setting, is not going to work properly. For example, if I put it 4% also, the output after some time will drop down to 2.5%. Correct, correct. So to prevent this, 
in the tech three vaporizer they added ptfe coating yes uh, this ptfe coating was uh, one which was protective against the thymol that is polytetrafluoroethylene coating yes. this was added to that yes. this point needs to be covered also okay sir. and well you spoke fairly good about the allazine cassette also that was quite well thank you sir yeah and that's all the servicing of the vaporizers was quite frequent every uh, two weeks draining of the vaporizer for halothane was required because of thymol which then later on yes same thing happened about uh, rakesh garg i must say that you are told about that uh, uh, emo vaporizer old one in emo vaporizer in the vaporizing chamber there is a small ether bellows which is there when it is i mean at the exit of the vaporizing chamber now this it, that bellows was basically it was said to be a temperature compensation mechanism because that was the one which used to alter the flow in the sense that bellow contained few drops of ether so whenever i take that vaporizer for example if i take it to something like nagpur which is highest temperature that ether vaporized the ether in that bellow gets vaporized so it basically shuts down or limits the outlet it uh, controls your output while if i take that same uh, emo at the everest where the temperature is practically zero or something like 1 2 3 4 5 so okay. that is the time that ether drops in that bellows they become solidified and that makes the ether bellow heavier so it sinks down so whatever small production of the ether vapors that are been happening they all will be exited out of the to the patient so whatever is my dial setting i may not say that for example if my dial setting is 10% if it is at the everest it may not work that it will not give 10% output it may still manage to give 6 7 8% output while the same 10% output if i put it at the nagpur like state which is very hot one there it will not be 10% it may exit out something like 12 to 15% so that is the reason that ether bellow was also one of the method for the alteration of the flow with the temperature compensation mechanisms are two one is a supplied heat which was by the either a water jacket or by the copper kettle copper metal itself is got a highest thermal conductivity or the calcium chloride crystal which was seen in the omv while the second part is the flow alteration which was one is a bimetallic strip what rakesh has said very nicely and you also said and the second one is the ether bellows basically contained a small ether drops into that these are the two different techniques of controlling the output also that is uh, flow alteration or temperature compensation mechanisms that is true sir is it okay rakesh absolutely sir you have summarized it uh, nicely sir very well sir thank you this can be a short uh, question in uh, thermal compensatory mechanisms in newer vaporizers uh, what are the Uh, basic designs and principles i'm telling you that same hill and low effect i could not write a single word ultimately came out with i mean i lost that eight marks when my madam told me like that oh my god i said i i knew it much better than anybody else so that is the reason sometimes you must know of course hill and low is not that i love you all i love l o w e e it's o w e hill is h i l h i w l hill and low effect yes Well, the other one is the Cole's effect. Anyway, thank you both the speakers. Thank They have done sir. a wonderful job. I should say thank you so much. Thank you. I sir. think you thank covered you. almost entire all old, good old as well as the new vaporizers. Yes. I must say. We just have one question from the uh, student uh, for uh, Dr. Shweta. That man, can you please explain some details about the Aladdin cassette vaporizer principles and classification and vapor two thousand dragger. Okay. one question just a moment i'll have to share my uh, screen for the aladdin thing probably the is that okay yeah yeah you can share the screen yeah, if you yeah, yeah. just a moment yeah Question. 
yeah so uh, this is the internal structure of aladdin cassette uh, one should not get confused with the um, internal structure because just like our tech vaporizers it is also a flow over vaporizer where the fresh gas is entering into the vaporizing chamber picking up the vapor and then exiting from the outlet valve now there is only one slot in the machine for the vaporizer and just like the brain of the vaporizer of tech vaporizers the entire functioning of the tech vaporizers is within the tech vaporizer what happens here is that the brain of the vaporizer is inside the anesthesia machine as i said with um, all smart devices and everything the uh, you have to buy its operating system its charger so here you cannot uh, put an aladdin vaporizer into your older anesthesia machines you require the newer anesthesia machines like the aces and the s5 edu so that because only they will have the slot in side which there is the cpu which will make your aladdin cassette work now there is only one slot then how will the machine recognize which vaporizer you have put inside that is because of these magnets there are magnets which are inside they are not seen externally they are magnets inside these magnets will juxtapose with the magnets which are inside the anesthesia machine and accordingly they, the machine will recognize whether you have put in a desflurane vaporizer or an isofluorine vaporizer again it just like tech vaporizers it also has wicks it also has metallic laminae again wicks and laminae will help in improving the absorption and it has spring loaded inlet and outlet valve that is when you remove the uh, vaporizer and you are carrying it there will not be any leakage of anesthetic agent because these are spring loaded valves if i these are the slots this is the slot in the anesthesia machine and spring loaded valves which are there in on the rear part of the cassette um, again as i said there is no concentration dial uh, in the vaporizer here if you can see if you can uh, see my arrow this is the filler wheel which is in order to lock the filler tube into the uh, uh, vaporizing chamber but it is not the concentration dial you actually enter the end tidal anesthetic concentration that you desire into the ventilate into the uh, monitor and then the system will readjust the flows and everything so as to achieve it now internal structure as i said it looks complicated but if you remove all these valves then it looks just like your normal flow over or variable bypass vaporizer now tech vaporizers did not have so many valves and that is the reason they were prone to tilting and they were tippable but if you see this can be this as i said in the next thing tilting is allowable because of the multiple valves that it has because of which the vapor cannot flow directly into the outlet uh, line and hence it has overfilling protection electronic ratio control which is, and as i said everything the fresh gas flow rate the carrier gas compensation the temperature everything is sensed continuously in a closed loop feedback mechanism every 200 millisecond and everything is readjusted so as to deliver the etac the end tidal anesthetic concentration which you have set and also it has a safety relief valve so that suddenly if there is rising temperature or if the pressure suddenly rises within the vaporizing chamber the safety relief valve will open the vapor will be released to the scavenging system and dangerous concentrations of vapor will not be delivered to the patient is that uh, clear now no, i guess you beautifully explained in detail it was a wonderful and very lucid uh, explanation of the vaporizers thank just you just right how you you began with that uh, you know as a topic something that's very hypnotizing but i think none of the students would have actually dared to sleep through your lecture i hope so i hope so <laughs> thank you Thank we you, have sir. actually Thank learned you so our anesthesia uh, machine and vaporizers from Gedu, sir. I'm from Sain Hospital in Mumbai, and we used to go to Tata to attend his lectures, post call, pre call. We used to, you know, like like we were so hungry for his lectures, and sir has been always so enthusiastic. I don't know how busy he was, but he used to teach at the end of the day, very alert and very enthusiastically. So everything that I'm speaking today, the vaporizers are modern, but the technique of teaching is <laughs> learned from our seniors, our sirs. 
I'm sure it's Thank a proud moment, sir, to, to see your student coming up. Thank you. A... Thank you, Shweta, for appreciation. Thank you. Bless uh, you. Sir, you may not remember us, but uh, we have learned uh, our machine from you, sir. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much, sir. Thank you to both. I hope, I hope, okay, my contribution was okay. Sir, sir amazing, sir. You just yes, added, I think, the extra pinch. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. to both the speakers. Thank you. thank you, Rakesh. Thank you, Shweta. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you, the Apex 23 team. Thank you, Mohandip, madam, and everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. It was pleasure was all us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good day. Bye. All the best. So with this, we come to the end of uh, today's day. And uh, we have the winner of yesterday's quiz, the last quiz that we talked about. So I'm happy to announce the winner of uh, yesterday's quiz is Sushmita Chaudhary. She is a postgraduate resident from CMC Ludhiana. Many congratulations to Sushmita Chaudhary. So you win yourself free registration to EPEC 23. I think this should motivate all the other delegates to be sincere and uh, do fill in the answers to the quiz. The quiz is getting activated right away. So try and fill it at the earliest. And uh, we hope we get a, a more wonderful results and many more uh, winners in the coming days. The other thing is don't forget about the follow up, uh, the feedback, sorry. Do fill in the feedback. It's important. It's essential for us. So please give your valuable feedback for this program to make it a much more uh, better program in the coming years. Thank you so much. Enjoy your evening. See you guys tomorrow at 8 a.m. Thank you.